This is Audible. Hachette Audio presents Feed. Written by Mira Grant. Read by Paula Christensen and Jesse Bernstein. This book is gratefully dedicated to Gianpaolo Musumeci and Michael Ellis. They each ask me a question. This is my answer. Book One The Rising. You can't kill the truth, Georgia Mason. Nothing is impossible to kill. It's just that sometimes, after you kill something, you have to keep shooting it until it stops moving. And that's really sort of neat when you stop to think about it. Sean Mason Everyone has someone on the wall. No matter how remote you may think you are from the events that changed the world during the brutal summer of 2014, you have someone on the wall. Maybe they're a cousin, maybe they're an old family friend. Or maybe they're just somebody you saw on TV once, but they're yours. They belong to you. They died to make sure that you could sit in your safe little house, behind your safe little walls, watching the words of one jaded 22-year-old journalist go scrolling across your computer screen. Think about that for a moment. They died for you. Now take a good look at the life you're living and tell me, did they do the right thing? From Images May Disturb You, the blog of Georgia Mason, May 16th, 2039. Chapter 1 Our story opens where countless stories have ended in the last 26 years, with an idiot, in this case my brother Sean, deciding it would be a good idea to go out and poke a zombie with a stick to see what happens. As if we didn't already know what happens when you mess with a zombie. The zombie turns around and bites you, and you become the thing you poked. This isn't a surprise. It hasn't been a surprise for more than 20 years, and if you want to get technical, it wasn't a surprise then. When the infected first appeared, heralded by screams that the dead were rising and Judgment Day was at hand, they behaved just like the horror movies had been telling us for decades that they would behave. The only surprise was that this time, it was really happening. There was no warning before the outbreaks began. One day, things were normal. The next, people who were supposedly dead were getting up and attacking anything that came into range. This was upsetting for everyone involved, except for the infected, who were past being upset about that sort of thing. The initial shock was followed by running and screaming, which eventually devolved into more infection and attacking, that being the way of things. So what do we have now, in this enlightened age 26 years after the rising? We have idiots prodding zombies with sticks, which brings us full circle to my brother and why he probably won't live a long and fulfilling life. Hey, George, check this out, he shouted giving the zombie another poke in the chest with his hockey stick. The zombie gave a low moan, swiping at him ineffectually. It had obviously been in a state of full viral amplification for some time and didn't have the strength or physical dexterity left to knock the stick out of Sean's hands. I'll give Sean this much. He knows not to bother the fresh ones at close range. We're playing patty cake. Stop antagonizing the locals and get back on the bike, I said glaring from behind my sunglasses. His current buddy might be sick enough to be nearing its second, final death, but that didn't mean there wasn't a healthier pack roaming the area. Santa Cruz is zombie territory. You don't go there unless you're suicidal, stupid, or both. There are times when even I can't guess which of those options applies to Sean. Can't talk right now. I'm busy making friends with the locals. Sean Philip Mason, you get back on this bike right now or I swear to God I'm going to drive away and leave you here. Sean looked around, eyes bright with sudden interest as he planted the end of his hockey stick at the center of the zombie's chest to keep it at a safe distance. 
really? You do that for me? Because my sister abandoned me in zombie country without a vehicle would make a great article. A posthumous one, maybe, I snapped. Get back on the goddamn bike! In a minute, he said, laughing, and turned back toward his moaning friend. In retrospect, that's when everything started going wrong. The pack had probably been stalking us since before we hit the city limits, gathering reinforcements from all over the county as they approached. Packs of infected get smarter and more dangerous the larger they become. Groups of four or less are barely a threat unless they can corner you, but a pack of twenty or more stands a good chance of breaching any barrier the uninfected try to put up. You get enough of the infected together and they'll start displaying pack hunting techniques. They'll start using actual tactics. It's like the virus that's taken them over starts to reason when it gets enough hosts in the same place. It's scary as hell, and it's just about the worst nightmare of anyone who regularly goes into zombie territory, getting cornered by a large group that knows the land better than you do. These zombies knew the land better than we did, and even the most malnourished and virus-ridden pack knows how to lay an ambush. A low moan echoed from all sides, and then they were shambling into the open, some moving with the slow lurch of the long infected, others moving at something close to a run. The runners led the pack, cutting off three of the remaining methods of escape before there was time to do more than stare. I looked at them and shuddered. Fresh infected, really fresh ones, still look almost like the people that they used to be. Their faces show emotion, and they move with a jerkiness that could just mean they slept wrong the night before. It's harder to kill something that still looks like a person, and worst of all, the bastards are fast. The only thing more dangerous than a fresh zombie is a pack of them, and I counted at least 18 before I realized that it didn't matter and stopped bothering. I grabbed my helmet and shoved it on without fastening the strap. If the bike went down, Dying because my helmet didn't stay on would be one of the better options. I'd reanimate, but at least I wouldn't be aware of it. Sean! Sean whipped around, staring at the emerging zombies. Whoa. Unfortunately for Sean, the addition of that many zombies had turned his buddy from a stupid solo into part of a thinking mob. The zombie grabbed the hockey stick as soon as Sean's attention was focused elsewhere, yanking it out of his hands. Sean staggered forward, and the zombie latched onto his cardigan, withered fingers locking down with deceptive strength. It hissed. I screamed, images of my inevitable future as an only child filling my mind. Sean! One bite, and things would get a lot worse. There's not much worse than being cornered by a pack of zombies in downtown Santa Cruz. Losing Sean would qualify. The fact that my brother convinced me to take a dirt bike into zombie territory doesn't make me an idiot. I was wearing full off-road body armor, including a leather jacket with steel armor joints attached at the elbows and shoulders, a Kevlar vest, motorcycling pants with hip and knee protectors, and calf-high riding boots. It's bulky as hell, and I don't care, because once you factor in my gloves, my throat's the only target I present in the field. Sean, on the other hand, is a moron and had gone zombie baiting in nothing more defensive than a cardigan, a Kevlar vest, and cargo pants. He won't even wear goggles. He says they spoil the effect. Unprotected mucous membranes can spoil a hell of a lot more than that, but I practically have to blackmail him to get him into the Kevlar. Goggles are a non-starter. There's one advantage to wearing a sweater in the field, no matter how idiotic I think it is. Wool tears. Sean ripped himself free and turned, running for the motorcycle with great speed, which is really the only effective weapon we have against the infected. Not even the fresh ones can keep up with an uninfected human over a short sprint. We have speed, and we have bullets. Everything else about this fight is in their favor. Shit, George, we've got company! There was a perverse mixture of horror and delight in his tone. Look at them all! I'm looking, now get on! I kicked us free as soon as he had his leg over the back of the bike and his arm around my waist. The bike leapt forward, 
tires bouncing and shuddering across the broken ground as I steered us into a wide curve. We needed to get out of there, or all the protective gear in the world wouldn't do us a damn bit of good. I might live if the zombies caught up with us, but my brother would be dragged into the mob. I gunned the throttle, praying that God had time to preserve the life of the clinically suicidal. We hit the last open route out of the square at 20 miles an hour, still gathering speed. Whooping, Sean locked one arm around my waist and twisted to face the zombies, waving and blowing kisses in their direction. If it were possible to enrage a mob of the infected, he'd have managed it. As it was, they just moaned and kept following, arms extended toward the promise of fresh meat. The road was pitted from years of weather damage without maintenance. I fought to keep control as we bounced from pothole to pothole. Hold on, you idiot! I'm holding on, Sean called back, seeming happy as a clam and oblivious to the fact that people who don't follow proper safety procedures around zombies, like not winding up around zombies in the first place, tend to wind up in the obituaries. Hold on with both arms! The moaning was only coming from three sides now, but it didn't mean anything. A pack this size was almost certainly smart enough to establish an ambush. I could be driving straight to the site of greatest concentration. They'd moan in the end, once we were right on top of them. No zombie can resist a good moan when dinner's at hand. The fact that I could hear them over the engine meant that there were too many, too close. If we were lucky, it wasn't already too late to get away. Of course, if we were lucky, we wouldn't be getting chased by an army of zombies through the quarantine area that used to be downtown Santa Cruz. We'd be somewhere safer, like Bikini Atoll just before the bomb testing kicked off. Once you decide to ignore the hazard rating and the signs saying danger, infection, you're on your own. Sean grudgingly slid his other arm around my waist and linked his hands at the pit of my stomach, shouting, spoil sport, as he settled. I snorted and hit the gas again, aiming for a nearby hill. When you're being chased by zombies, hills are either your best friends or your burial ground. The slope slows them down, which is great, unless you hit the peak and find out that you're surrounded, with nowhere left to run to. Idiot or not, Sean knows the rules about zombies and hills. He's not as dumb as he pretends to be, and he knows more about surviving zombie encounters than I do. His grip on my waist tightened, and for the first time, there was actual concern in his voice as he shouted, George, what do you think you're doing? Hold on, I said. Then we were rolling up the hill, bringing more zombies stumbling out of their hiding places behind trash cans and in the spaces between the once elegant beachfront houses that were now settling into a state of neglected decay. Most of California was reclaimed after the rising but no one has ever managed to take back Santa Cruz. The geographical isolation that once made the town so desirable as a vacation spot pretty much damned it when the virus hit. Kellis Amberley may be unique in the way it interacts with the human body, but it behaves just like every other communicable disease known to man in at least one way. Put it on a school campus, and it spreads like wildfire. UC Santa Cruz was a perfect breeding ground, and once all those perky coeds became the shuffling infected, it was all over but the evacuation notices. Georgia, this is a hill, he said with increasing urgency as the locals lunged toward the speeding bike. He was using my proper name. That was how I could tell he was worried. I'm only Georgia when he's unhappy. I got that. I hunched over to decrease wind resistance a few more precious degrees. Sean mimicked the motion automatically, hunching down behind me. Why are we going up a hill? He demanded. There was no way he'd be able to hear my answer over the combined roaring of the engine and the wind, but that's my brother, always willing to question that which won't talk back. Ever wonder how the Wright brothers felt? I asked. The crest of the hill was in view. From the way the street vanished on the other side, it was probably a pretty steep drop. The moaning was coming from all sides now, so distorted by the wind that I had no real idea what we were driving into. Maybe it was a trap. Maybe it wasn't. Either way, 
It was too late to find another path. We were committed, and for once, Sean was the one sweating. Georgia! Hold on! Ten yards. The zombies kept closing, single-minded in their pursuit of what might be the first fresh meat some had seen in years. From the looks of most of them, the zombie problem in Santa Cruz was decaying faster than it was rebuilding itself. Sure, there were plenty of fresh ones. There were always fresh ones because there were always idiots who wander into quarantined zones, either willingly or by mistake, and the average hitchhiker doesn't get lucky where zombies are concerned. But we'll take the city back in another three generations. Just not today. Five yards. Zombies hunt by moving toward the sound of other zombies hunting. It's recursive, and that meant our friends at the base of the hill started for the peak when they heard the commotion. I was hoping so many of the locals had been cutting us off at ground level that they wouldn't have many bodies left to mount an offensive on the hill's far side. We weren't supposed to make it that far, after all. The only thing keeping us alive was the fact that we had a motorcycle and the zombies didn't. I glimpsed the mob waiting for us as we reached the top. They were standing no more than three deep. Fifteen feet would see us clear. Lift off. It's amazing what you can use for a ramp, given the right motivation. Someone's collapsed fence was blocking half the road, jutting up at an angle, and I hit it at about 50 miles an hour. The handlebars shuddered in my hands like the horns of a mechanical bull, and the shocks weren't doing much better. I didn't even have to check the road in front of us because the moaning started as soon as we came into view. They'd blocked our exit fairly well while Sean played with his little friend and mindless plague carriers or not, they had a better grasp of the local geography than we did. We still had one advantage. Zombies aren't good at predicting suicide charges. And if there's a better term for driving up the side of a hill at 50 miles an hour with the goal of actually achieving flight when you run out of up, I don't think I want to hear it. The front wheel rose smoothly, and the back followed, sending us into the air with a jerk that looked effortless and was actually scarier than hell. I was screaming. Sean was whooping with gleeful understanding. And then everything was in the hands of gravity, which has never had much love for the terminally stupid. We hung in the air for a heart-stopping moment, still shooting forward. At least I was fairly sure the impact would kill us. The laws of physics and the hours of work I've put into constructing and maintaining my bike combine to let the universe, for once, show mercy. We soared over the zombies, coming down on one of the few remaining stretches of smooth road with a bone-bruising jerk that nearly ripped the handlebars out of my grip. The front wheel went light on impact, trying to rise up, and I screamed, half terrified, Half furious was Sean for getting us into this situation in the first place. The handlebars shuddered harder, almost wrenching my arms out of their sockets before I hit the gas and forced the wheel back down. I'd pay for this in the morning, and not just with the repair bills. Not that it mattered. We were on level ground, we were upright, and there was no moaning ahead. I hit the gas harder as we sped toward the outskirts of town, with Sean whooping and cheering behind me like a big suicidal freak. Asshole, I muttered and drove on. News is news, and spin is spin. And when you introduce the second to the first, what you have isn't news anymore. Hey, presto, you've created opinion. Don't get me wrong, opinion is powerful. Being able to be presented with differing opinions on the same issue is one of the glories of a free media, and it should make people stop and think. But a lot of people don't want to. They don't want to admit that whatever line being touted by their idol of the moment might not be unbiased and without ulterior motive. We've got people who claim Kellis Amberley was a plot by the Jews, the gays, the Middle East, even a branch of the Aryan nation trying to achieve racial purity by killing the rest of us. Whoever orchestrated the creation and release of the virus masked their involvement with a conspiracy of Machiavellian proportions, and now they and their followers are sitting it out, peacefully immunized bruise in the middle of the night. The good people of Gilroy aren't willing to let the infected have it either. 
They go in three times a year with flamethrowers and machine guns and clean the place out. That keeps Watsonville deserted and lets the California farmers continue to feed the population. I pulled off to the side of the road outside the ruins of a small town called Aptos, near the Highway 1 on-ramp. There was flat ground in all directions, giving us an adequate line of sight on anything that might be looking for a snack. My bike was running rough enough that I wanted to get a good look at it, and adding more gas probably wouldn't hurt. Dirt bikes have small tanks, and we'd covered a lot of miles already. Sean turned toward me as he dismounted, grinning from ear to ear. The wind had raked his hair into a series of irregular spikes and snarls, making him look like he'd been possessed. That, he said, with almost religious fervor, was the coolest thing you have ever done. In fact, that may have been the coolest thing you ever will do. Your entire existence has been moving toward one shining moment, George, and that was the moment when you thought, hey, why don't I just go over the zombies? He paused for effect. You are possibly cooler than God. Yet another chance to be free of you down the drain. I hopped off the bike and pulled off my helmet, starting to assess the most obvious problems. They looked minor, but I still intended to get them looked at as soon as possible. Some damage was beyond my admittedly limited mechanical capabilities, and I was sure I'd managed to cause most of it. You'll get another one. That's the hope that keeps me going. I balanced my helmet against the windscreen before unzipping the right saddlebag and removing the gas can. Setting the can on the ground, I pulled out the first aid kit. Blood test time. George, you know the rules. We've been in the field and we don't get back to base until we've checked our virus levels. I extracted two small handheld testing units, holding one out to him. No levels, no van. No van, no coffee, no coffee, no joy. Do you want the joy, Sean? Or would you rather stand out here and argue with me about whether you're going to let me test your blood? You're burning cool by the minute here, he grumbled and took the unit. I'm okay with that, I said. Now let's see if I'll live. Moving with synchronicity born of long practice, we broke the biohazard seals and popped the plastic lids off our testing units exposing the sterile metal pressure pads. Basic field test units only work once, but they're cheap and necessary. You need to know if someone's gone into viral amplification, preferably before they start chewing on your tasty flesh. I unsnapped my right glove and peeled it off, shoving it into my pocket. On three? On three, Sean agreed. One. Two. We both reached out and slid our index fingers into the unit in the other's hand. Call it a quirk. Also, call it an early warning system. If either of us ever waits for three, something's very wrong. The metal was cool against my finger as I depressed the pressure pad, a soothing sensation followed by the sting of the test's embedded needle breaking my skin. Diabetes tests don't hurt. They want you to keep using them, and comfort makes a difference. Callous Amberley blood testing units hurt on purpose. Lack of sensitivity to pain is an early sign of viral amplification. The LEDs on top of the box turned on, one red, one green, beginning to flash in an alternating pattern. The flashing slowed and finally stopped as the red light went out, leaving the green. Still clean. I glanced at the test I was holding and let out a slow breath as I saw that Sean's unit had also stabilized on green. Guess I don't get to clean your room out just yet, I said. Maybe next time, he said. I passed him back his test, letting him handle the storage while I refilled the gas tank. He did so with admirable efficiency, snapping the plastic covers back onto the testing units and triggering the internal bleach dispensers before pulling a biohazard bag out of the first aid kit and dropping the units in. The top of the bag turned red when he sealed it, the plastic melting itself closed. That bag was triple reinforced, and it would take a Herculean effort to open it now that it was shut. Even so, he checked the seal and the seams of the bag before securing it in the saddlebag's biohazardous materials compartment. While he was busy with containment, I tipped the contents of the gas can into the tank. 
I'd been running close enough to empty that the can drained completely, which was scary. If we'd run out of gas during the chase? Best not to think about it. I put the gas cap back on and shoved the empty can into the saddlebag. Sean was starting to climb onto the back of the bike. I turned toward him, raising a warning finger. What are we forgetting? He paused. Uh, to go back to Santa Cruz for postcards? Helmet. We're on a flat stretch of road in the middle of nowhere. We're not going to have an accident. Helmet. You didn't make me wear a helmet before. We were being chased by zombies before. Since there are no zombies now, you'll wear a helmet. Or you'll walk the rest of the way to Watsonville. Rolling his eyes, Sean unstrapped his helmet from the left-hand saddlebag and crammed it over his head. Happy now? He asked, voice muffled by the face shield. Ecstatic. I put my own helmet back on. Let's go. The roads were clean the rest of the way to Watsonville. We didn't see any other vehicles, which wasn't surprising. More important, we didn't see any of the infected. Call me dull, but I'd seen enough zombies for one day. Our van was parked at the edge of town, a good 20 yards from any standing structures. Standard safety precautions. Lack of cover makes it harder for things to sneak up on you. I pulled up in front of it and cut the engine. Sean didn't wait for the bike to come to a complete stop before he was leaping down and bounding for the door, yanking his helmet off as he shouted, Buffy, how's the footage? Ah, the enthusiasm of the young. Not that I'm much older than he is. Neither of us came with an original birth certificate when we were adopted, but the doctors estimated me as being at least three weeks ahead of him. From the way he acts sometimes, you'd think it was a matter of years not just an accident of birth order. I removed my helmet and gloves and slung them over the handlebars before following at a more sedate pace. The inside of our van is a testament to what you can do with a lot of time, a reasonable amount of money, and three years of night classes in electronics. And help from the internet, of course. We'd never have figured out the wiring without people chiming in from places ranging from Oregon to Australia. Mom did the structural reinforcements and security upgrades, supposedly as a favor, but really to give her an excuse to try building back doors into our systems. Buffy disabled them all as quickly as they were installed. That hasn't stopped Mom from trying. After five years of work, we've managed to convert a mostly gutted Channel 7 news van into a state-of-the-art traveling blog center with camera feeds, its own wireless tower, a self-sustaining homing device, and so many backup storage arrays that it makes my head hurt when I think about them too hard. So I don't think about them at all. That's Buffy's job, along with being the perkiest, blondest, outwardly flakiest member of the team. And she does all four parts of her job very, very well. Buffy herself was cross-legged in one of the three chairs crammed into the van's remaining floor space looking thoughtful as she held a headset up to one ear. Sean was standing behind her, nearly jigging up and down in his excitement. She didn't seem to register my presence as I stepped into the van, but spoke as soon as the door was closed, saying, Hey, Georgia, in a dreamy, detached tone. Hey, Buffy, I said, heading for the mini fridge and pulling out a can of Coke. Sean takes his caffeine hot, and I take mine cold. Call it our way of rebelling against similarity. How are we looking? Buffy flashed a quick thumbs up, actually animated for a moment. We're looking good. That's what I like to hear, I said. Buffy's real name is Georgette Maisonnier. Like Sean and me, she was born after the zombies became a fact of life, during the period when Georgia, Georgette, and Barbara were the three most common girls' names in America. We are the Jennifers of our generation. Most of us just rolled over and took it. After all, George Romero is considered one of the accidental saviors of the human race, and it's not like being named after him is uncool. It's just, well, common. And Buffy has never been willing to be common when she can help it. She was all cool professionalism when Sean and I found her at an online job fair. 
That lasted about five minutes after we met in person. She introduced herself, then grinned and said, I'm cute, blonde, and living in a world full of zombies. What do you think I should call myself? We looked at her blankly. She muttered something about a pre-rising TV show and let it drop. Not that it matters, since as far as I'm concerned, as long as she keeps our equipment in working order, she can call herself whatever she damn well wants. Plus, having her on the team grants us an air of the exotic. She was born in Alaska, the last lost frontier. Her family moved after the government declared the state impossible to secure and ceded it to the infected. Got it, she announced, disconnecting the headset and leaning over to flick on the nearest video feedback screen. The image of Sean holding back his decaying pal with the hockey stick flickered into view. No sound came from the van's main speakers. A single moan can attract zombies from a mile away if you're unlucky with your acoustics, and it's not safe to soundproof in the field. Soundproofing works both ways, and zombies tend to surround structures on the off chance they might contain things to eat or infect. Opening the van doors to find ourselves surrounded by a pack we didn't hear coming didn't particularly appeal to any of us. The image is a little fuzzy, but I filtered out most of the visual artifacts, and I can clean it further once I've had the chance to hit the source files. Georgia, thanks for remembering to put your helmet on before you started driving. The front mount camera worked like a charm. To be honest, I hadn't remembered that the camera was there. I'd been too focused on not cracking my skull open. Still, I nodded agreeably, taking a long drink of Coke before saying, No problem. How many of the cameras kept feeding through the chase? Three of the four. Sean's helmet didn't come on until you were almost here. Sean didn't have time to put on his helmet or he would have ceased to have a head, Sean protested. Sean needs to stop talking about himself in the third person, Buffy said, and hit a button on her keyboard. The image was replaced by a close-up shot of the flickering lights on our blood tests. I want to screenshot this for the main site. What do you think? Whatever you say, I said. The screen broadcasting our main external security camera was showing an abandoned, undisturbed landscape. Nothing moved in Watsonville. You know I don't care about the graphics. And that's why your ratings aren't higher, George, said Sean. I like the lights. Use them as a slow fade in tonight's teaser, too. Tack on something about, I don't know, how close is too close, that whole old saw. Close encounters on the edge of the grave, I murmured, moving toward the screen. It was a little too unmoving out there. Maybe I was being paranoid, but I've learned to pay attention to my instincts. God knows Sean and Buffy weren't paying attention to anything but tomorrow's headlines. Sean grinned. I like it. Grayscale the image except for the lights and use that. On it. Buffy typed a quick note before shutting down the screen. Have we got any more big plans for the afternoon, folks? Getting out of here, I said, turning back to the others. I'm on the bike. I'll take point, but we need to get back to civilization. Buffy blinked at me, looking baffled. She's a fictional. Her style of blogging is totally self-contained, and she only sees the field when Sean and I haul her out to work our equipment. Even then, she pretty much never leaves the van. It's not her job to pay attention to anything that doesn't live on a computer screen. Sean, on the other hand, sobered immediately. Why? There's nothing moving out there. I opened the back door, scanning the land more closely. It had taken me a few minutes, maybe too long, to realize what was wrong. But now that I'd seen it, it was obvious. There should always be something moving in a town the size of Watsonville. Feral cats, rabbits, even herds of wild deer looking for the overgrown remains of what used to be gardens. We've seen everything from goats to somebody's abandoned Shetland pony wandering through the remains of the old towns, living off the land. So where were they? There wasn't as much as a squirrel in sight. Sean grimaced. Crap. Crap, I agreed. Buffy, grab your gear. I'll drive, Sean said, and started for the front of the van. 
Buffy was looking between us with wide-eyed bafflement. Okay, does somebody want to tell me what's causing the evacuation? She demanded. There aren't any animals, Sean said, dropping into the driver's seat. I paused while yanking my gloves back on, taking pity and replied, Nothing clears the wildlife like the infected. We need to get out of here before we have... As if on cue, a low, distant moan came through the van's back door, carried by the prevailing winds. I grimaced. Company, Sean and I finished in unison. Race you home, I called and ducked out the door. Buffy slammed it behind me, and I heard all three bolts click home. Even if I screamed, they'd never let me back inside. That's the protocol when you're in the field. No matter how loudly you yell, they never let you in. Not if they want to live, anyway. There were no zombies in sight, but the moaning from the north and east was getting louder. I tightened the straps on my gloves, grabbed my helmet, and slung my leg over the bike's still warm seat. Inside the van, I knew Buffy would be checking her cameras, fastening her seatbelt, and trying to figure out why we were reacting so badly to zombies that probably weren't even in range. If there's really a god, she's never going to know the answer to that one. The van pulled out, bumping and shaking as it made its way onto the freeway. I gunned the bike's engine and followed, pulling up alongside the van before moving out about ten feet ahead, where Sean could see me and we could both watch the road for obstructions. It's a simple safety formation, but it saved a lot of asses in the last twenty years. We rode like that, separated by a thin ribbon of broken road, all the way out of the valley, through the South Bay, and into the cool, welcoming air of Berkeley, California. Home, sweet zombie-free home. As he pressed his hand to her cheek, Marie could feel his flesh burning up from within, changing as the virus that slept in all of us awoke in her lover. She blinked back tears, licking suddenly dry lips before she managed to whisper, I'm so sorry, Vincent. I never thought that it would end this way. It doesn't have to end this way for you, he replied, and smiled, sorrow written in his still bright eyes. Get the hell out of here, Marie. There's nothing in this wasteland but the dead. Go home, live, and be happy. It's too late for that. It's too late for me. She held up the blood testing kit and watched his eyes widen as he took in the meaning of the single red light burning at the top. It's been too late since the attack. Her own smile was as weak as his. You called me the hyacinth, girl. I guess I belong in the wasteland. At least we're damned together, he said, and kissed her. From Love is a Metaphor, originally published in By the Sounding Sea, the blog of Buffy Maisonnier, August 3rd, 2039. Sean and I never met our parents' biological son, he was a kindergarten student during the Rising, and he survived the initial wave thanks to our parents, who pulled him out of class as soon as the data started pointing to public schools as amplification flashpoints. They did everything they could to protect him from the threat of infection. Everyone assumed he'd be one of the lucky ones. The people next door had two golden retrievers, each weighing well over 40 pounds, putting them in the range where amplification becomes possible. One of them was bitten. It was never determined by what, and began conversion. No one saw it coming because it had never happened before. Philip Anthony Mason was the first confirmed case of human Kellis Amberley conversion initiated by an animal. This honor does not help my parents sleep at night. I am aware that my stance on pet ownership legislation is not popular. People love dogs. People love horses, and they want to continue to keep them in private homes. I understand this. I also understand that animals want to be free, and that sick animals are twice as likely to slip their restraints and go looking for comfort. Eventually, comfort becomes something to bite. I support the biological mass pet ownership restrictions, as do my parents. Were my brother alive today, he might feel different. But he's not. From Images May Disturb You, the blog of Georgia Mason, November 3rd, 2039.
Chapter 3 Buffy's neighborhood doesn't allow non-resident vehicles to enter without running blood tests on all passengers, so we dropped her at the gate where she could get tested and head inside on foot. I don't like pricking my fingers, and we were already looking at a second blood test when we reached the house. We live in an open neighborhood, one of the last in Alameda County, but our parents have to meet certain requirements if they want to keep their homeowner's insurance, and until we can afford to move out on our own, we have to play along. I'll upload the footage as soon as I finish cleaning it up, Buffy promised. Drop me a text when you hit the house. Let me know you made it, okay? Sure, Buff, I said. Whatever you say. Buffy's a great techie and a decent friend, but her ideas about safety are a little skewed, probably thanks to growing up in a high-security zone. She's less worried in the field than she is in supposedly protected urban environments. While there are more attacks on an annual basis in cities than in rural areas, there are also a lot more large men with guns once you get away from the creeks and the cornfields. Given a choice between the two, I'm going to take the city every time. See you tomorrow, she said, and waved to Sean through the van's front window before she turned to head for the guard station where she'd spend the next five minutes being checked for contamination. Sean waved back and restarted the engine backing the van away from the gate. That was my cue. I flashed a thumbs up to show that I was good to go as I kicked my bike into a turn, leading the way back to Telegraph Avenue and into the tangled warren of suburban streets surrounding our house. Like Santa Cruz, Berkeley is a college town, and we got swarmed during the rising. Kellis Amberley hit the dorms, incubated, and exploded outward in an epidemic pattern that took practically everyone by surprise. Practically is the important word there. By the time the infection hit Berkeley, the first posts about activity in schools across the country were starting to show up online, and we had an advantage most college towns didn't. We started with more than our fair share of crazy people. See, Berkeley has always drawn the nuts and flakes of the academic world. That's what happens when you have a university that offers degrees in both computer science and parapsychology. It was a city primed to believe any weird thing that came across the wire. And when all those arguably crazy people started hearing rumors about the dead rising from their graves, they didn't dismiss them. They began gathering weapons, watching the streets for strange behavior and signs of sickness, and generally behaving like folks who'd actually seen a George Romero movie. Not everyone believed what they heard, but some did, and that turned out to be enough. That doesn't mean we didn't suffer when the first major waves of infection hit. More than half the population of Berkeley died over the course of six long days and nights, including the biological son of our adoptive parents, Philip Mason, who was barely six years old. The things that happened here weren't nice, and they weren't pretty. But unlike many towns that started out with similar conditions, a large homeless population, a major school, a lot of dark, narrow, one-way streets, Berkeley survived. Sean and I grew up in a house that used to belong to the university. It's located in an area that was judged impossible to secure when the government inspectors started getting their act together, and as a result, it was sold off to help fund the rebuilding of the main campus. The Masons didn't want to live in the house where their son had died, and the security rating of the neighborhood meant they were able to get the property for a song. They finalized the adoptions for the two of us the day before they moved in, an everything-is-normal rating stunt that eventually left them with a big house in the scary suburbs, two kids, and no idea what to do. So they did what came naturally. They gave more interviews, they wrote more articles, and they chased the numbers. From the outside, they looked devoted to giving us the sort of normal childhood they remembered having. They never moved us to a gated neighborhood. They let us have pets that lacked sufficient mass for reanimation. And when public schools started requiring mandatory blood tests three times a day, they had us enrolled in a private school before the end of the week. There's a semi-famous interview Dad gave right after that transfer, where he said they were doing their best to make us citizens of the world instead of citizens of fear. Pretty words, especially coming from a man who regarded his kids as a convenient way to stay on top of the news feeds. 
numbers start slipping, go for a field trip to a zoo. That'll get you right back to the top. There were a few changes they couldn't avoid, thanks to the government's anti-infection legislation, blood tests and psych tests and all that fun stuff. But they did their best, and I'll give them this much. A lot of the things they did for us weren't cheap. They paid for the right to raise us the way that they did. Entertainment equipment, internal security, even home medical centers can be bought for practically nothing. Anything that lets you outside, from vehicles to gasoline to gear that doesn't cut you off completely from the natural world, that's where things get expensive. The Masons paid in everything but blood to keep us in a place where there were blue skies and open spaces, and I'm thankful, even if it was always about ratings and a boy we never knew. The garage door slid open as we pulled into the driveway, registering the sensors Sean and I wear around our neck. In case of viral amplification, the garage becomes the zombie equivalent of a roach motel. Our sensors get us in, but only a clean blood test and a successful voice check gets us out. If we ever fail those tests, we'll be incinerated by the house defense system before we can do any further damage. Mom's armored minivan and the old Jeep Dad insists on driving to his job on campus were parked in their normal spots. I pulled over and killed the bike's engine, removing my helmet as I started a basic post-field check of the machinery. I needed to see a mechanic. The ride through Santa Cruz had seriously damaged my shocks. Buffy's cameras were still attached to the helmet in the back of the bike. I pulled them off and shoved them into my left saddlebag unsnapping it and slinging it over my shoulder as Sean pulled in behind me. Sean got out of the van and reached the back door three steps before I did. We made good time, he said, positioning himself in front of the right-hand sensors. Sure did, I said, and positioned myself on the left. Please identify yourselves, said the bland voice of the house security system. Most of the newer systems sound more like people than ours does. They'll even make jokes with their owners to keep them at ease. Psychological studies have shown that closing the gap between man and machine increases comfort and acceptance and prevents nervous breakdowns stemming from isolation anxiety. In short, people don't get cabin fever as much when they think they have more people they can safely talk to. I think that's bullshit. If you want to avoid cabin fever, go outside. Our machines have stayed mechanical at least so far. Georgia, Carol, and Mason, said Sean. I smirked. Sean Philip Mason. The light above the door blinked as the house checked our vocal intonations. We must have passed muster because it spoke again. Voice prints confirmed. Please read the phrase appearing on your display screen. Words appeared on my screen. I squinted to make them out through my sunglasses and read, Mares eat oats, and does eat oats, and little lambs eat ivy. A kid will eat ivy, too, wouldn't you? The words blinked out. I glanced at Sean, but couldn't quite see the words appearing on his screen before he was reciting them. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens. You owe me five farthings, say the bell of St. Martin's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey? The light over the door changed from red to yellow. Place your right hands on the testing pads, commanded the security system. Sean and I did as requested, pressing our hands against the metal panels set into the wall. The metal chilled beneath my palm a split second before there was a stinging sensation in my index finger. The light above the door began to flash, alternating red and yellow. Think we're clean? Sean asked. If not... It's been nice knowing you, I said. Coming in together means that if one of us ever tests positive, that's all she wrote. They won't let anybody out of the garage until a cleanup crew arrives, and the chances of whoever comes up clean making it to the van before something happens aren't good. Our next-door neighbor used to call Child Protective Services every six months because our folks wouldn't stop us from coming in together. But what's the point of life if you can't take risks now and then? like coming into the damn house with your brother. The light started flashing green instead of red, continuing to alternate with yellow for a few more seconds before yellow bowed out, leaving green to flash alone. 
The door unlocked, and the bland voice of the house said, Welcome, Sean and Georgia. Sup, the house, Sean replied, removing his shoes and tossing them into the outdoor cleaning unit before he walked inside, hollering, Hey, Rents, we're home. Our parents hate being called Rents. I'm pretty sure that's why he does it. And we survived, I added, copying the gesture and following him through the garage door. It swung closed and locked itself behind me. The kitchen smelled like spaghetti sauce and garlic bread. Failure to die is always appreciated, Mom said, entering the kitchen and putting an empty laundry basket on the counter. You know the drill, both of you upstairs and strip for sterilization. Yes, Mom, I said, picking up the basket. Come, Sean, the insurance bill calls us. Yes, Master, he drawled. Ignoring Mom entirely, he turned and followed me up the stairs. The house was a duplex before Mom and Dad had it converted back into a single-family home. Our bedrooms literally adjoin. There's an inside door between them. It makes life easier when it's time for editing and prep work, and it's been like that all our lives. On the few occasions when I've had to try sleeping without Sean in the next room, well, let's just say I can go a long way on a six-pack of Coke. I dropped the laundry basket in the hallway between our doors before going into my room and flicking the switch to turn on the overheads. We use low wattage bulbs in the entire house, but I've abandoned white light entirely in my private space, preferring to live by the gleam of computer monitors and the comforting non-light of black light UV lamps. They can cause premature wrinkling if used extensively. What they can't do is cause corneal damage, and I appreciate that. Sean, inside door. Got it, Sean called. The connecting door slammed shut, and the band of light beneath it was cut off a second later as he slid the damper into place. Sighing with relief, I removed my sunglasses, forcing my eyes to open all the way. I'd been out in the sun for too long. Even the UV lamp stung for a few seconds before my eyes adjusted and the room snapped into the sort of detailed focus most people only get in direct light. Retinal chelis amberly, as it's popularly called, is more properly referred to as acquired chelis amberly optic neuropathic reservoir condition. I've never heard anyone call it that outside a hospital, and even there it's usually just retinal KA. Those good old reservoir conditions. One more way for the virus to make life more interesting for everybody. My pupils are permanently dilated and don't contract in response to light. Retinal scans are impossible. Testing my vitreous and aqueous humors will always register a live infection. And best of all, my condition is advanced enough that my eyes don't even water. The virus produces a protective film and keeps the eyes from drying out. My tear ducts are atrophied. The only upside? Absolutely stellar low-light vision. I tossed my sunglasses into the biohazard disposal canister and started across the room. My living space shares a lot of features with the van, including the part where Buffy maintains about 90% of the equipment and I understand less than half of it. Flat screen monitors take up most of the walls, and we moved the group servers into my wardrobe last year when Sean decided he needed more space for his weapons. Whatever. It's not like I was using it. I don't wear anything that actually needs to be hung up. I belong to the Hunter S. Thompson School of Journalistic Fashion. If I have to think about it, I have no business wearing it. When you get right down to it, about the only similarity between my room and the room of your stereotypical 20-something woman is the full-length mirror next to the bed. There's a wall dispenser mounted next to the mirror. I ripped loose a sheet of tearaway plastic and spread it on the floor, stepping onto it as I turned to face my reflection. Hello, Georgia. Nice to see you're not dead yet. Slicking my sweat-soaked hair back from my face, I started studying my clothes for the telltale fluorescence that under the black lights would indicate traces of blood. Sean and I operate under Class A15 blogging licenses. We're cleared to report on events both inside and outside city limits, although we're still not permitted to enter any zones with a hazard rating at or above Level 3. The zones start at Level 10, 
the code for any area with resident mammals of sufficient body mass to undergo Kellis Amberley amplification and reanimation. Humans count. Level 9 means those mammals are not entirely kept in confinement. Buffy's neighborhood is considered a level 10 hazard zone, which means it's safe to let your children play outside, except for the part where it would instantly convert the zone to a level 9. Our house is classified as a level 7 hazard, possessing free-range mammals of sufficient body mass for full viral amplification, local wildlife capable of carrying blood or other bodily wastes onto the property, insufficiently secured borders, and windows more than a foot and a half in diameter. There's legislation currently under review that would make it a federal offense to raise any child in a hazard zone above level 8. I don't expect it to pass. It frightens me that it exists at all. It requires an A-10 blogging license to enter a level 3 hazard zone with any prayer of being allowed to exit it. We can't get those licenses, or anything above, until we turn 25 and pass a series of government-mandated tests, most of which center on the ability to make accurate headshots with a variety of firearms. That means no Yosemite for at least another two years. I'm fine with that. There's plenty of news to be found in more populated areas. Sean feels different. But he's an Irwin, and they thrive on wandering blindly into danger. All I've ever wanted to be is what I am, a newsy. I'm happy this way. Danger is a side effect of what I do, not the reason behind it. That doesn't mean danger throws up its hands and says, Oh, sorry, Georgia, I won't mess with you. Contamination is always a risk when dealing with zombies, especially when you have the recently infected involved. The older infected are usually too concerned with keeping themselves from dissolving to worry about smearing you with their precious bodily fluids but new ones are fresh enough to have fluid to spare. They'll splatter you if they can manage it, and then count on the viral bricks filling their bloodstream to do the hard part for them. It's not great as a hunting strategy, but as a way of spreading the infection, it works better than any uninfected person wants it to. Not that anyone left in the world is actually uninfected. That's part of the problem. We call people who have succumbed to viral amplification the infected, like it changes the fact that the virus is inside every one of us, patiently waiting for the day it gets invited to take over. The Kellis Amberley virus can remain in its dormant state for decades, if not forever. Unlike the people it infects, it can wait. One day, you're fine. The next day, your personal stockpile of virus wakes up, and you're on the road to amplification the death of the part of you that's a thinking, feeling human being, and the birth of your zombie future. Calling zombies the infected creates an artificial feeling of security, like we can somehow avoid joining them. Well, guess what? We can't. Viral amplification primarily occurs under one of two conditions. The initial death of the host, causing a disruption of the body's nervous system, and activating the virus already there, or contact with virus that has already switched over from dormant to live. Hence the real risk of engaging the zombies, because any hand-to-hand -hand conflict is going to result in a minimum casualty rate of 60%. Maybe 30% of those casualties are going to occur in the actual combat, if you're talking about people who know what they're doing. I've seen videos of martial arts clubs, and idiots with swords going up against the zombies in The Rising. And I'll be among the first to admit that they're damned impressive to watch. There's this amazing contrast between the grace and speed of a healthy person and the shambling slowness of the zombie that just, it's like seeing poetry come alive. It's heartbreaking, and it's sad, and it's beautiful as hell. And then the survivors go home laughing and elated and mourning for their dead. They take off their armor, and they clean their weapons, and maybe one of them nicks his thumb on the edge of an arm guard or wipes his eyes with a hand that got a little too close to a leaking zombie. Live viral particles hit the bloodstream, the cascade kicks off, and amplification begins. In an average-sized human adult, 
Full conversion happens inside of an hour, and the whole thing starts again without warning, without reprieve. The question, Johnny, is that you? went from horror movie cliche to real world crisis damn fast when people started facing the infected hand to hand. The closest call I've ever had came when a zombie managed to spit a mouthful of blood in my face. If I hadn't been wearing safety goggles over my sunglasses, I'd be dead. Sean's come closer than I have. I try not to ask anymore. I don't really want to know. My armor and pants were clean. I removed them and tossed them onto the plastic sheeting, performing the same check on my sweatshirt and thermal pants before stripping them off and adding them to the pile. A quick examination of my arms and legs revealed no unexpected smears or streaks of blood. I already knew I wasn't wounded. I'd cleared two blood tests since the field. If I'd been so much as scratched, I'd have started amplification before we had hit Watsonville. My socks, bra, and underwear joined the rest. They hadn't been exposed to the outside air. That didn't matter. They went into a hazard zone. They were getting sterilized. There are a lot of folks who advocate for sterilization outside the home. They get shouted down by the people who want to keep it internal, since field sterilization or even front yard chemical shower sterilization leaves the risk of recontamination before you reach a secure zone. So far, the groups have been able to keep things deadlocked, and we've been able to keep doing our self-examinations in relative peace. I stepped off the plastic sheet folded it around my clothes, scooped it up, and carried it to the bedroom door, which I opened long enough to toss the whole bundle into the hamper. It would go through an industrial-grade bleaching guaranteed to neutralize any viral bodies clinging to the fabric, and the clothes would be ready to wear again by morning. Even that brief blast of white light was enough to make my eyes burn. I scrubbed at them with the back of my hand as I turned toward the bathroom. Sean's door was still closed. I called, Showering now! A thump on the wall answered me. Sean and I share a private bathroom with its own fully modernized and airtight shower system. Another little requirement of the household insurance. Since we leave safe zones all the time in order to do our jobs, we have to be able to prove we've been properly sterilized. And that means logged computer verification of our sterilizations. The bathroom started life as the closets of our respective bedrooms. Personally, I consider this a much better use of the space. The bathroom lights switched to UV when my door opened. I walked over and pressed my hand to the shower's keypad, saying, Georgia Carolyn Mason. Accessing travel records, the shower replied. We don't screw with the shower the way we screw with the house system. House security is kept at an absolute minimum, but the shower is governmentally required for journalist use, and we could get in serious trouble if the records don't match up. The fines for posing a contamination risk are more than I could afford in six years of freelancing. The shower door unsealed. You have been exposed to a level four hazard zone. Please enter the stall for decontamination and sterilization. Don't mind if I do, I said and stepped in. The door shut behind me, locking with an audible hiss as the airlock seal engaged. A stinging compound of antiseptic and bleach squirted from the bottommost nozzle on the wall, coating me with icy spray. I held my breath and closed my eyes, counting the seconds before it would stop. They can only legally bathe you in bleach for half a minute unless you've been in a level two zone. At that point, they can keep dunking you until they're sure the viral blocks are clean. Everyone knows it doesn't do any good beyond the first 30 seconds, but that doesn't stop people from being afraid. Travel in a level one zone means they're not legally obligated to do anything but shoot you. The bleach stopped. The upper nozzle came on, spraying out water almost hot enough to burn. I cringed, but turned my face toward it, reaching for the soap. Clean, I said, once the shampoo was out of my hair. I keep it short for a variety of reasons. Most have to do with making myself harder to grab, but showering faster is also a definite motivation. If I wanted it to get any longer, I'd have to start using conditioner and a variety of other hair care chemicals to make up for the damage the bleach does every day. My one true concession to vanity is dyeing it back to the color nature gave me every few weeks. I look terrible blonde. Acknowledged, said the shower, and the water turned off, 
replaced by jets of air from all four sides. The one good part of our shower system. I was dry in a matter of minutes, leaving only a little residual dampness in my hair. The door unsealed, and I stepped out into the bathroom, grabbing for my bottle of lotion. Bleach and human skin aren't good buddies. The solution? Acid-based lotion, usually formulated around some sort of citrus to help repair the damage the bleaching does. Professional swimmers did it pre-rising, and everybody does it now. It also helps to lend a standardized scent tag to people who have scrubbed themselves recently. My lotion was as close to scentless as possible, and it still carried a faint, irritating hint of lemon, like floor cleanser. I worked the lotion into my skin and retreated to my own room, shouting, Sean, it's all yours! I got the door closed as his was opening, spilling white light into the room. That's not uncommon. We're pretty good about our timing. I grabbed my rope from the back of the door and shrugged it on as I walked to the main desk. The monitor detected my proximity and switched on, displaying the default menu screen. Our main system never goes offline. That's where group mail is routed, sorted according to which byline and category it's meant for. News to me, action to Sean, or fiction which goes straight to Buffy, and delivered to the appropriate inboxes. I get the administrative junk that Sean's too much of a jerk and Buffy's too much of a flake to deal with. Technically, we're a collective, but functionally, it's all me. Not that I object to the responsibility, except when it fills my inbox to the point of inspiring nightmares. It's nice to know that our licenses are paid up. We're in good with the umbrella network that supports our accreditation, and nobody's suing us for libel. We make pretty consistent ratings, with Sean and Buffy hitting top 10% for the Bay Area at least twice a month, and me holding steady in the 13-17% to 17% bracket, which isn't bad for a strict newsie. I could increase my numbers if I went multimedia and started giving my reports naked, but unlike some people, I'm still in this for the news. Sean, Buffy, and I all publish under our own blogs and bylines, which is why I get so damn much mail. But those blogs are published under the umbrella of Bridge Supporters, the second largest aggregator site in Northern California. We get readers and click-through traffic by dint of being listed on their front page, and they get a cut of our profits from all secondary market and merchandise sales. We've been trying to strike out on our own for a while now to go from being beta bloggers in an alpha world to baby alphas with a domain to defend. It's not easy. You need some story or feature that's big enough and unique enough to guarantee you'll take your readership with you, and our numbers haven't been sustainably high enough to interest any sponsors. My inbox finished loading. I began picking through the messages, moving with a speed that was half long practice and half the desire to get downstairs to dinner. Spam. Misrouted critique of Buffy's latest poem cycle, Decay of the Human Soul 1 through 12. A threatened lawsuit if we didn't stop uploading a picture of someone's infected and shambling uncle. All the usual crap. I reached for my mouse, intending to minimize the program and get up, when a message toward the bottom of the screen caught my eye. Urgent. Please reply. You have been selected. I would have dismissed that as spam, except for the first word. Urgent. People stopped flinging that word around like confetti after the rising. Somehow, the potential for missing the message that zombies just ate your mom made offering to give people a bigger dick seem less important. Intrigued, I clicked the title. I was still sitting there staring at the screen five minutes later when Sean opened the door to my room and casually stepped inside. A flood of white light accompanied him, stinging my eyes. I barely flinched. George, Mom says if you don't get downstairs, she'll... George? There was a note of real concern in his voice as he took in my posture, my missing sunglasses, and the fact that I wasn't dressed. Is everything okay? Buffy's okay, isn't she? Wordless, I gestured to the screen. He stepped up behind me and fell silent, reading over my shoulder. Another five minutes passed before he said, in a careful, subdued tone, Georgia, is that what I think it is? Uh-huh. They really, it's not a joke? That's the federal seal. 
The registered letter should be here in the morning. I turned to face him, grinning so broadly that it felt like I was going to pull something. They picked our application. They picked us. We're going to do it. We're going to cover the presidential campaign. My profession owes a lot to Dr. Alexander Kellis, inventor of the misnamed Kellis flu, and Amanda Amberley, the first individual successfully infected with the modified phylovirus that researchers dubbed Marburg Amberley. Before them, blogging was something people thought should be done by bored teenagers talking about how depressed they were. Some folks used it to report on politics and the news, but that application was widely viewed as reserved for conspiracy nuts and people whose opinions were too vitriolic for the mainstream. The blogosphere wasn't threatening the traditional news media, not even as it started having a real place on the world stage. They thought of us as quaint. Then the zombies came, and everything changed. The real media was bound by rules and regulations, while the bloggers were bound by nothing more than the speed of their typing. We were the first to report that people who'd been pronounced dead were getting up and noshing on their relatives. We were the ones who stood up and said, yes, there are zombies, and yes, they're killing people, while the rest of the world was still buzzing about the amazing act of eco-terrorism that released a half-tested cure for the common cold into the atmosphere. We were giving tips on self-defense when everybody else was barely beginning to admit that there might be a problem. The early network reports are preserved online, over the protests of the media conglomerates. They sue from time to time and get the reports taken down, but someone always puts them up again. We're never going to forget how badly we were betrayed. People died in the streets while news anchors made jokes about people taking their zombie movies too seriously and showed footage they claimed depicted teenagers horsing around in latex and bad stage makeup. According to the timestamps on those reports, the first one aired the day Dr. Matras from the CDC violated national security to post details on the infection on his 11-year-old daughter's blog. Twenty-five years after the fact, his words, simple, bleak, and unforgiving against their background of happy teddy bears, still send shivers down my spine. There was a war on, and the ones whose responsibility it was to inform us wouldn't even admit that we were fighting it. But some people knew and screamed everything they understood across the Internet. Yes, the dead were rising, said the bloggers. Yes, they were attacking people. Yes, it was a virus. And yes, there was a chance we might lose because by the time we understood what was going on, the whole damn world was infected. The moment Dr. Kellis's cure hit the air, we had no choice but to fight. We fought as hard as we could. That's when the wall began. Every blogger who died during the summer of 14 is preserved there, from the politicos to the soccer moms. We've taken their last entries and collected them in one place to honor them and to remember what they paid for the truth. We still add people to the wall. Someday, I'll probably post Sean's name there, along with some lighthearted last entry that ends with, See you later. Every method of killing a zombie was tested somewhere. A lot of the time, the people who tested it died shortly afterward, but they posted their results first. We learned what worked, what to do, and what to watch for in the people around us. It was a grassroots revolution based on two simple precepts. Survive however you could, and report back whatever you learned because it might keep somebody else alive. They say that everything you ever needed to know, you learned in kindergarten. What the world learned that summer was share. Things were different when the dust cleared. Some people might find it petty to say, especially where the news was concerned. But if you ask me, that's where the real change happened. People didn't trust regulated news anymore. They were confused and scared and they turned to the bloggers who might be unfiltered and full of shit, but were fast, prolific, and allowed you to triangulate on the truth. Get your news from six or nine sources, and you can usually tell the bullshit from the reality. If that's too much work, 
You can find a blogger who does your triangulation for you. You don't have to worry about another zombie invasion going unreported because someone, somewhere, is putting it online. The blogging community divided into its current branches within a few years of the rising, reacting to swelling ranks and a changing society. You've got newsies, who report fact as untainted by opinion as we can manage, and our cousins, the Stuarts, who report opinion informed by fact. The Irwins go out and harass danger to give the relatively housebound general populace a little thrill, while their more sedate counterparts, the aunties, share stories of their lives, recipes, and other snippets to keep people happy and relaxed. And of course, the fictionals, who fill the online world with poetry, stories, and fantasy. They have a thousand branches, all with their own names and customs, none of them meaning a damn thing to anyone who isn't a fictional. We're the all-purpose opiate of the new millennium. We report the news, we make the news, and we give you a way to escape when the news becomes too much to handle. From Images May Disturb You, the blog of Georgia Mason, August 6, 2039. Chapter 4 Presidential campaigns have traditionally been attended by pet journalists, selected to follow the campaign and report on everything from the bright beginning to the sometimes bitter end. The rising didn't change that. Candidates announce their runs for the big chair, pick up their little flock of television, radio, and print reporters, and hit the road. This year's presidential election is different, largely because one of the lead candidates, Senator Peter Ryman, born, raised, and elected in Wisconsin, is the first man to run for office who was under 18 during the summer of 14. He remembers the feeling of being betrayed by the news, of watching people die because they trusted the media to tell them the truth. So when he announced his candidacy, he made it a point that he wouldn't just be inviting the usual crew to follow his campaign. He'd also invite a group of bloggers to walk the campaign trail with him before the first primary, all the way to the election, assuming he made it that far. It was a bold move. It was a huge strike for the legitimacy of Internet news. Maybe we're licensed journalists now, with all the insurance costs and restrictions that implies, but we're still sneered at by certain organizations, and we can have trouble getting to information from a lot of the mainstream agencies. Having a presidential candidate acknowledge us was an amazing step forward. Of course, he was only going to allow three bloggers to come along. All of them had to have their Class A-15 licenses before they could even apply. If you were in the process of qualifying, your application would be thrown out without any sort of review. Most of the bloggers we know applied, either singly or in groups, and we wanted that posting so bad that we could taste it. It was our ticket to the big leagues. Buffy had been operating under a Class B-20 license for years. As a fictional, she didn't need the clearance for field work, political reporting, or biohazard zones, and so she'd never seen the point in paying the license fees or taking the tests. Sean and I rushed her through her A-level tests and classifications so fast that she just looked sort of stunned when they handed her the upgraded license. We sent in our application the next day. Sean was sure we'd get it. I was sure we wouldn't. Now, still staring at my monitor, Sean said, George? Yeah? You owe me 20 bucks. Yeah, I agreed, before standing and throwing my arms around his neck. Sean responded by whooping, putting his arms around my waist and lifting me off the ground in order to whirl me around the room. We got the job, he shouted. We got the job, I shouted back. After that, we devolved to shouting the words together, Sean still swinging me in a circle until the bedroom intercom crackled on and Dad's voice demanded, Are you two making that racket for a reason? We got the job, we shouted in unison. Which job? The big job, Sean said, putting me down and grinning at the intercom like he thought it could see him. The biggest job in the history of big jobs. The campaign, I said, aware that the grin on my face was probably just as big and stupid as the grin on Sean's. We got the posting for the presidential campaign. 
There was a long pause before the intercom crackled again and Dad said, You kids get dressed. I'll get your mother. We're going out. But dinner can go into the fridge. If you two are going to go stalk politicians all over the country, we're going out for dinner first. Call Buffy and see if she wants to come. And that's an order. Yes, sir, said Sean, saluting the intercom. It clicked off and he turned on me, holding out his right hand. Pay up. I pointed to the door. Get out. There's about to be nudity and you'll just complicate things. Finally, adult content. Should I turn the webcams on? We could have a front page feed in less than five. I grabbed my pocket recorder and flung it at his head. He ducked, grinning again. Minutes. I'll go get some nicer clothes on. You can call the buff one. Out, I said again, lips twitching as I fought a smile. He walked back to the door between our rooms, stepping through before he shot back. Wear a skirt and I'll release you from your debts. He managed to close the door before I found anything else to throw. Shaking my head, I moved to the dresser saying, Phone, dial Buffy Masonier, home line. Keep dialing until she picks up. Buffy has a tendency to leave her phone on vibrate and ignore it while she follows her muse, which is basically a fancy way of saying, screws around online, writes a really depressing poem or short story, posts it, and makes three times what I do and click through revenue and t-shirt sales. Not that I'm bitter or anything. The truth will make you free, but it won't make you particularly wealthy. I knew that when I chose my profession. Playing with dead things is a little more lucrative, but Sean doesn't make enough to support us both. Not yet, anyway. And he isn't willing to move out without me. A lifetime spent within arm's reach and counting primarily on each other has left us a little dependent on one another's company. In an earlier, zombie-free era, this would have been dubbed codependence and resulted in years of therapy culminating in us hating each other's guts. Adoptive siblings aren't supposed to treat each other like they're the center of the world. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, that was an attitude for a different world. Here and now, sticking with the people who know you best is the most guaranteed way of staying alive. Sean won't leave the house until I do, and when we go, we'll be going together. By the time Buffy picked up her phone, I had actually managed to find a dark gray tweed skirt that not only fit, but that I was willing to wear in a public place. I was digging for a top when the line clicked, and she said peevishly, I was writing. You're always writing, unless you're reading, screwing with something mechanical, or masturbating, I replied. Are you wearing clothes? Currently, she said, irritation fading into confusion. Georgia, is that you? It ain't Sean. I pulled down a white button-down shirt, jamming the hem under the waistband of my skirt. We'll be there to pick you up in 15. We being me, Sean, and the rents. They're taking the whole crew to dinner. It's just them trying to piggyback on our publicity for some rating points, but right now, failing to care. Buffy isn't as slow on the uptake as she sometimes seems. Her voice suddenly tight with suppressed excitement, she asked, Did we get it? We got it, I confirmed. Her ear-splitting shriek of joy was enough to make me wince, even after it had been reduced by the phone's volume filters. Smiling, I pulled a crumpled black blazer out of my drawer and shrugged it on before grabbing a fresh pair of sunglasses from the stack on the dresser. So we're picking you up in 15. Deal? Yes, 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 deal. Hallelujah, yes, she babbled. I have to change and tell my roommates and change and see you. Bye. There was another click. My phone announced, the call has been terminated. Would you like to place another call? No, I'm good, I said. The call has been terminated, the phone repeated. Would you like? I sighed. No, thank you. Disconnect. The phone beeped and turned itself off. With the strides they've been making in voice recognition software, you'd think they could teach the stuff to acknowledge colloquial English. One step at a time, I suppose. Mom, Dad, and Sean were in the living room when I came breezing down the stairs, shoving my handheld MP3 recorder into the loop at my belt. 
The backup recorder in my watch has a recording capacity of only 30 megabytes, and that's barely enough for a good interview. My handheld can hold up to five terabytes. If I need more than that before I can get to a server to dump the contents, I'd better be bucking for a Pulitzer. Mom was wearing her best green dress, the one that appears in all her publicity shots, and Dad was in his usual professorial ensemble, tweed jacket, white shirt, khaki slacks. Put them next to Sean, who was wearing a button-down shirt with his customary cargo pants, and they looked just like the last family publicity picture, even down to Mom's overstuffed handbag with all the guns inside it. She takes advantage of her A5 blogging license in ways that boggle the mind, but it's the government's fault for leaving the loopholes there. If they want to give anybody with a journalist license ranked class A7 or above the right to carry concealed weapons when entering any zone that's had a breakout within the last 10 years, that's their problem. At least Mom's responsible about it. She always secures the safety on any gun that she's planning to take into a restaurant. Buffy's going to be ready in 15, I said, pushing my sunglasses more solidly up the bridge of my nose. Some of the newer models have magnetic clamps instead of earpieces. They won't come off without someone intentionally disengaging them. I would have been tempted to invest in a pair if they weren't expensive enough to require decontamination and reuse. The sun's going down. You could wear your contacts, Dad said, sounding amused. He's good at sounding amused. He's been sounding professionally amused since before the rising back when he used his campus webcast to keep biology students around the Berkeley area paying attention and doing their homework. Eventually, that same webcast let him coordinate pockets of survivors, moving them from place to place while reporting on the movement of the local zombie mobs. A lot of people owe their lives to that warm, professional-sounding voice. He could have become a news anchor with any network in the world after the dust cleared. He stayed at Berkeley instead and became one of the pioneers of the evolving blogger society. I could also stick a fork in my eye, but where would be the fun in that? I walked over to Sean, offering a thin smile. He studied my skirt and then flashed me a thumbs-up sign. I had passed the all-judging court of my brother's fashion sense, which, cargo pants aside, is more advanced than mine will ever be. I called Bronson's. They have a table for us on the patio. Mom said, smiling beatifically. It's a beautiful night. We should be able to see the entire city. Sean glanced at me, murmuring, We let Mom pick the restaurant. I smirked. I can see that. Bronson's is the last open-air restaurant in Berkeley. More, they're the last open-air restaurant in the entire Bay Area to be located on a hillside and surrounded by trees. Eating there is what I imagine it was like to go out to dinner before the constant threat of the infected drove most people away from the wilderness. The entire place is considered a level six hazard zone. You can't even get in without a basic field license, and they require blood tests before they let you leave. Not that there's any real danger. It's surrounded by an electric fence too high for the local deer to jump over, and floodlights click on if anything larger than a rabbit moves in the woods. The only serious threat comes from the chance that an abnormally large raccoon might go into conversion, make it over the fence before it lost the coordination to climb trees, and drop down inside. That's never happened. Not that this stops Mom from hoping to be there when it near inevitably does. She was one of the first true Irwins, and old habits die hard when they die at all. Shouldering her purse, she gave me a disapproving look. Could you at least pretend to comb your hair? She asked. It looks like you have a hedgehog nesting on your head. That's the look I was going for, I said. Mom is blessed with sleek, well-behaved, ash-blonde hair that started silvering gracefully when Sean and I were ten. Dad has practically no hair left, but when he had it, it was a muted Irish red. I, on the other hand, have thick, dark brown hair that comes in two settings long enough to tangle, and short enough to look like I haven't brushed it in years. I prefer the short version. Sean's hair is a little lighter than mine, but still brown, and when he keeps it short, no one can tell that his is straight and mine wants to curl. It helps us get away with just saying we're twins, rather than going into the whole messy explanation. Mom sighed. 
You two realize the odds are good that someone already knows you got the assignment and you're going to get swarmed tonight, yes? Mm-hmm, I said. Someone probably received a quick phone call from one or both of our parents, and someone was probably already waiting at the restaurant. We grew up with the ratings game. Looking forward to it, said Sean. He's better at playing nice with our parents than I am. Every site that runs my picture tonight is five more foxy ladies around the country realizing that they want to hit the road with me. Pig, I said, and punched him in the arm. Oink, he said. It's all right. We know the drill. Smile pretty for the cameras. Show off my scars. Let George and Dad look wise and trustworthy. Pose for anyone who asks. And don't try to answer any questions with actual content. Whereas I don't smile unless forced. Stay behind my sunglasses and make a point of how incisive and hard-hitting every report I approve for release is going to be, I said dryly. We let Buffy babble to her heart's content about the poetic potential of traveling around the country with a bunch of political yahoos who think we're idiots. And we make the front page of every alpha site in the country, and our ratings go up nine points overnight, Sean said. Thus allowing us to announce the formation of our own site early next week, just before heading out on the campaign trail. I slid my sunglasses down my nose, ignoring the way the light stung as I offered a brief smile. We've thought about this as much as you have. Maybe more, Sean added. Dad laughed. Face it, Stacy. They've got it covered. Kids, just in case there isn't another chance for me to tell you this, your mother and I are very proud of you. Very proud of you indeed. Liar. We're pretty proud of us too, I said. Well then, Sean said, clapping his hands together. This is touching and all, but come on. Let's go eat. Getting out of the house is easier with our parents in tow, largely because mom's minivan is kept ready at all times. Food, water, a CDC-certified biohazard containment unit for temperature-sensitive medications, a coffee maker, steel-reinforced windows. We could be trapped inside that thing for a week, and we'd be fine. Except for the part where we'd go crazy from stress and confinement and kill each other before rescue came. When Sean and I go into the field, we need to check our gear, sometimes twice, to make sure it's not going to let us down. Mom just grabs her keys. Buffy was waiting at her neighborhood guard station, dressed in an eye-popping combination of tie-dyed leggings and knee-length glitter tunic, with star and moon hologram clips in her hair. Anyone who didn't know her would have thought she was completely devoid of sense, fashion, or common. That's what she was aiming for. Buffy travels with more hidden cameras than Sean and I combined. As long as people are busy staring at her hair, they don't wonder why she's so careful about pointing the tiny jewels she has pasted to her nails in their direction. She waved and grabbed her duffel bag when the van pulled up. Then she ran to hop into the back with Sean and me. The footage of that moment would be on the site within the hour. Hey, Georgia. Hey, Sean. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Mason, she chirped buckling herself in while Sean slammed the door. I just finished watching your trip to Colma, Mrs. Mason. Really great stuff. I would never have thought to elude a bunch of zombies by climbing a high dive platform. Why, thank you, Georgette, said Mom. Thrill as Buffy kisses ass, Sean said, deadpan. Buffy shot him a poisonous look, and he just laughed. Content that all was right with the world, I settled back in my seat folded my arms across my chest and closed my eyes, letting the chatter in the van wash over me without registering it. It had been a long day, and it was nowhere near over. When blogging first emerged as a major societal trend, it was news rendered anonymous. Rather than trusting something because Dan Rather looked good on camera, you trusted things because they sounded true. The same went for reports of personal adventures, or people writing poetry, or whatever else folks felt like putting out there for the world to see. You got no context on who created it, and so you judged the work on the basis of what it actually was. That changed when the zombies came, at least for the people who went professional. These days, bloggers don't just report the news, they create it, and sometimes 
they become it. Landing the position of pet bloggers for Senator Ryman's presidential campaign? That definitely counts as becoming the news. That's part of why Sean and Buffy keep me around. My journalistic integrity is unquestioned by our peers. And when we make the jump to Alpha, the suddenly feasible jump to Alpha, that's going to cement our credibility. Sean and Buffy will bring in the readers. I'll make it okay for them to trust us. They just have to deal with my depressed personal ratings because part of what makes me so credible is the fact that my news is free from passion, opinion, and spin. I do op-ed, but for the most part, what you'll get from me is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Sean elbowed me when we reached Bronson's. I slid my sunglasses back into position and opened my eyes. Status? I asked. At least four visible cameras. Probably twelve to fifteen, all told. Leaks? That many cameras? At least six sites already know. Got it. Buffy? Taking point, she said, and straightened, putting on her best camera-ready smile. My parents exchanged amused looks in the front seat. It's all uphill from here, I said. Sean leaned over and opened the van door. Before the rising, crowds of paparazzi were pretty much confined to the known haunts of celebrities and politicians, the people whose faces could be used to sell a few more magazines. The rise of reality television and the internet media changed all that. Suddenly, anybody could be a star if they were willing to embarrass themselves in the right ways. People got famous for wanting to get laid, a stunt men have been trying to achieve since the day we discovered puberty. People got famous for having useless talents, memorizing trivia, or just being willing to get filmed 24 hours a day while living in a house full of strangers. The world was a weird place before the rising. After the rising, with an estimated 87% of the populace living in fear of infection and unwilling to leave their homes, a new breed of reality star was born, the reporter. While you can be an aggregator or a steward without risking yourself in the real world, it's hard to be an Irwin, a newsy, or even a really good fictional if you cut yourself off that way. So we're the ones who eat in restaurants and go to theme parks, the ones who visit national parks even though we'd really rather not, the ones who take the risks the rest of the country has decided to avoid. And when we're not taking those risks ourselves, we report on the people who are. We're like a snake devouring its own tail over and over again forever. Sean and I have done paparazzi duty when the stories were thin on the ground and we needed to make a few bucks fast. I'd rather go for another filming session in Santa Cruz. Something about playing vulture just makes me feel dirty. Buffy was the first to flounce into the crowd looking like a little glittering ball of sunshine and happiness before they closed ranks around her, flashbulbs going off in all directions. Her giggle could cut through steel. I could hear it even after she'd made it halfway to the restaurant doors, distracting the worst of the paparazzi in the process. Buffy's cute, photogenic, a hell of a lot friendlier than I am, and, best of all, She's been known to draw hints about her personal life that can be turned into valuable rating points when the stories go live. Once, she even brought out a boyfriend. He didn't last long, but when she had him, Sean and I could practically have danced naked on the van without getting harassed. Good times. Sean stepped out of the van already smiling. That smile's made him a lot of friends in the female portion of the blogosphere, Something about him looking like he'd be just as happy to explore the dangerous wilderness of the bedroom as he is to explore the mysteries of things that want to make him die. They should know by now it's a gimmick, given his continuing lack of a social life that doesn't include the infected, but they keep falling for it. Half the cameras swung around to face him, and several of the chirpy little anchor women because every twit who knows how to post an interview on the vid sites is an anchor woman these days, just ask them, shoved their microphones into his face. Sean immediately started giving them what they wanted, chattering merrily about our latest reports, 
offering coy, meaningless come-ons, and basically talking about anything and everything other than our new assignment. Sean's smokescreen gave me the opportunity I needed to slip out of the car and start warming my way toward the restaurant doors. Paparazzi gatherings are one of the few times you'll see a crowd in public. I spotted nervous-looking Berkeley police in riot gear around the edge of the crowd as I made my way toward the thinner concentration of bodies. They were waiting for something to go wrong. They'd just have to keep waiting. There's only been one incident where an outbreak started from a gathering of licensed reporters, and it happened when a nervous celebrity, the real sort, a TV sitcom star, not one of the ones who built themselves celebrity out of boredom, freaked out, pulled a gun out of her purse, and started shooting. The jury found the TV star, not the paparazzi, at fault for the outbreak that followed. One of the newsies near the police offered me a sidelong nod, making no move to draw attention to my position. I nodded back, relieved by his discretion. He was just crowd surfing, but it was a nice thing to do. I made a note of his face. If his sight put in for an interview, I'd grant it. Irwins get crowd comfortable the easy way. When you live in the hope that an outbreak will happen where you can observe it, you don't worry about avoiding them the way a sane person might. Fictionals go one of two directions. Some avoid crowds like everybody else. Others refuse to acknowledge that they could possibly get infected when they haven't put it in the script, and they go gaily bouncing hither and yon, ignoring the danger. Newsies tend to be more cautious because we know what could happen if we're not. Unfortunately, the demands of our job make it hard for us to be total hermits. And so even those of us who don't need the additional income or exposure from the paparazzi flux join up with them from time to time, getting accustomed to the feeling of being surrounded by other bodies. The paparazzi flux are our version of the obstacle course. Stand in them without freaking out, and you might be ready for real field work. My skirt the crowd and keep your eyes on the door technique seemed to be working. With Sean and Buffy providing louder, more visible targets, no one was going for me. Besides, I have a well-established and well-deserved reputation for being the sort of interviewee who walks away leaving you with nothing you can use as a front-page quote or saleable soundbite. It's hard to interview someone who refuses to talk to you. Ten feet to the door. Nine. Eight. Seven. And this is my gorgeous daughter, Georgia, who's going to be the head of Senator Ryman's hand-selected blogging team. Mom's hand caught my elbow, just as the gushing, ebullient tone of her voice caught my ears. Trapped. She swung me around to face the crowd of paparazzi, fingers digging into my arm. More quietly, through gritted teeth, she said, You owe me this. Got it, I said out of the corner of my mouth, and let myself be turned. Sean and I figured out early what our purpose was in our parents' lives. When your classmates aren't allowed to go to the movies because they might be exposed to unknown individuals, while your parents are constantly proposing wild adventures in the outside world, you get the idea that maybe something's going on. Sean was the first to realize how they were using us. It's about the only place where he grew up before I did. I got over Santa. He got over our parents. Mom kept an iron grip on my arm as she mugged and preened, recreating her favorite photo opportunity, version 511. The flamboyant Irwin poses with her stoic daughter, polar opposites united by a passion for the news. I once sat down with the news aggregators and compared a public image search to the collection of private pictures on the house database. 82% of the physical affection I've received from my mother has been in public, in careful view of one or more cameras. If that seems cynical, answer this. Why has she reliably, for my entire life, waited to touch me until there was someone with a visible camera in shooting range? People wonder why I'm not physically affectionate. The number of times I've been a rating-boosting photo opportunity for my parents should be sufficient answer. The only person who's ever hugged me without thinking about the shooting angles and light saturation is my brother, and he's the only one whose hugs I've ever given a damn about. My glasses filtered camera flashes, although it wasn't long before I had to close my eyes anyway. 
Some of the newer cameras have lights on them strong enough to take photographs in total darkness that seem to have been taken at noon, and there's not an intelligence check associated with buying that sort of equipment. One of those suckers goes off in your face, you know you've been photographed. I was going to have a migraine for days thanks to Mom's forced photo opportunity. There was no way I could have avoided it. It was given before dinner or spend the entire meal being harangued about my duties as a good daughter, leading to a much longer photo session afterward. I'd rather kiss a zombie raccoon. Buffy came to my rescue, slinking through the crowd with the sort of grace that only comes from the kind of practice most of our generation has avoided. Reaching out, she caught hold of my other arm and chirped all dizzy good cheer. Ms. Mason, Georgia, Mr. Mason says our table's ready. Only if you don't come now, they may release it, and then we'll have to wait at least half an hour for another table. She paused before delivering the coup de grace. An inside table. That was the perfect thing to say. Sitting outside added to the family's mystique, making us look brave and adventurous. Parental opinion, not mine. I think eating outside when you don't have to makes you look like a suicidal idiot dying to get munched by a zombie deer. Sean sighs with every... Our table proved to be nice enough to suit Mom's idea of propriety. It was located in the far corner of the yard, close to both the fence keeping out the woods and the fence isolating us from the street. Several enterprising paparazzi had drifted over to that portion of the sidewalk and were snapping candid shots through the bars. Mom flashed them a dimpled grin. Dad looked knowing and wise. I fought the urge to gag. My handheld vibrated, signaling an incoming text message. I unclipped it from my belt, tilting it to show the screen. Think this'll die down when we're on the road? S. I smirked, tapping out. Once the media machine, a.k.a. Mom, has been left here? Absolutely. We'll be small potatoes next to the main course. He tapped back. I love it when you compare people to food. Practicing for the inevitable. Sean snorted laughter, nearly dropping his phone into the basket of breadsticks. Dad shot him a sharp look, and he put his phone down next to his silverware, saying angelically, I was checking my ratings. Dad's scowl melted instantly. How's it looking? Not bad. The footage the Buffster managed to clean before we hauled her away from her computer is getting a really good download rate. Sean flashed a grin at Buffy, who preened. If you want her to like you, compliment her poetry. If you want her to love you, compliment her tech. I figure once I do the parallel reports and record my commentary, my share's gonna jump another eight points. I may break my own top stats this month. Show off, I said, and smacked him on the arm with my fork. Slacker, he replied, still grinning. Children, said Mom, but there was no heat behind it. She loved it when we goofed around. It made us look more like a real family. I'm going to have the teriyaki soy burger, said Buffy. She leaned forward and said conspiratorially, I heard from a guy who knows a girl whose boyfriend's best friend is in biotech that he, the best friend I mean, ate some beef that was cloned in a clean room and didn't have a viral colony and it tasted just like teriyaki soy. Would that it were true, said Dad, with the weird sort of mournfulness reserved for people who grew up before the rising and were now confronted with something that's been lost forever, like red meat. That's another nasty side effect of the KA infection that no one thought about until they were forced to deal with it firsthand. Everything mammalian harbors a virus colony and the death of the organism causes the virus to transmute into its live state. Hot dogs, hamburgers, steaks, and pork chops are things of the past. Eat them, and you're eating live viral particles. Are you sure there aren't any sores in your mouth? In your esophagus? Can you be 100% certain that no part of your digestive tract has been compromised in any way? All it takes is the smallest break in the body's defenses and your slumbering infection wakes up. Cooking the meat enough to kill the infection also kills the flavor, and it's still a form of Russian roulette. The most well-done steak in the world may have one tiny speck of rare meat somewhere inside it, and that's all it takes.
My brother wrestles with the infected, gives speeches while standing on cars in designated disaster zones, never wears sufficient armor, and generally goes through life giving the impression that he's a suicide waiting to happen. Even he won't eat red meat. Poultry and fish are safe, but a lot of people avoid them anyway. Something about the act of eating flesh makes them uncomfortable. Maybe it's the fact that suddenly, after centuries of ruling the farmyard, mankind has reason to empathize with the chicken. We always had turkeys at Thanksgiving and geese at Christmas. Just another raiding stunt on the part of our increasingly media-savvy parents. But at least this one had some useful side effects. Sean and I are some of the only people I know in our generation who don't have any unreasonable dietary hang-ups. I'm going to have the chicken salad and a cup of today's soup, I said. And a Coke, prompted Sean. And a carafe, I corrected him. He was still teasing me about my caffeine intake when the waiter appeared, accompanied by the beaming manager. No surprise there. As a family, we've been excellent customers for as long as I can remember. Every time a local outbreak has closed down outside gathering areas, Mom's been at Bronson's, eating in the enclosed dining area and making a point of being the first one outside when they're allowed to reopen it. It'd be stupid not to appreciate what we've done for their business. The waiter was carrying a tray laden with our usual assortment of drinks. Coffee for Mom and Dad, a virgin daiquiri for Buffy, a bottle of sparkling apple cider for Sean, it looks like beer from any sort of a distance, and a pitcher of Coke for me. Compliments of the house the manager declared, turning his smile on me and Sean. We're so proud of you. Going off to be media superstars, it runs in the family. It definitely does, simpered Mom, doing her best to look like a giggling schoolgirl. She was only succeeding at looking like an idiot, but I wasn't going to tell her that. We were almost on the campaign trail. It wasn't worth the fight. Be sure to sign a menu before you leave, the manager pressed. We'll put it on the wall. When you're too big to come to places like this, we'll be able to say, they ate here, they ate fries right there, right at that table while they did their math homework. It was physics, protested Sean, laughing. Whatever you say, said the manager. The waiter passed drinks around as we placed our orders. He finished by pouring the first cup of Coke from my pitcher with a flourish of his wrist. I smiled at that, and he winked at me, clearly pleased. I let my smile die, spiking an eyebrow upward. Hours of practice with my mirror have shown me that particular expression's success in conveying disdain. It's one of the few facial expressions that's helped by my sunglasses, rather than being hindered by them. His pleasure faded, and he hustled through the rest of his duties without looking at me. Sean caught my eye, mouthing, that wasn't nice, at me. I shrugged, mouthing, he should have known better back at him. I don't flirt. Not with waiters, not with other reporters, not with anybody. Finally, the staff retreated, and Mom raised her glass, clearly signaling for a toast. Choosing the path of least resistance, the rest of us did the same. Two ratings, she said. Two ratings, we agreed, and clinked our glasses around the table in doleful adherence to the ritual. We were on the road to those ratings now. All we had to do was hope that we were good enough to keep them, whatever it might take. My friend Buffy likes to say love is what keeps us together. The old pop songs had it right, and it's all about love, full stop, no room for arguing. Mahir says loyalty is what matters. Doesn't matter what kind of person you were, as long as you were loyal. George, she says it's the truth that matters. We live and die for the chance to maybe tell a little bit of the truth, maybe shame the devil just a little bit before we go. Me, I say those are all great things to live for, if they're what happens to float your boat. But at the end of the day, there's got to be somebody you're doing it for. Just one person you're thinking of every time you make a decision, every time you tell the truth, or tell a lie, or anything. I've got mine. Do you? From Hail to the King, the blog of Sean Mason, September 19th, 2039. 
Chapter 5 ID Georgia Carolyn Mason, licensed online news representative, after the end times. I handed my license and photo identification to the man in black, turning my left wrist over to reveal the blue and red ID tattoo I had done when I tested for my first Class B license. Tattooing isn't legally required, yet, but it gives them something to identify your body by. Every little bit helps. Registered with the North American Association of Internet Journalists, dental records, skin sample, and identifying markings on file. Remove the sunglasses. That was a request I was all too familiar with. If you'll check my file, uh, you'll see that I have a filed notation of retinal Kellis Amberley syndrome. If there's another test we can perform, I'd be happy to remove the sunglasses. You realize I won't display a normal retinal pattern. The man in black offered me the ghost of a smile. Well, ma'am, if your eyes check normal, we'll know you've been making all this fuss because you weren't who you claimed to be now, won't we? Damn. Right, I muttered and removed my glasses. Forcing myself to keep my eyes open despite the pain, I turned to press my face into the retinal scanner being held by the second member of Senator Ryman's private security team. They would compare the scan results to the ocular patterns in my file, checking for signs of degradation or decay that could signify a recent viral flare. Not that they'd get any useful results from me. Retinal KA means my eyes always register as if I were harboring a live infection. Buffy and Sean were going through the standard version of the same process with their own detachments of black-suited security representatives just a few feet away from me. I was willing to bet theirs hurt less. The light at the top of the retinal scanner went from red to green, and the man pulled it away, nodding to his companion. Hand, said the first man. I took a few precious seconds to slide my sunglasses back into place before holding out my right hand and managed not to grimace as it was grabbed and thrust into a closed-case blood-testing unit. Clinical interest took over, wiping away my distaste for the process as I studied the unit's casing. Is that an Apple unit? I asked. Apple XH-224, he replied. Wow. I'd seen the top-of-the-line units before, but I'd never had the opportunity to use one. They're more sophisticated than our standard field units, capable of detecting a live infection at something like ten times the speed. One of those babies can tell you that you're dead before you even realize that you've been bitten. Which didn't make the process of getting tested any more enjoyable, but it definitely made it more interesting to observe. It was almost worth the pain. Almost. Five red lights came on along the top of the box, beginning to blink as needles pricked the skin between my thumb and forefinger, at my wrist, and at the tip of my pinky. Each time, the bite of the needle was followed by a cool blast of antiseptic foam. When all five lights had gone from red to green, the agent pulled the box away and smiled genuinely for the first time. Thank you for your cooperation, Miss Mason. You're free to proceed. Thanks, I said and pushed my sunglasses farther up the bridge of my nose. My headache settled back into its previous grumble. Mind if I wait for the rest of my crew? Buffy was sticking her hand into the box, and they were waiting for Sean's retinal check to complete. He has retinal scarring in his left eye from a stupid incident with some crappy Chinatown fireworks when we were 15, and that makes his scans take longer than they should. Mine may be weird, but they're a standard weird. His confused just about every scanner we've ever met. Not at all, the agent said. Just don't cross the quarantine line or we'll have to start over. Got it. I stepped back and studied the area, careful to keep my feet well away from the red line marking the edge of the defined safe zone. We'd been expecting increased security around the campaign, but this was more than I'd been bargaining for. They picked us up from Buffy's house. The senator's security dispatch wasn't even willing to let us near their cars unless they were collecting us from a secured location, which took our place out of the running. Given that they gave us blood tests before they said hello, I don't quite get the reasoning. Maybe they didn't want to deal with a zombie attack before lunch.
Or maybe they were avoiding our parents, who were practically panting at the idea of a photo opportunity with the senator's men. Once in the cars, we were transported to the Oakland airport, where we had to take another blood test before they loaded us and our portable gear onto a private helicopter. We flew to what was supposedly an undisclosed location, but I was pretty sure was the city of Clayton, near the foothills of Mount Diablo. Most of that area was purchased by the government after the original residents evacuated, and it's been rumored for years that they were using some of the old ranches as short-term housing. It's a nice place, assuming you don't mind the occasional threat of zombie coyotes, wild dogs, and bobcats. Rural areas offer a lot where privacy is concerned, but not so much if what you're looking for is safety. Judging by the stables around the perimeter, our destination started life as a working farm. Now it was clearly a private residence, with electric fences spanning the spaces between buildings and barbed wire strung as far as the eye could see. Factor in the helipad, and it didn't take any great leap of logic to conclude that this place confirmed the rumors about the government setting up hidey holes out in the abandoned boonies. Nice digs, if you can get them. I smiled as I continued looking around. Our first day, and we already had a scoop. Government use of abandoned land in Northern California confirmed. Read all about it. Buffy picked up her bags and walked over to me, looking flustered. I don't think I've ever been poked that many times, she complained. At least now you know you're clean, I said. Camera's rolling. There was a minor EMP band at the entrance that took two and five offline, but I anticipated for that and built in redundancies. One, three, and four, and six through eight are all transmitting live and have been since pickup. I looked at her flatly. I didn't understand a word of that, so I'm just going to assume you said yes and move on with my life, all right? Works for me, she said, waving at Sean as he joined us. You're done. They know Sean can't be a zombie, I said, adjusting my sunglasses. You need a brain to reanimate. He elbowed me amiably and shook his head. Dude, I'm amazed they didn't strip search us. They should have bought us dinner first or something. Will lunch do? asked a jocular voice. All three of us turned, finding ourselves facing a tall, generically handsome man whose carefully cropped brown hair was starting to gray, but had been left just long enough in the front to fall across his forehead and create the illusion of boyishness. His skin was tan, but relatively unlined, and his eyes were very blue. He was casually dressed in tan slacks and a white shirt, with the sleeves rolled up around his elbows. Senator Ryman, I said, and offered him my hand. I'm Georgia Mason. These are my associates, Sean Mason. Hey, interjected Sean, and Georgette Masonier. You can call me Buffy, said Buffy. Of course, the senator said, taking my hand and shaking it. He had a good grip, solid without being overwhelming, and the teeth he revealed when he smiled were straight and white. It's a pleasure to meet all three of you. I've been watching your pre-campaign preparations with interest. He released my hand. We had a lot to accomplish and not much time to accomplish it in, I said. A lot to accomplish verged on understatement. We had seven baby bloggers contact us before we finished eating dinner, all wanting to know if we were planning to schism. Once people knew the size of the story we'd landed, there was no way striking out on our own would have been a surprise so we didn't try to make it one. The folks at Bridge Supporters were sorry to see us go and pleased by our severance offer. We took exclusive rights to all campaign trail stories to our new site, but we allowed them to keep running two of Buffy's ongoing poetry series, gave them first rights on any continuations to Sean's series on exploring the ruins of Wairika, and guaranteed two op-ed pieces from me per month for the next year. They'd get click-through reads from the folks following us on campaign, and we'd get the same in return as existing bridge support readers found their way to our new site through the shared material. My friend Mahir had been looking to move on to new challenges, and he was glad to sign on to help me moderate the newsies. Sean and Buffy had their own hiring to do, and I left it to them. Finding a host for our new site was disturbingly easy. 
One of Buffy's biggest fans runs a small ISP, and he was willing to put us up and online in exchange for a minimal fee and a lifetime membership to our exclusive features once we had some to offer. Less than 20 minutes after calling him, we had a URL, a place to put our files, and our very first subscriber. The baby bloggers who contacted us the first night were quickly joined by two dozen others, and that gave us the liberty to pick and choose, looking for people who fit a profile other than available. We wound up with 12 supporting betas, four in each major category, already producing content for a site that hadn't even officially launched yet. Never in my wildest dreams did I believe it could be that easy to get everything you'd ever wanted. But it was. After the end times went live, six days after we got the notice that we had been chosen to accompany Senator Ryman's campaign, with my name on the masthead as senior editor, Buffy listed as our graphic designer and technical expert, and Sean responsible for hiring and marketing. Whether we sank or swam, there was no going back. Once you make alpha, you can never be a beta again. Blogging is a territorial world, and the other betas would eat you alive if you tried. I hadn't slept more than four hours a night in two weeks. Sleep was a luxury reserved for people who weren't trying to design their futures around a meal ticket that might still prove to be a rotten apple. I just had to hope the dirt we found on the campaign trail would be enough to support us, or our careers would be short sour, and too interesting by far. Still, you seem to have done all right, Senator Ryman said. His Wisconsin accent was stronger than it sounded on the newscasts. Either he didn't realize we were filming, or he figured there was no point in playing fake around the people who were going to be sharing his quarters over the next year. If you'll come with me, Emily has a nice lunch going, and she's been looking forward to meeting you. Is your wife coming with you for the whole campaign? I asked. He started to walk toward a nearby door, and I followed, gesturing for the others to do the same. We knew the answer already. Emily Ryman was going to be staying on the family ranch in Parrish, Wisconsin, during most of the year, taking care of the kids while her husband did the moving and shaking. But I wanted him to say it for our pickup recordings. The best sound clips are the ones you gather for yourself. Em... I couldn't make her come the whole way if I used a tractor pull, the senator said, and opened the door. Wipe your feet, all three of you. There's no point to making you go through another damn blood test. If you're this far past the gate and you're not clean, we're dead already. May as well be friendly about it. Then he was inside, bellowing, Emily, the bloggers are here. John gave me a look, mouthing, I like him. I nodded. We'd just met the man, and he was probably a master of political bullshit, but I was starting to like him, too. There was something about him that said, I know how pointless all of these political circuses are. Let's see how long it takes for them to realize that I'm just playing along, shall we? I had to respect that. He might be playing us for a bunch of saps, but if he was, he'd slip eventually, and we'd take him apart. That would be almost as much fun as getting along with him, and definitely better for our market share. The interior of the house was decorated with a distinctly southwestern flair, all bright, solid colors and geometric patterns. Southwestern art has shifted in the last 20 years. Before the rising, any house with that many potted cacti and Native American-style throw rugs would have boasted a coyote statue or two and possibly a polished steer's skull, complete with horns. I've seen pictures. It was pretty morbid stuff. These days, representations of any animal that weighs more than 40 pounds have a tendency to make people uncomfortable. So coyotes and steers are both out of fashion, unless you're dealing with a serious nihilist or some kid playing creature of the night. Only the painted deserts remain. An enormous picture window took up half of one wall, marking the house as having been put up before the rising. No one builds windows like that anymore. They're an invitation to attack. The kitchen was defined by raised counters rather than walls, spilling tile flooring into the hall and attached dining room in an almost organic fashion. Senator Ryman was standing by the big butcher's block at the center when we entered, arms around the waist of a woman in blue jeans and a flannel lumberjack's shirt. 
Her brown hair was pulled back in a high girlish ponytail. He was murmuring something in her ear, looking a good ten years younger than he had when we met outside. Sean and I exchanged a glance, debating the merits of retreating and allowing them this private time. My journalistic instincts said, stay, and I certainly wasn't turning off the cameras, but my sense of ethics told me that people deserve a chance to unwind before starting on something as huge as a full-on political campaign. Luckily, Buffy saved us from the conundrum by barreling straight ahead, sniffing the air appreciatively and asking, What's for lunch? Wow, I'm starving. <gasps> that smells like shrimp and mahi-mahi. Am I close? Can I do anything to help? Senator Ryman stepped away from his wife, exchanging an amused look with her before turning a grin on Buffy and said, I think things are pretty much in hand. Besides which, Emily is too territorial to share her kitchen with another woman, even if it's a borrowed kitchen. Quiet, you, said Emily, jabbing him in the ribs with a wooden spoon. He winced theatrically and she laughed. The laugh was bright, perfectly in keeping with the practical, elegantly simple kitchen. Now let me see if I can guess which of you is which. I know you have two Georges and a Sean. How is that fair? She put on an exaggerated pout, not looking a bit like a senator's wife. Three boys' names for two girls and a boy? It puts me at a disadvantage. We didn't get to choose our own names, ma'am, I said, fighting a smile. Sean and I don't even know what names we were born with. We were orphaned in the rising, and when the Masons adopted us, we were both listed under Baby Doe. Oh, but one of you did, she said. One of the Georges is also a Buffy, and if I remember my pop culture right, it should be the blonde one. She turned, extending a hand toward Buffy. Georgette Maisonnier, correct? Absolutely, Buffy said, taking her hand. You can call me Buffy. Everyone else does. It's a pleasure to meet you, Emily replied, and released her hand, turning toward Sean and me. That must make you the Masons. Sean and Georgia, yes? Got it, Sean said, saluting her. Somehow he kept the gesture from looking like he was making fun. I've never understood how he does that. I stepped forward, offering her a hand. George is fine by me, or Georgia. Whichever is easier for you, Mrs. Ryman. Call me Emily, she said. Her grip was cool, and the glance she cast toward my sunglasses was understanding. Are the lights too bright for you? They're all soft bulbs, but I can dim the window a bit more if you need me to. No, thank you, I said, eyebrows rising as I studied her face more closely. Her eyes weren't dark, as I had first assumed. What I had taken to be deep brown irises were actually her pupils, so dilated that they pushed the natural muddy hazel of her eyes into a thin ring around the edges. Wouldn't you know if the lights were a problem? She smiled wryly. My eyes aren't as sensitive as they used to be. I was an early case, and there was some nerve damage by the time they figured out what was going on. You'll tell me if the lights get to be too much? I nodded. Sure will. Wonderful. You three make yourselves comfortable. Lunch will be up in a few minutes. We're having fish tacos with mango salsa and virgin mimosas. She raised a finger to the senator, adding playfully, I don't want to hear a word of complaint from you, mister. We're not getting these nice reporters drunk before things even get started. Don't worry, ma'am, Sean said. Some of us can hold our liquor. And some of us can't, I said dryly. Buffy weighs 95 pounds, soaking wet. The one time we took her out drinking, she wound up climbing onto a table and reciting half of Night of the Living Dead before Sean and I could pull her down. Thank you, Mrs. Emily. Her smile was approving. You can be taught. Now, all of you, go sit down while I finish taking care of business. Peter, that means you, too. Yes, dear, said the senator, kissing her on the cheek before moving to take a seat at the dining room table. The three of us followed him in an obedient, slightly ragged line. I'll challenge senators and kings for the right to know the truth, but far be it from me to challenge a woman in her own kitchen. Watching the places everyone took around the table was interesting in a purely sociological sense. 
Sean settled with his back to the wall, affording him the best view of the room. He may seem like an idiot, but in some ways he's the most careful of us all. You can't be an Irwin and not learn some things about keeping your exits open. If the zombies ever mob en masse again, he'll be ready. And filming. Buffy took the seat nearest the light, where the cameras studded through her jewelry would get the best pickup shots. Her portables work on the principles defined during the big pre-rising wireless boom. They transmit data to the server on a constant basis, allowing her to come back later and edit it at her leisure. I once tried to figure out how many transmitters she actually had on her, but wound up giving up and wandering off to do something more productive, like answering Sean's fan mail. He gets more marriage proposals a week than he likes to think about, and he lets me handle them all. The senator took the seat closest to the kitchen and his wife, thus conveniently leaving me the chair with the highest degree of shadow. So he was a family man and someone who understood that consideration was a virtue. Nice. I settled, asking, you provide home-cooked meals for all your new staff? Just the controversial ones, he replied, his tone easy and assured. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I read your public reports, your op-ed pieces, everything before I agreed to your application. I know you're smart and won't forgive bullshit. That doesn't, he held up a finger, mean I'm going to be 100% straight with you because there are some things no reporter ever gets to be privy to. Mostly having to do with my home life and my family, but still, there are no-go zones. We respect that, I said. Sean and Buffy were nodding. Senator Ryman seemed to approve because he nodded in turn, looking satisfied. Nobody wanted me to bring blog folks on this campaign, he said without preamble. I sat up a little straighter. The entire online community knew that the senator's handlers had been recommending against including bloggers in the official campaign press corps, but I'd never expected to hear it put so baldly. They have this idea that you three will report whatever you damn well want to and not what's good for the campaign. So you're saying they're pretty smart then? Sean asked in a bland surfer boy drawl that might almost have been believable if he hadn't been smirking as he said it. The senator roared with laughter and Emily looked up from the stove, clearly amused. That's what I pay them for, so I certainly hope so, Sean. Yeah, they're pretty smart. They've got you pegged for exactly what you are. And what's that, Senator? I asked. Sobering, he leaned forward. The children of the rising. Biggest revolution that our generations, yours, mine, and at least two more besides are ever going to see. The world changed overnight, and sometimes I'm sorry I was born too early to be in on the ground level of what it's turned into. You kids? You're the ones who get to shape the real tomorrow, the one that's going to matter. Not me, not my lovely wife, and certainly not a bunch of talking heads who get paid to be smart enough to realize that a bunch of Bay Area blogger kids are going to tell the truth as they see it and damn the political consequences. Eyebrows rising again, I said, that does very little to explain why you felt it was important that we be here. You're here because of what you represent the truth. The senator smiled, boyish once more. People are going to believe whatever you say. Your careers depend on how many dead folks your brother can broad with a stick, how many poems your friend can write, and how much truth you can tell. So what if the things we say don't paint you in a good enough light? Buffy frowned, tilting her head. It would have looked like a natural gesture if I hadn't known the silver moon and star earring dangling from her left ear was a camera that responded to head gestures. She was zooming in on the senator to catch his answer. If they don't paint me in a good enough light, I suppose I wasn't meant to be the president of the United States of America, he said. You want to dig for scandals? I'm sure my opponents have roadmaps for you to follow. You want to report on this campaign? You report what you see, and don't worry about whether or not I'm going to like it. Because that doesn't matter a bit. We were still staring at him, trying to frame responses to something that seemed about as realistic coming from a politician's mouth as sonnets coming out of a zombie's, 
when Emily Ryman walked over and started setting plates onto the table. I was grateful for the interruption. After the way the day had been going, I was running out of surprised and moving rapidly into the region of mild shock, and this was enough to give me a chance to regroup. Emily sat once she'd finished putting the plates down, reaching for Senator Ryman's hand. Peter, will you say grace? Oh, of course, he said. Sean and I exchanged glances before joining hands with each other and the Rymans, closing the circle around the table. Senator Ryman bowed his head, closing his eyes. Dear Lord, we ask that you bless this table and those who have come to gather round it. Thank you for the good gifts that you have given us, for the health of ourselves and our families, for the company and the food we are about to enjoy, and for the future that you have seen fit to set before us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your generosity and for the trials by which we may come to know you better. Sean and I left our eyes open, watching the senator as he spoke. We're atheists. It's hard to be anything else in a world where zombies can attack your elementary school talent show. Much of the country has turned back toward faith, however, acting under the vague supposition that it can't hurt anything to have God on your side. I glanced at Buffy, who was nodding along with the senator's words, eyes tightly closed. She's a lot more religious than most people would guess. Her family is French Catholic. She's been saying grace at any sort of large gathering since she was born, and she still attends a non-virtual church on Sundays. Amen, said the senator. We all echoed it with varying degrees of certainty. Emily Ryman smiled. Everybody eat up? There's more if you're still hungry, but I want to eat too, so you're going to have to serve yourselves after this round. The senator got a kiss on the cheek to go with his fish tacos. The rest of us just got fed. Not that Sean was going to let lunch pass without a little light conversation. Of the two of us, he's the gregarious one. Someone had to be. Will you be coming along on the whole campaign, ma'am, or just this leg of it? he asked with uncharacteristic politeness. Then again, he's always had a healthy respect for women with food. You couldn't pay me enough to accompany this dog and pony show, Emily said dryly. I think you kids are totally insane. Entertaining is all heck, and I love your sight, but insane. I'll take that as a no, I said. Uh-uh. For one thing, I am not taking the kids out on the road. No way. The tutors they hire for these things are never the sort I approve of. She smiled at the senator, who patted her knee in an unconsciously companionable fashion. And they wind up seeing way too many reporters and politicians, not the sort you want keeping company with a bunch of impressionable young kids. Look how it's warped us, said Sean. Exactly, she said, unflustered. Besides which, the ranch doesn't run itself. I nodded. Your family still manages an actual horse ranch, don't they? You know the answer to that, Georgia, said the senator. Been in Emily's family since the late 1800s. If you think the risk of zombie palominos is enough to make me give up my horses, you've never met a real horse nut, she said, grinning. Now don't get your back up. I know where you stand on the animal mass restrictions. You're a big supporter of Mason's Law, aren't you? In all recreational and non-essential capacities, yes, I said. Thanks to the Mason's biological son, Sean and I have often found ourselves with an element of unasked-for name recognition when dealing with people who work with animals. Before Philip, no one realized that all mammals with a body mass of 40 pounds or more could become carriers of the live state virus or that Kellis Amberley was happy to cross species, going from man to beast and back again. Mom put a bullet through her only son's head, back when that was still something new enough to break you forever, when it felt like murder, not mercy. So, yeah, I guess you could say I support Mason's Law. I would too, in your position, Emily said. Her tone carried none of the accusations I'm used to hearing from animal rights activists. She was speaking the truth, and I could deal, or not, as I so chose. Now, if everyone wants to tuck in, it's the start of a long day and a longer month. Eat up, everybody, 
before your lunch gets cold, added the senator, and reached for the mimosas. Sean and I exchanged a look, shrugged in near unison, and reached for our forks. One way or another, we were on our way. My sister has retinal KA syndrome. That's where the filovirus does this massive replication thing in the ocular fluid. There's some more advanced technical term for it, but personally, I like to call it eye goo because it pisses George off. And the pupils dilate as wide as they can and never close down like they do in a normal person. Mostly only girls get it, which is a relief since I look stupid in sunglasses. Her eyes are supposed to be brown, but everyone thinks they're black because of her pupils being broken. She was diagnosed when we were five, so I don't really remember her without her sunglasses. And when we were nine, we got this really dumb babysitter who took George's glasses, said, You don't need these, and threw them into the backyard, thinking we were spoiled little suburban brats too afraid of the outdoors to go out after them. So. It's pretty plain that she was about as bright as a box of zombies. Next thing you know, there's me and George digging through the high grass looking for her sunglasses when suddenly she freezes, eyes getting all wide, and says, Sean? And I'm like, what? And she's all, there's somebody else in the yard. And then I turn around and wham, zombie, right there. I hadn't seen it because I don't see as well in low light as she does, so there are some advantages to having your pupils permanently dilated. Besides the part where they can't tell if you're stoned or not without a blood test when you're at school. But anyway, zombie in our backyard. So fucking cool. You know, it's been more than a decade since that evening. And that is still probably the best present that she's ever gotten for me. From Hail to the King, the blog of Sean Mason, April 7th, 2037. Chapter 6 Getting our equipment past the security screening offered by Senator Ryman's staff took six and a half hours. Sean spent the first two hours getting underfoot as he tried to guard his gear and finally got all of us banished inside. Now he was sulking on the parlor couch, chin almost level with his chest. What are they doing, taking the van apart to make sure we didn't stuff any zombies inside the paneling? He grumbled. Because, gee, that would work really well as an assassination tool. It's been tried, Buffy said. Do you remember the guy who tried to kill George Romero with the zombie pit balls? That's an urban myth, Buffy. It's been disproven about 90 times, I said, continuing to pace. George Romero died peacefully in his bed. And now he's a happy shambler at a government research facility, said Sean, abandoning his sulk in order to make zombie motions with his arms. The ASL for zombie has joined the raised middle finger as one of the few truly universal hand gestures. Some points just need to be made quickly. It's sort of sad thinking about him shuffling around out there, all decayed and mindless and not remembering the classics of his heyday, said Buffy. I eyed her. He's a government zombie. He eats better than we do. It's the principle of the thing, she said. It took a while for the first Kellis Amberley outbreaks to be confirmed as anything but hoaxes, and even after that was accomplished, it took time for the various governmental agencies to finish fighting over whose problem it was. The CDC got sick of the arguing about three days in, jumped into things with both feet, and never looked back. They had squads in the field by the end of week two, capturing zombies for study. It was quickly apparent that there's no curing a zombie. You can't undo the amount of brain damage the virus does with anything gentler than a bullet to the brain pan. But you can work on ways to neutralize Kellis Amberley itself. And since all a zombie really does is convert flesh into virus, a few captive shamblers provided the best possible test subjects. After 20 years of testing and the derailment of almost every technical field that didn't feed directly into the medical profession, we've managed little more than absolutely nothing. At this point, they can completely remove Kellis Amberley from a living body 
using a combination of chemotherapy, blood replacement, and a nasty strain of Ebola that's been modified to search and destroy its cousin. There are just a few downsides, like the part where it costs upward of $10,000 for a treatment, none of the test subjects has survived, and, oh, right, the constant fear the modified virus will mutate like Marburg Amberly did and leave us with something even worse to deal with. Where the living dead are concerned, we pretty much exist on square one. It didn't take long for researchers to connect the health of their pet zombies to the amount of protein, specifically living or recently killed flesh, soybeans and legumes won't cut it, they consumed. Callus Amberley converts tissue into viral blocks. The more tissue it can find, the less of the original zombie it converts. So if you feed a zombie constantly, it won't wither to the point of becoming useless. Most of the nation's remaining cattle ranches are there to feed the living dead. A beautiful irony when you consider that cows break the 40-pound threshold and thus reanimate upon death. Zombies eating zombies. Good work if you can get it. A lot of folks leave their bodies to science. Your family skips funeral expenses. The government pays a nice settlement so they won't sue if your image winds up on television one of these days. And if you belong to one of those religious sects that believes the body has to remain intact in order to eventually get carried up to heaven, you don't run the risk of offending God. You just risk eating the research scientist if containment fails. And some people don't see that as being as much of an abomination as cremation. George Romero didn't mean to save the world any more than Dr. Alexander Kellis meant to almost destroy it, but you can't always choose your lot in life. Most people wouldn't have had the first idea of how to deal with the zombies if it weren't for the lessons they learned from Romero's movies. Go for the brain. Fireworks, but only if you don't let the burning zombie touch you. Once you're bitten, you're dead. Fans of Romero's films applied the lessons of a thousand zombie movies to the reality of what had happened. They traded details of the attacks and their results over a thousand blogs from a thousand places, and humanity survived. In interviews, Mr. Romero always seemed baffled and a little delighted by the power his movies had proven to have. Always knew there was a reason people didn't like seeing the zombies win, he'd said. If anyone was surprised when he left his body to the government, they didn't say anything. It seemed like a fitting end for a man who went from king of bad horror to national hero practically overnight. They better not damage any of my equipment, Sean said, snapping me back to the present. He was scowling at the window again. Some of that stuff took serious barter to get. They're not going to damage your equipment, dumbass. They're the government. We're journalists, and they know we'd tell everyone in the whole damn world, starting with our insurance agency. I leaned over to hit him in the back of the head. They just need to make sure we're not carrying any bombs. Or zombies, added Buffy. Or drugs, said Sean. Actually, said the senator, stepping into the room, we're slightly disappointed by the lack of bombs, zombies, or drugs hidden in your gear. I thought you folks were supposed to be reporters, but there wasn't even any illicit booze. We're clear? I asked, ceasing my pacing. Sean and Buffy were already on their feet, nearly vibrating. I understood their anxiety. The senator's security crew had their hands on all our servers, which had Buffy unhappy, and on Sean's zombie hunting and handling equipment, which usually makes him so restless that I wind up locking him in the bathroom just to get some peace and quiet. It's times like this that I'm truly glad of my role as the hard-nosed reporter in our little crew. Maybe Buffy and Sean call me a Luddite, but when the government goons take away all our equipment for examination, they lose everything. I, on the other hand, retain my MP3 recorder, cellular phone, notebook computer, and stylus. They're all too basic to require much examination. Of course... I can't keep my hands on the vehicles, which had me almost as restless as my companions. The van and my bike represent the most expensive articles we travel with, and most of our livelihood depends on their upkeep. At the same time, they're probably the easiest items to repair. A good mechanic can undo almost any damage, and my bike isn't that customized. 
As long as the feds didn't bust up the van, we'd be fine. You're clear, the senator said. He didn't bat an eye as Sean and Buffy ran out of the room, despite the fact that neither of them said goodbye. I remained where I was, and after a moment, he turned toward me. I must admit, we were impressed by the structural reinforcements on your van. Planning to last out a siege in that thing? We've considered it. The security upgrades were our mother's design. We did the electrical work ourselves. Senator Ryman nodded as if this explained everything. In a way, it did. Stacy Mason has been the first name in zombie-proof structural engineering for a long time. I have to admit, I don't really understand most of your professional equipment, but the security systems. Your mother did a truly lovely job. I'll give her your compliments. I gestured toward the door. I should join the feeding frenzy. Buffy's going to want to start assembling today's footage, and she always goes overboard without me standing over her. I see. The senator paused for a moment. His voice was uncharacteristically stiff as he continued. I wondered if I might ask you a small favor, Miss Mason. Ah, the first demand for censorship. I was going to owe Sean ten bucks. I'd been betting that Senator Ryman could make it at least until we hit the actual campaign trail before he started trying to control the media. Keeping my voice level, I said, And that would be, Senator? Emily. He shook his head, the smile tugging at his lips. I know you'll release whatever you want to, and I look forward to having the chance to read and watch it all. I don't figure we caught half the cameras and recorders you three had on you. Some of the ones Miss Maisonnier was carrying were barely in the range of our sensors, which leads me to believe that she had others we couldn't see at all. And if she ever wishes to pursue a career in espionage, I only pray she offers her services to us first. So you've doubtless got some great footage. And that's fabulous. But Emily, you see, well, she's not so comfortable with a lot of media attention. I looked at him thoughtfully. So you want me to minimize the use of your wife? That was odd. Emily Ryman was friendly, photogenic, and, except for the horses, just about the sanest politician's wife I'd ever met. I expected him to milk her as the asset she was. She's going to have to feature in this campaign, and if he win, she understands her role in things, and she doesn't mind being written about, but she'd rather her picture wasn't used excessively, he said. He was clearly uncomfortable with the request. That made me a lot more likely to grant it. Please, if it's at all possible, I would see it as a great personal favor. Lowering my sunglasses enough to let him see my eyes, I asked, Why? Because she raises horses. I know you don't approve of keeping mammals that meet the size for Kellis Amberley amplification, but you're polite about it. You write articles and you lobby for stricter controls and that's fine that's your right as an american citizen given your family connections it's even unavoidable some people however get a little more aggressive you're talking about the bombing in san diego aren't you it was the darling of the news feeds for a while because it was such a huge event the world's largest remaining zoo and wild animal conservatory bombed by activists who believed Mason's Law should be used to shut down every facility in the world that kept animals capable of undergoing viral amplification. The same fringe group, in other words, that supports lifting the bans on big game hunting across the world and wiping out North America's large indigenous mammals. They call themselves pro-life, but what they really are is pro-genocide. Their proverbial panties get wet just thinking about the opportunity to go out and slaughter something under the illusion of following the law. Hundreds died in San Diego because of what they did. And I'm not just talking about the animals. We got a lot of firsts out of that stunt. First confirmed Kellis Amberley transmission through giraffe bite wasn't the weirdest. Senator Ryman nodded, lips pressed into a thin line. I have three daughters. All of them are at the ranch with their grandparents, waiting for their mother to rejoin them. Trying to avoid making them a target? That's unavoidable, unfortunately. It's the nature of modern politics. But I can keep them out of the spotlight for as long as I can. 
I kept my sunglasses pulled down, studying him. Unlike most people, he met my eyes without flinching. Having a wife with retinal KA probably helped with that. Finally, I slid my glasses back into place and nodded. I'll see what I can do. He offered a quick, boyish smile, his relief showing clearly. Thank you, Miss Mason. Don't let me keep you any longer. I'm sure you're anxious to check the state of your vehicles. If your goons scratch my bike, I'll have to get bitchy, I cautioned, and left the room, following the path Sean and Buffy had taken to the yard. Leaving Emily out of things would be relatively easy. The way the kitchen was lit meant we could limit footage of her without changing the overall tone of the afternoon and without being too blatant. Looking like you're hiding something is the fastest way to bring the vultures down. I'd have to leave it up to Buffy, of course. She's our graphics whiz. The interesting part was that he was willing to ask for it at all. Senator Ryman knew he'd only get to ask us to leave things out so many times before we started resisting, and once that happened, he wasn't going to be a happy man. So why introduce us to Emily at all? if the introduction meant he'd have to use one of his limited get-out-of-jail-free cards to keep her out of a puff piece about meeting the candidate over some good old-fashioned fish tacos? It was possible he was just trying to play on our sympathies. Golly, my wife doesn't like to be seen on camera, and it could endanger the kids, so you'll be good to us, right? But that didn't seem likely. It seemed a lot more realistic to me that she'd wanted the chance to meet us, and he was willing to go along with it as long as it kept her happy with him. I've learned to trust my hunches, and they were telling me now that the senator and his wife were generally good folks, with the bad taste to choose politics and horse breeding as their respective careers. Our vehicles were parked out front. The van had been scrubbed until it gleamed, and even the relay towers were clean. All the chrome on my bike had been buffed until it was almost too bright to contemplate, even through my sunglasses. I don't think that thing's been this clean since before I bought it. I said, shoving my glasses back up my nose. The sunset was on the way, and as far as I was concerned, it was taking a little too much of its own sweet time about things. Sean stuck his head out of the van's rear door and waved, calling, Hey, George, they got the fruit punch stain out of the upholstery. Really? I couldn't help being impressed. That stain had been in the van since three days after the parents gave it to us, and that was on our 18th adoption day. Class A license means Class A equipment, Dad said. And that, well, that and roughly 300 hours of backbreaking work, was that. And they moved all Buffy's wires around, he said, with a certain degree of sadistic glee before retreating back into the van. I smothered a smile as I started toward the van, pausing to run one hand down the sleekly polished side of my bike. If the security crew had scratched the paint, They'd also buffed the scratch clean without leaving a trace. It was impressive work. Things were less peaceful inside the van. Sean was sprawled in a chair cleaning his crossbow, while Buffy was flat on her back under one of the desks, heels drumming against the floor as she yanked wires out of their current incorrect locations and jammed them into new holes. Every time she yanked a wire, one or more of the van's monitors would start to roll or be consumed by static turning the scene into something abstract and surrealistic, like a bad B-grade horror movie. She was also swearing like a merchant marine, displaying a grasp of profanity that was more than a little bit impressive. Do you kiss your mother with that mouth? I asked, stepping over the spools of discarded cabling and taking a seat on the counter. Look at this. She shoved herself out from under the desk and into a kneeling position, brandishing a fistful of cables in my direction. I raised my eyebrows, waiting. All of these were connected wrong. All of them. Are they labeled? Buffy hesitated before admitting. No. Do they follow any sort of normal, sane, or predictable system? I knew the answer to that one. Sean and I did most of the electrical work, but the actual wiring is all Buffy's, and she thought most people were too conservative with the way they manage their inputs. I've tried to understand her system a few times. I've always come away with a migraine and the firm conviction that sometimes ignorance really is bliss. They didn't have to unplug everything, 
Buffy muttered and crawled back under the desk. Sean pulled back the string on his crossbow with one finger, checking the tension, and said, You can't win. Logic is no power over her when her territory's been invaded by the heathens. Got it, I said. The monitor next to me rolled to static before it began displaying a video feed of the yard outside. Buffy, how long before we're fully operational again? Fifteen minutes, maybe twenty. I haven't checked the wires on the backup consoles yet, so I don't know how big of a mess they made there. The irritation in her voice was unmasked. No data loss so far, but none of the van's exterior cameras got anything but static for over an hour thanks to their stupid monkeying. I'm sure we can live without an hour's recordings of the security team, I said. Sean, get the lights? On it. He put his crossbow aside and rose moving to drop the shade over the van's window and pull the rear door closed. Buffy made a small grunt of protest, and he flicked the switch to turn on the interior lights. The area was promptly bathed in a soft, specially formulated light designed to be gentle on sensitive eyes. The bulbs cost 50 bucks each, and they're worth it. They're even better than the black lights I use in my room and home. They don't just prevent headaches— Sometimes they cure them. I removed my glasses with a sigh, massaging my right temple with my fingertips. All right, folks, we have our first official on-the-record encounter. Impressions? Like the wife, said Sean. She's photogenic and a definite asset. I still need a handle on the senator. He's either the biggest Boy Scout ever to make it past the local level, or he's playing us. The fish tacos were good, said Buffy. I like Senator Ryman, actually. He's nice even when he doesn't have to be. This could be a pretty fun gig. Who cares about fun as long as it brings in the green, asked Sean with a philosophical shrug. We're made when this is over. Everything else is gravy. I agree with both of you, to a degree, I said, still massaging my temple. I could already tell I was going to need painkillers before we wrapped for the night. Senator Ryman can't be as nice as he wants us to think he is, but he's also nicer than he has to be. It's not entirely a put-on. There's a degree of sincerity there that you can't fake. I'll do a pull-and-drop profile on him tonight, something like first impressions of the man who would be president. Puff piece, but still. Buff, how long is it going to take you to splice our footage? Once everything is ready to run again, I'll need an hour. Two tops. Try for an hour. We want to hit the East Coast while they're still awake. Sean, care to do a review of the security precautions? Hit up a few of the guards, find out what sort of ordinance they're carrying with them? His face split in a wide grin. Already on it. You know the big blonde guy, built like a linebacker? I did notice the presence of a giant on the security team, yes. His name's Steve. He carries a baseball bat. Sean made an exaggerated swinging motion. Can you imagine him hitting one out of the park? Ah, I said dryly. The classics. Grab a few cameras, harass the locals until you get what you want. Which brings us to my last order of business. We have a request from the senator. Buffy slid out from under the desk again, another bundle of wires in her hands, and gave me a curious look. Sean scowled. Don't tell me we're being censored already. Yes and no, I said. He wants us to keep Emily out of things as much as we can for right now. Minimize her inclusion in the lunch footage, that sort of thing. Why? asked Buffy. San Diego, I said, and waited. I didn't have to wait long. Sean doesn't feel as strongly as I do about the universal application of Mason's Law, but he still follows the debate. Expression changing from one of incomprehension to complete understanding, he said, he's afraid somebody's going to target her at the ranch if we make too big a deal of things. Exactly. I switched my massaging to my other temple. Their kids are out there with their grandparents, and he sort of wants the family alive. A little risk is unavoidable, but he'd like to keep them low profile as long as he can. I can manage the footage edits, said Buffy. She wouldn't feature in my piece at all said Sean. And I'll sidebar her. So we're in agreement? Guess so, said Sean. Great. 
Buffy, let me know when we're back to live feed capacity on all bands. I'm going to step outside for a few minutes. I slid my sunglasses back on and stood, just getting a little air. I'll get to work, said Sean, and stood as I did, exiting the van a few steps ahead of me. He didn't stop or look back as I came out. He just kept going. Sean knows me better than anyone else in the world. Sometimes I think he knows me better than I do. He knows I need a few minutes by myself before I can start working. Location doesn't matter. Just solitude. The afternoon light had dimmed without dying, and my bike wasn't quite as painful to look at. I walked over and leaned against it, resting my heels on the driveway as I closed my eyes and tilted my face up into the dying light. Welcome to the world, kids. Things were moving now, and all we could do was make sure that the truth kept getting out and getting where it needed to be. When I was 16 and told my father that I wanted to be a newsie, it wasn't a surprise by that point, but it was the first time I had said it to his face. He pulled some strings and got me enrolled in a history of journalism course at the university. Edward R. Murrow, Walter Cronkite, Hunter S. Thompson, Cameron Crowe. I met the greats the way you should meet them, through their words and the things they did, when I was still young enough to fall in love without reservations or conditions. I never wanted to be Lois Lane, girl reporter, even though I dressed like her for Halloween one year. I wanted to be Edward R. Murrow, facing down corruption in the government. I wanted to be Hunter S. Thompson, ripping the skin off the world. I wanted the truth, and I wanted the news, and I'd be damned before I settled for anything less. Sean's the same, even if his priorities are different. He's willing to let a good story come before the facts, as long as the essential morals stay true. That's why he's so good at what he does, and why I double-check every report he writes before I release it. One thing I did learn from those classes is that the world is not, in any way, what people expected 30 years ago. The zombies are here, and they're not going away, but they're not the story. They were, for one hot, horrible summer at the beginning of the century, but now they're just another piece of the way things work. They did their part. They changed everything. Absolutely everything. The world cheered when Dr. Alexander Kellis announced his cure for the common cold. I've never had a cold thanks to Dr. Kellis, but I understand they were pretty annoying. People didn't enjoy spending half their time sniffling, sneezing, and getting coughed on by total strangers. Dr. Kellis and his team rushed through testing at a pace that seems criminal in retrospect, but who am I to judge? I wasn't there. What's really funny is that you can blame this whole thing on the news. One reporter heard a rumor that Dr. Kellis was intending to sell his cure to the highest bidder, and would never allow it to be released to the man on the street. This was ridiculous if you understood that the cure was a modified rhinovirus, based on the exact virulence that enabled the common cold to spread so far and so fast. Once it got outside the lab, it was going to infect the world, and no amount of money would prevent that. Those are the facts, but this guy didn't care about the facts. He cared about the scoop and being the first to report a great and imaginary injustice being perpetrated by the heartless medical community. If you ask me, the real injustice is that Dr. Alexander Kellis is viewed as responsible for the near destruction of mankind, and not Robert Stalnaker, investigative reporter for the New York Times. If you're going to lay blame for what happened, that's where it belongs. I've read his articles. They were pretty stirring stuff condemning Dr. Kellis and the medical community for allowing this to happen. Mankind, he said, had a right to the cure. Some people believed him a bit too much. They broke into the lab, stole the cure, and released it from a crop duster, if you can believe that. They flew that bastard as high as it would go, loaded balloons with samples of Dr. Kellis's work, and fired them into the atmosphere. It was a beautiful act of bioterrorism, conducted with all the best ideals at heart. They acted on a flawed assumption taken from an incomplete truth, 
and they screwed us all. To be fair, they might not have screwed things up as badly as they did if it hadn't been for a team working out of Denver, Colorado, where they were running trials on a genetically engineered phylovirus called Marburg EX-19, or more commonly, Marburg Amberley. It was named for their first successful infection, Amanda Amberley, age 12 and a half. She'd been dying of leukemia and considered unlikely to see her 13th birthday. The year Dr. Kellis discovered his cure, Amanda was 18, finishing her senior year of high school and perfectly healthy. The folks in Denver took a killer, made a few changes to its instructions, and cured cancer. Marburg Amberley was a miracle, just like the Kellis cure, and together they were primed to change the course of the human race. Together, that's what they did. No one gets cancer or colds anymore. The only issue is the walking dead. There were 97 people in the world infected with Marburg Amberley when the Kellis cure was released. The virus never left the system once it had been introduced. It would kill off cancerous cells and go dormant, waiting. All those people were quiet, non-infectious hot zones, living their lives without a clue of what was about to happen. Amanda Amberley wasn't among them. She died two months earlier in a car crash following her senior prom. She was the only one of the Marburg Amberley test cases not to reanimate. She provided the first clue that it was the interaction of the viruses and not Marburg Amberley itself that caused the apparently dead to rise. The Kellis cure swept the globe in days. Those responsible for the release were hailed, if not as heroes, then at least as responsible citizens, cutting through red tape to better the lives of their fellow men. No one knows when the first Marburg Amberley test subjects came into contact with the cure, or how long it took from exposure to mutation. How long for the formerly peaceful phylovirus to seize on the newly introduced rhinovirus and begin to change? Best estimates say that within a week of the introduction of the Kellis cure to Marburg Amberley, the two had combined, creating the airborne phylovirus we know as Kellis Amberley. It went on to infect the world, hopping from person to person on the back of the virulence coded into the original Kellis cure. There is no index case for viral amplification. It happened in too many places at the same time. We can only pinpoint things to this degree because of what the movies got wrong. Infection wasn't initially universal. People who died before getting dosed with Kellis Amberley stayed dead. Those who died after infection didn't. Why it brings its hosts back to literal biological life is anyone's guess. The best theories hold that it's an enhanced version of normal phylovirus behavior, the urge to replicate taken to a new and unnatural level, one that taps into the nervous system of the host and keeps it moving until it falls apart. Zombies are just sacks of virus looking for something to infect, being driven by Kellis Amberley. Maybe it's true. Who knows? Whether it is or not, the zombies are here and everything has changed. That includes the shape of the political world, because a lot of the old issues shifted once the living dead were among us. The death penalty, animal cruelty, abortion, the list goes on. It's hard to be a politician in this world, especially given the xenophobia and paranoia running rampant through most of our more well-off communities. Senator Ryman was going to have a long, hard fight to the White House, assuming he could get there at all, and we'd be with him every step of the way. I sat with my face toward the sun, ignoring the way my head was throbbing, and waited for Buffy to tell me that the time had come to begin. Book Two Dancing with the Dead You tell the truth as you see it, and you let the people decide whether to believe you. That's responsible reporting. That's playing fair. Didn't your parents teach you anything? Georgia Mason. Darwin was right. Death doesn't play fair. Stacy Mason. To explain my feelings for Senator Peter Ryman, 
I must first note that I am a naturally suspicious soul. That which seems too good to be true, in my experience, generally is. It is thus with the natural cynicism that is my hallmark that I make the following statement. Peter Ryman, Wisconsin's political golden boy, is too good to be true. As a lifelong member of the Republican Party in an era when half the party has embraced the idea that the living dead are a punishment from God and we poor sinners must do penance before we can enter the kingdom of heaven, it would be easy for him to be a bitter man, and yet he shows no signs of it. He is friendly, cordial, intelligent, and sincere enough to convince this reporter even at three in the morning when the convoy is broken down in the middle of Kentucky for the third time and the language has turned saltier than the Pacific Tide. Rather than preaching damnation, he counsels tolerance. Rather than calling for a war on the undead, he recommends improving our defenses and the quality of life in the still-inhabited zones. He is, in short, a politician who understands that the dead are the dead. The living are the living, and we need to treat both with equal care. Ladies and gentlemen, unless this man has some truly awe-inspiring skeletons in his closet, it is my present and considered belief that he would make an excellent president of the United States of America and might actually begin to repair the social, economic, and political damage that has been done by the events of these past 30 years. Of course, that can only mean that he won't win. But a girl can dream. From Images May Disturb You, the blog of Georgia Mason, February 5th, 2040. Chapter 7 The Civic Center had been prepared for Senator Ryman's visit with row upon row of folding chairs and video screens angled to broadcast his image all the way to the rear of the cavernous room. Speakers were mounted every fifth row to make sure his words remained crystal clear as they fell upon the ears of the twenty or so brave souls who had actually dared to come hear him speak. The attendees were clustered in the front four rows, leaving the back of the room for the senator's entourage, security folks, and, of course, the three of us. Put together, we outnumbered the voting public almost two to one. Not that this was a unique occurrence. We'd seen this scene play out in nearly two dozen states and more than three times as many locations in the six weeks since we had left California. People don't come out to press the flesh the way they used to, not even for the primaries that determine which candidates will be making it all the way to the presidential elections. They're too worried about contagion and too afraid that the weird guy who keeps muttering to himself isn't actually insane. There's always a chance that he's going through massive viral amplification and will take a chunk out of someone at any moment. The only safe people are the ones you know so well that they can't surprise you with the personality changes the virus causes during replication. Since few people have enough close personal friends to fill an auditorium, most folks don't come out. That doesn't mean that things have been going unobserved. Judging by the ratings, page hits, and downloads, the campaign has been maintaining some of the highest viewer numbers since Cruz versus Gore in 2018. People want to know how it's going to turn out. There's a lot riding on this election, including, incidentally, our careers. Sean's always said that I take things too seriously. Since the start of the campaign, He'd started saying my sense of humor had been surgically removed to make room for more anal retentiveness. Anyone else who said that would probably have gotten slapped, but from Sean, I had to admit to an element of truth. Still, if I left things up to him, we'd be living with our parents and pretending we didn't mind the lack of privacy until we died. Someone has to watch the bottom line, and someone has pretty much always been me. Glancing to Buffy, I stage whispered, how do our numbers look? She didn't look up from the text scrolling rapidly across her phone. The data feed was moving so fast, I didn't have a prayer of following it. But it obviously meant something to Buffy because she nodded with a small smile on her lips as she said, we're looking at a 60% local audience on the video feed and we just hit top 6% on the web. 
The only candidate getting a higher feed ratio is Congresswoman Wagman, and she's lagging in the actual polls. And we know why she's getting the feeds now, don't we, children? drawled Sean, continuing to test the links in his favorite chainmail shirt with a pair of lightweight pliers. I snorted. Word on the blog circuit is that Kirsten Knockers Wagman had serious breast augmentation surgery before she went into politics, acting under the assumption that in today's largely internet-based demographic, looking good is more important than sounding like you have two brain cells to knock together. That worked for a while. It caught her a seat in Congress, partially because people enjoy looking at her, but it isn't going to get her very far in a presidential race, especially not now that she's up against folks who understand the issues. Senator Ryman didn't appear to have noticed the emptiness of the hall or the nervous expressions on his few actual physical attendees. Most were probably local politicians coming out to show that they believed in the safety of their community, since several of them looked like they'd explode if you snuck up behind them and said, boo in a commanding tone of voice. Most, not all. There was one little old lady, at least 70 years old, sitting dead center in the front row. She held her purse primly in her lap, lips set into a thin, hard line as she watched Senator Ryman go through his paces. She didn't look nervous at all. If any zombies tried to invade this political event, She'd probably wind up giving them what for and driving them back outside to wait their turn. The senator was winding down. You can only give your political platform in so many ways, no matter how much practice you have at saying the same thing from 16 different angles. I adjusted my sunglasses, settling in my chair as I waited for the real fun to begin, the question and answer period. Most of the questions people come up with have something to do with the infected, as in, what are you going to do about the zombies that the other guys haven't tried already? The answers can get seriously entertaining, and honestly, so can the questions. Most questions are emailed in by the home audiences and asked by the polite, slightly bland voice of the senator's digital personal assistant, which has been programmed to sound like a well-educated female of indeterminate age and race. Senator Ryman calls it Beth, for no reason anyone has been able to get him to explain. I intend to keep trying. The best questions are the ones that come from the live audiences. Most of them are scared out of their minds after being out of the house for more than half an hour, and nothing loosens the tongue like fear. If I had my way, all questions would be asked by people who had just taken a trip through a really well-designed haunted house. And now, I'd like to take a few questions from our audience, both those watching this event through the electronic methods provided by my clever technicians, Senator Ryman chuckled, managing to telegraph his utter lack of understanding of such petty details as how the video feeds work, and the good people of Eakley, Oklahoma, who have been good enough to host us this evening. Come on, lady, don't let me down, I murmured. Sure enough. The lady in the front row had her hand in the air almost before the senator finished speaking, arm jutting upward at a fierce, near-military angle. I settled back in my chair, grinning. Jackpot. Huh? Buffy looked up from her watch. Live one, I said, indicating the lady. Oh. Suddenly interested in something other than the data feed, Buffy sat forward. She knows potential ratings when she sees them. Yes, the lady in the front row. Senator Ryman indicated the woman, whose tight-lipped face promptly filled half the monitors in the room. Buffy tapped two buttons on her phone, directing her cameras to zoom in. The senator's tech team is good, and even Buffy admits it. They understand camera angles, splicing footage, and when to go for a tight shot. Thanks to Chuck Wong, who does all their planning and design, they're probably near the top of their field. But Buffy is better. The lady in question lowered her hand, fixing the senator with a stern gaze. What is your stance on the rapture? Her voice was as clipped and thin as I'd expected. The sound system picked it up clear as a bell, 
reproducing every harsh edge and disapproving inflection flawlessly. Senator Ryman blinked, looking nonplussed. It was the first time I'd seen a question take him completely by surprise. He recovered with admirable speed, though saying, I beg your pardon? The rapture. The event in which the faithful will be elevated to the heavens, while the unfaithful sinners and infidels will be left to suffer hell on earth. Her eyes narrowed. What is your stance on this holy, foreordained event? Ah. Senator Ryman continued to look at her, thoughtfulness clearing away his confusion. I heard a faint clink and glance to my left. Sean had put down his chain mail and was watching the stage with open interest. Buffy was staring at her phone, furiously tapping buttons as she angled her cameras. You can't edit or pause a live feed, but you can set up the data to give you the best material to work from later. And this was the sort of material you just can't stage. Would he bow to the religious nuts who have been taking over more and more of the party in recent years? Or would he risk alienating the entire religious sector of the voting public? Only the senator knew. And in a moment, so would we. Senator Ryman didn't break eye contact with the woman as he stepped out from behind his podium, walked to the edge of the stage, and sat, resting his elbows on his knees. He looked like a schoolboy approaching confession not a man jockeying for the leadership of the most powerful country on the planet. It was a well-considered position, and I applauded it inwardly, even as I began to consider an article on the showmanship of modern politics. What's your name, ma'am? Suzanne Greeley, she said, pursing her lips. You haven't answered my question, young man. Well, Mrs. Greeley, that would be because I was thinking, he said and looked out at the small gathering, a smile spreading across his face. I was taught that it's rude to answer a lady's question without giving it proper thought. Sort of like putting your elbows on the table during dinner. A ripple of laughter passed through the crowd. Ms. Greeley didn't join in. Turning back toward her, the senator continued. You've asked me about my position on the rapture, Ms. Greeley. Well? First, I think I should say that I don't really have positions on religious events. God will do as he wills, and it isn't my place or my position to judge him. If he chooses to lift the faithful into heaven, he will. And I doubt all the politicians in the world saying, I don't believe you can do that, would stop him. At the same time, I doubt he's going to do anything like that, Miss Greeley, because God the God I believe in anyway, and as a lifelong Methodist, I feel I know him about as well as a man who doesn't devote his life to the church can, doesn't throw good things away. God is the ultimate recycler. We have a good planet here. It has its troubles, yes. We have overpopulation, we have pollution, we have global warming, we have the Thursday night television lineup. More laughter. And, of course, we have the infected. We have a lot of problems on Earth, and it might seem like a great idea to hold the rapture now. Why wait? Let's move on to heaven and leave the trials and tribulations of our earthly existence behind us. Let's get while the getting's good and beat the rush. It might seem like a great idea, but I don't think it is. For the same reason, I don't think it's a great idea for a first grader to stand up and say that he's learned enough. He's done with school, thanks a lot, but he's got it from here. Compared to God, we're barely out of kindergarten. And like any good teacher, I don't believe he intends to let us out of class just because we're finding the lessons a little difficult. I don't know whether I believe in the rapture or not. I believe that if God wants to do it, he will. But I don't believe that it's coming in our lifetime. We have too much work left to do right here. Ms. Greeley looked at him for a long moment, lips still pressed into a thin line. Then, so slow that it was almost glacial, she nodded. Thank you, young man, she said. Those four words couldn't have been sweeter if they'd been backed by the Hallelujah Choir. 
Internet share just jumped to top 3%, Buffy reported, raising her head. Her eyes were very wide. Georgia, we're getting a top three feed. Ladies and gentlemen, I murmured, leaning back in my chair. I do believe we've got ourselves a presidential candidate. Top three feed. The words were, if you'll pardon the cliche, music to my ears. The world of internet percentages and readership shares is complicated. It all comes down to server traffic. There are thousands of machines dedicated to calculating the flow of data, then reporting back which sites are getting the most access requests from outside sources and which subsidiaries are attracting the biggest number of hits. Those turn into our ratings, and those are what the advertisers and financial backers base their investments on. Top three was the top of the heap. Anything more would require adding click-through porn. The rest of the question and answer period was pretty standard stuff, with a few hardballs thrown in just to keep things interesting. Where did the senator stand on the death penalty? Given that most corpses tended to get up and try to eat folks, he didn't see it as a productive pursuit. What was his opinion on public health care? Failure to keep people healthy enough to stay alive bordered on criminal negligence. Was he prepared to face the ongoing challenges of disaster preparedness? After the mass reanimations following the explosions in San Diego, he couldn't imagine any presidency surviving without improved disaster planning. Where did he stand on gay marriage, religious freedom, free speech? Well, folks, given that it was no longer possible to pretend that any part of the human race was going to politely lie down and disappear just because the majority happened to disagree with them, and given further the proof that life is a short and fragile thing, he didn't see the point of rendering anyone less free and equal than anybody else. When we got to the afterlife, God could sort us out into the sinner and the saved. Until we got there, it seemed to him that we were better off just being good neighbors and reserving our moral judgments for ourselves. After an hour and a half of questions, more than half of which originated in the auditorium, a campaign first, the senator stood, wiping his forehead with the handkerchief he'd produced from a back pocket. Well, folks, much as I'd like to stay and chat a while longer, it's getting on late and my secretary has informed me that if I don't start cutting off these evening discussions, I'm going to seem a little dull to the folks I'm visiting in the morning. Laughter greeted this comment. Relaxed laughter. Sometime in the previous hour, he'd managed to ease the audience out of their fear and into the sort of calm most people don't experience outside of their homes. I want to thank you for having me and for all your questions and viewpoints. I sincerely hope I'll have your vote when the time comes, but even if I don't, I have faith that it will be because you managed to find someone who was better for this great land. We're following you, Peter, shouted someone from the back of the room. I twisted around in my seat and blinked, realizing that the shouter wasn't someone from the campaign. It was a woman I'd never seen before, holding up a hand-painted Senator Ryman for President sign. The campaign has groupies, observed Sean. Always a good sign, said Buffy. The senator laughed. I certainly hope that you are, he said. You'll have a chance to make me put my money where my mouth is soon enough. In the meantime, good night and God bless you all. Waving to the audience, he turned and walked off the stage as the star-spangled banner began to play from speakers around the room. The applause wasn't exactly thunderous, there wasn't enough audience for that, but it was enthusiastic. More so than it had been at the last engagement, and that one had been more enthusiastic than the one before it, and so on and so on. Maybe you couldn't tell by looking at it, but the campaign was gathering steam. I stayed where I was, observing the audience as they rose, and surprisingly began to talk among themselves rather than fleeing the hall for the safety of their cars. That was a new development, just like the applause. People were talking. Face to face, real time talking, inspired by the senator and the things he had said. More and more, I was beginning to feel like we were following a president. Georgia, said Buffy. 
Go ahead and check the backstage feeds, I said, and nodded toward the knot of chattering attendees. I'm gonna go see what the buzz is. Make sure you're recording, she said, and started for the stage, gesturing for Sean to follow. Grumbling good-naturedly, he snagged his chain mail and went. I walked toward the group of attendees. A few of them glanced over at my approach, took note of my press pass, and went back to talking. The news is either invisible or something to be avoided, depending on what's going on and how many cameras the people around you can see. Since I didn't have any visible recording equipment, I was just part of the scenery. The first cluster was discussing Senator Ryman's stance on the death penalty. That's one that's been going around since the dead first started getting up and walking. If you're killing someone for the crime of killing people, doesn't it sort of contradict the spirit of the thing if their corpse is going to get up and immediately start killing more people? Most death row inmates stay there until they die of natural causes, at which point the government seizes their shambling corpses and adds them to the ongoing research on the cure. Everybody wins, except for the unlucky prisoners who get eaten by the newly deceased before they can be recovered. The next group was talking about the potential candidates. Senator Ryman was definitely getting a favorable reception since they were calling his closest competition, respectively, a cheap showbiz whore, that would be Congresswoman Wagman, and an arrogant tool of the religious right, that would be Governor Tate, originally of Texas, and currently the single loudest voice claiming the zombies would only stop eating good American men and women when the country got back to its moral and ethical roots. Whether this would stop the zombies from eating people of different national backgrounds never seemed to come up, which was a pity since I liked the idea of zombies checking your passport before they decided whether or not they were allowed to bite down. Satisfied that I wasn't likely to hear anything new in this crowd, I started casting around for a conversation worth joining. The one nearest the doors looked promising. There was a lot of scowling going on, and that's usually a sign that interest is warranted. I turned, walking close enough to hear what was going on. The real question is whether he can keep his promises, one man was saying. He looked to be in his late fifties, old enough to have been an adult during the rising, and part of the generation that embraced quarantine as the only true route to safety. Can we trust another president who won't commit to an all-out purge of the zombie population of the national parks? Be reasonable, said one of the women. We can't simply wipe out endangered species because they might undergo amplification. That kind of rash action isn't going to do anything to make the average man safer. No, but it might keep another mother from burying her children after they get attacked by a zombie deer, countered the man. Actually, it was a moose, and the children were a group of college students who crossed a prescribed stretch of the Canadian border looking for cheap weed, I interjected. All heads turned my way. I shrugged. That's a level one hazard zone. It's forbidden to almost everyone outside the armed forces and certain branches of the scientific community. Assuming you're talking about the incident last August and I didn't somehow miss an ungulate attack? I knew I hadn't. I religiously follow animal attacks on humans, filing them under one of two categories. We need stricter laws and Darwin was right. I don't think people should be allowed to keep animals large enough to undergo amplification, but I also don't believe wiping out the rest of the large mammals in the world is the answer. If you want to go foraging into the wilds of Canada without proper gear, you deserve what you get, even if that happens to include being attacked by an undead moose. The man reddened. I don't think I was talking to you, miss. Fair enough, I said. Still, the facts of the event are pretty well documented. Again, assuming I didn't miss something. Looking mildly amused, one of the other men said, Well, come on, Carl. Did the young lady miss an attack, or are you referring to the incident with the moose? He didn't need to answer. His glare was answer enough. Turning his back pointedly on the three of us, he moved to join a vigorous condemnation of the senator's stance on the death penalty that was going on just a few feet away. I don't think I've ever seen him deflated with facts before, said the woman, and offered her hand. I'll have to remember that. Rachel Green, I'm with the local SPCA. Dennis Stahl, Eakley Times, said the remaining man, flashing his press pass in a brief show of solidarity. Relieved that my sunglasses would cover the more subtle points of my expression, I took Ms. Green's hand, 
shook once, and said, Georgia Mason, I'm one of the bloggers covering Senator Ryman's campaign. Mason, said Miss Green, as in... I nodded. She winced. Oh, dear. Is this going to be unpleasant? Not unless you're in the mood for a debate. I'm here to record reactions to the senator's agenda, not forward my own. Besides, I nodded to Carl's back. I'm not as hardline as some. I just have strong opinions about large animals being kept in urban areas, and I think we can agree to disagree on that point, don't you? Fair enough, she said, looking relieved. Mr. Stahl laughed. Rachel gets a lot of flack from the local media for what she does, he said. How's the campaign trail treating you? Are you saying you haven't been reading our reports? I asked the question lightly, but I wanted to hear the answer. Journalistic acceptance is one of the last things any blog gets. We may be accepted inside the community, but it's not until the traditional news media starts to take our reports seriously that a new feed can honestly be said to have established itself. I have, he said. They're good. A little rough, but good. You care about what you're reporting, and it shows. Thanks, I replied, and glanced to Ms. Green. Did you enjoy the presentation? Is he as sincere as he seems? I haven't seen any signs that he's not, I said, and shrugged. Illusions of journalistic objectivity aside, he's a nice guy. He has good ideas, and he presents them well. Either he's the best liar I've ever met, or he's going to be our next president. Not that the two are mutually exclusive, but still. Mind if I quote you on that? Asked Mr. Stahl, with a sudden predatory intensity that I recognized quite well from my peers. I smiled. Go right ahead. Just make sure to give your readers a link to our site, if you would be so kind. Of course. The three of us chatted for a bit longer, eventually exchanging pleasantries and going our separate ways. I resumed moving from group to group, now mostly listening, and was amused to see that Carl, no last name given or requested, continually moved away from me as if afraid that I'd taint his ranting with more of my unfortunate facts. I've encountered his type before, usually at political protests. They're the sort who would rather we paved the world and shot the sick instead of risking life being unpredictable and potentially risky. In another time, they were anti-Semitic, anti-black, anti-women's liberation, anti-gay, or all of the above. Now they're anti-zombie in the most extreme ways possible, and they use their extremity to claim that the rest of us are somehow supporting the undead agenda. I've met a lot of zombies. Not as many as Sean and Mom have, but I'm not as suicidal as they are. In my experience, the only undead agenda involves eating you, not worming their way into public acceptance and support. There will always be people for whom hate is easier when it's not backed up by anything but fear, and I will always do my best to hoist them by their own petards. The hallway lights dimmed once before returning to their original brightness, a sign that moving along was requested by the management. I glanced at my watch. It was a quarter to ten. Most zombie attacks occur between the hours of 10 and 2. Allowing people to gather during the high-risk period can triple your insurance rate, especially if you live in an area with recently documented outbreaks. That includes much of the Midwest, where coyotes, feral dogs, and farm animals create a constant low-grade threat. It doesn't take much to get most people moving after they realize they've managed to stay out past the unspoken world curfew. The conversational groups broke up as people grabbed their coats, bags, and traveling companions and turned to head for the doors. All of them had someone to walk with, even Carl. We are a nation equally afraid of gathering together and being alone. Is it any wonder that the average American is in therapy by the age of 16? My ear cuff beeped, signaling a call. I reached up and tapped it on. Georgia. You coming to join the party soon, or should I drink this beer by myself? I could hear laughter in the background. The senator's entourage was celebrating another series of political minefields navigated with grace and charm. They were right to celebrate. If the numbers we'd been getting were anything to go by, Senator Ryman was a shoo-in for the Republican Party nomination once the convention rolled around. Just 
Finishing out here, Sean, I said. The hall lights began coming up from their ambient event setting, heading for the blazing fluorescence that would keep things lit for the cleaning crew. I squinted my eyes closed, turning to walk toward the stage exit. Let folks know I'm coming through? On it, he said. My ear cuff beeped again, signaling disconnection. I'm not much for jewelry, but disguised cellular phones are another matter. They're more convenient than walkie-talkies and have a longer battery life, with an average talk time of 50 hours before the battery gives out. Once the batteries go, it's cheaper to buy a new phone than it is to pay to have the case cracked and a new battery installed. But we all have to pay the price of progress. I have at least three phones on me at any given time, and only Sean has all the numbers. Two of the senator's security guards were waiting by the door, dressed in identical black suits with sunglasses covering their eyes and blotting out most of their expressions. I nodded to them. They nodded back. Steve, Tyrone, I said. Georgia, said Tyrone. He produced a portable blood testing unit from his pocket. If you would. I sighed. You know they're just going to test me again before they let me into the convoy. Yes. And you know that a clean result now would be a clean result after the five-minute walk to the buses. Yes. But you're still going to make me prick my damn finger, aren't you? Yes. I hate protocol. My ritual grumbling finished, I extended my hand, pressing my index finger against the contact pad. The lights on the top of the box flashed in the familiar red-green pattern, settling on a steady, uninfected green. Happy? Overjoyed, Tyrone replied, a faint smile on his lips as he withdrew a biohazard bag from his other pocket and dropped the test kit into it. Right this way. How gracious, I said. Steve smothered a wider smile, and I smiled back, starting across the parking lot toward the distant lights of the convoy. The bodyguards fell into step beside me, flanking me as we walked. Being escorted through every open area we encountered had been a little annoying at first, but I was getting used to it. The senator's crew, Sean, Buffy, and I included, had been traveling in a convoy consisting of five luxury RVs, two buses, our van, and three converted military transport jeeps, which were ostensibly for scouting runs before entering open territory, but were mostly used for off-road rallies in whatever fields presented themselves. There were several smaller vehicles, ranging from my bike to the more substantially armored motorcycles favored by the bodyguards. With as much equipment as we need to carry to meet legal safety standards, it wouldn't make sense to break camp and check into hotels for anything less than a four-day stay. And so we often found ourselves spending a lot of nights roughing it in mobile homes that were better outfitted than my room back home. Sean, Buffy, and I had been assigned to share one of the RVs, although Buffy usually slept in the van with her equipment, claiming that the perpetual gloom of my special lights gave her, quote, the heebie-jeebies. The senator's crew had been taking it as another sign that our resident techie is a little bit unhinged, and Sean and I hadn't been making any efforts to discourage them, even though we knew that it was less of an obsessive-compulsive desire to protect the cameras and more of an ongoing quest for something resembling privacy. Unlike most of our generation, Buffy is an only child, and life in the convoy had been getting on nerves she may not have known she had. Life in the convoy was also creating a new issue, her religion and our lack thereof. Buffy prayed before she went to sleep. Buffy said grace before she ate, and Sean and I didn't. It was better to avoid the conflict by letting her have a little space. Besides, that gave Sean and me the sort of privacy we were accustomed to, the kind that never actually leaves you alone, but doesn't put people in your personal space when you don't want them there either. Two more guards waited at the perimeter gates. Unlike Steve and Tyrone, who kept their pistols concealed beneath their jackets, these two openly held auto-feed rifles I vaguely recognized from Mom's magazines. They could probably hold off the average zombie mob without outside assistance. Tracy, Carlos, I said, and extended my hand, palm down. I'm tired, I'm filthy, and I'm ready to get drunk with the rest of the good boys and girls. Please confirm my uninfected status so that I can get on with it. Bring me a beer later and it's a deal, Carlos replied, and shoved one of the tester units over my hand, while Tracy did the same for Steve. 
Tyrone stepped back, waiting his turn. These were mid-range units performing a more sensitive scan and taking a correspondingly longer time to return results. It would be possible for the fingerprint test to declare someone clean and for the full hand unit to revoke that status less than five minutes later. My results came back clean, as did Steve's. Tyrone stepped up to start his own tests and waved us off toward the third RV in the chain. I could claim that my finely honed journalistic instincts told me which way to go, but they didn't have nearly as much to do with my choice of destinations as with the fact that it was the only RV with an open door, and it was definitely the source of the pounding rock music that was assaulting our ears. The Dandy Warhols. A senator is a man who loves his classics. Senator Ryman was standing on a coffee table inside the RV with his shirt half unbuttoned and his tie draped over his left shoulder, saluting the room with a bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. People were cheering too loudly for me to tell what he was saying, but from the look of things, I'd just walked into the middle of a toast. I stopped by the door, stepping out of the way to let Steve get inside behind me, and took a wine cooler offered by one of the interns. I've given up trying to keep them straight. This was one of the brunette ones, which made her a Jenny, a Jamie, or a Jill. I swear they should come with name tags. Sean pushed through the crowd, nodding to Steve before settling next to me. Word? Generally positive. People like our boy. I nodded to the senator, who had pulled a Jenny up onto the table with him. The audience cheered louder. I think we might be able to ride this one all the way. Buffy said the same thing, Sean agreed taking a swig from his beer. Ready to review tonight's footage? What, and miss the Bacchanal? Let me think. Yes. I shook my head. Get me out of here. The first post-appearance party was fun. So was the third, and the 15th. By the 23rd, I had come to recognize them as a clever method of controlling the locals. Let the peons blow off some steam, reinforce the idea that you're just one of the gang, and get down to the real business after most of the campaign had gone to bed. It was cunning, it was productive, and I salute Senator Ryman for thinking of it. All that being what it is, I saw no reason to spend any more time in an overly bright, overly crowded RV drinking crappy wine coolers than I absolutely had to. Steve smiled wryly as we turned to push past him. Leaving so soon? I'll be back for the midnight football game. Sean promised, and propelled me out the door with a solid push to the middle of my back. The dimness outside was like a benediction. Midnight football? I asked, giving him a sidelong look as we moved away from the raucous RV heading for our much quieter van. Do you sleep? Do you? He countered. Touche. Sean spends his time moving, planning to move, and coming up with new ways to move many of them involving heavy explosives or the undead. I spend my time writing, thinking about writing, and trying to come up with new things I can write about. Sleep has never been high on the priority list for either of us, which is probably a blessing in disguise. We kept each other amused as kids. If one of us had actually wanted to get some rest, we would have made each other crazy. The van lights were on and the back door was unlocked. Buffy looked up as we entered her expression remaining distracted even as she made note of our arrival. Once she was sure that we weren't being pursued by a rampaging horde of zombies, she turned back to her keyboard. Working on? I asked, putting the wine cooler down next to my station. Splicing the footage from tonight and synchronizing the sound feeds. I'm thinking of doing a music video remix once it's all finished. Pick something retro and rock the house. Also, I'm chatting with Chuck. He's going to let me access his campaign footage to date and see if I can't put together a sort of retrospective. I raised an eyebrow as I grabbed a Coke from the fridge. Because you couldn't get at that footage without help? Buffy's cheeks reddened. He's being helpful. Buffy has a crush, Sean sing-songed. Play nice, I said, and sat cracking my knuckles. I need to hit the op-ed sites. See who's saying what and start prepping the morning headlines. It's going to be a fun night, and I don't need you starting a fight and spoiling it. Sean rolled his eyes. Right. You girls feel free to stay cooped up in here screwing around all night. It's called making a living, dumbass, I said, 
flicking the screen on and entering my password. Like I said, screwing around all night. I'm going out with the boys. We're going to find some action, and I'm going to fuck with it, and tomorrow we'll have a ratings bonanza like you've never seen. Sean spread his hands, framing his illusionary triumph. I can see it now. Flagging news site saved by intrepid Irwin. Get glasses, said Buffy. I snickered. Sean gave Buffy his best wounded look, opening his mouth to rebut. Whatever he was going to say was drowned out by the gunshots from outside. You want to talk hypocrisy? Here's hypocrisy. The people who claim Kellis Amberley is God's punishment on humanity for daring to dabble where he never intended us to go. I might buy it if zombies had some sort of supernatural scientist detecting powers and only went for the heretics. But when I look at the yearly lists of KA-related casualties, you can see the raw lists at the official CDC website, and a more detailed list is posted on the wall every rising day. I don't see many scientists. What do I see? I see children. I see Julie Wade, age 7, of Discovery Bay, California. I see Leroy Russell, age 11, of Bar Harbor, Maine. I see a lot more than just them. Of the 2,653 deaths directly attributed to Kellis Amberley within the United States over the past year, 63% were persons under the age of 16. Doesn't sound like a merciful God to me. I see the elderly. I see Nicholas and Tina Postoloff, late of the Pleasant Valley Nursing Home in Warsaw, Indiana. Reports say Nicholas would have survived if he hadn't gone back for Tina, his wife of 47 years. They died and were reanimated by the virus before help could arrive. They were put down in the street like wild animals. It doesn't sound like divine judgment. It doesn't sound like divine anything. I see men and women like you and me, people trying to live their lives without making any mistakes that will come back to haunt them later. I don't see sinners or people who have called down some sort of righteous plague. So stop. Stop trying to make people even more afraid than they already are by implying that somehow this is just a taste of the torments to come. I'm tired of it. And if there's a God, I bet he's tired of it too. From Images May Disturb You, the blog of Georgia Mason, January 12th, 2040. Chapter 8 Sean didn't hesitate. Putting his beer on the nearest counter, he grabbed a crossbow off the wall and ran for the door. I was only a few feet behind him, coke in one hand. Unlike my idiot brother, I have no intention of becoming a footnote on the wall, but that doesn't mean I can't watch from a safe remove. Georgia! There was enough anxiety in Buffy's voice to make me turn. She lobbed a handheld camera in my direction. I caught it, raising my eyebrows in question. Better picture quality and 60 hours of battery life. And audiences love a little hand-shot footage, as long as you cut to the smoother computer-operated stuff before they get motion sickness. Got it, I said, and followed Sean, opening my soda as I went. The encampment was ablaze with activity. Guards swarmed everywhere I turned, weapons out and ready. I couldn't blame them for their excitement. Anyone who goes into private security in this day and age is likely to be a lot like Sean, and he'd slowly been going nuts from the lack of dangerous things to pester. More gunshots sounded from the south. I turned in that direction, flipping on the camera and tapped my soda twice against the pressure pad on my belt. My ear cuff beeped. A moment later, Sean's slightly breathless voice was in my ear. Kinda busy, George. What gives? Need a position if you want this on film. Distant moaning was audible as a whisper on the wind. Buffy's microphones are pretty sensitive. If she could get any sort of audio track, she'd be able to intensify it and play it back with the report, twice as loud and ten times as chilling. Location? Just outside the van. Northwest. I'm at the fence. That was directly away from the loudest signs of combat. You sure about that? Hurry and get over here, he snapped and clicked off. Shrugging, I turned toward the northern fence, breaking into a trot. 
I've learned not to argue with Sean where zombies are concerned. He knows more about their behavior than I can imagine wanting to, and if he says north, he's probably right. Gunshots continued to sound as the moaning, faint as it was, began getting louder. The glare from the perimeter lights confused my night vision. I heard Sean before I saw him. He was swearing merrily, using language that would make a longshoreman blush as he taunted the infected closer to the fence. There were five of them, all fresh enough to look almost human, assuming you discounted the extreme dilation of their pupils and the slack, hungry way they stared at my brother as their fingers clawed against the fence. They'd died within the past few hours. I raised the camera, zooming in on their faces. Sean didn't even realize I was there until my soda hit the pavement. He stopped, taunting the infected, stepping clear of the fence as he turned to stare at me. George? What's wrong? You look like you've seen a ghost. I have. I indicated one of the zombies. Before amplification, she'd been a slender young woman, no heavier than Buffy. The wound that killed her the first time stood out livid and red against the still pink flesh of her throat, and the fabric of her pale gray University of Oklahoma sweatshirt was stained bloody. Recognize her? Should I? Sean leaned closer to the fence. The zombie bared her teeth and hissed, increasing her attempts to break through. She's definitely not one of my exes, George. I mean, she's cute, but way too dead for my tastes. Like you have any exes? Sean has dated as much as I have, which is to say, not at all. Buffy usually has five or six paramours at any given time, but Sean and I haven't ever bothered. Other things keep getting in the way. Well, if I did have exes, they wouldn't look like her. Fill me in? She was the cheering section at the senator's presentation. She looked a hell of a lot better when she was alive. I didn't remember seeing her after the Q&A broke up. If she left promptly and got caught on the street, given her body mass, she'd have had plenty of time to reach full amplification and rise again. It wasn't a difficult scenario to imagine. A young college student comes alone to a risky meeting in a public place and leaves the same way. No one would have been there to help her. A single bite is a death sentence, and not everyone has the guts to call the police and request a bullet to the brain before it gets too late to avoid rising. Whoever she was, she died alone, and she died stupid. I couldn't help feeling bad for her. Ah, oh, jeez, you're right. Sean leaned closer still, moving well out of what most people would call the safe zone. All five zombies were clustering around the same stretch of fence now, hissing and snarling at him. That was fast. This isn't the primary pack, they're too fresh. The most decayed of the zombies would still have been able to pass for human in a dark alley, assuming he could keep himself from trying to eat anyone in range. Something had to bite them. Or one of them dropped dead of a heart attack, Sean said. You're right. The rest are south, harassing the guards. He gave the fence an assessing look. I'd put this at what, 12 feet? Sean Philip Mason, you are not thinking what I think you're thinking. Sure as hell I am. Keep him distracted, okay? He didn't wait for a reply before backing up, getting a running start, and launching himself at the fence. His fingers caught well above the reach of the tallest of the zombies. His toes didn't fare quite as well, but that didn't matter much. Steel-toed combat boots are too tough for even the infected to gnaw their way through. Laughing at their moans, Sean began pulling himself up toward the top of the fence. Next up, we have my brother committing suicide. I muttered and focused the camera on him, tapping the pad at my belt again to dial Buffy. Don't fall, asshole, or I'm telling mom you did it for love of the dead girl. Bite me, Sean called back. He swung his leading leg over the top of the fence and stood astride it, with one foot hooked into the chain on either side. Unhooking the crossbow from his belt, he loaded the first quarrel. Not while I'm breathing, oh brother mine. Buffy here said Buffy's voice in my ear. Buffy, you getting the feeds on this? I want any positive IDs you can pull on our friends. You can cross-reference the one in the sweatshirt with footage from the, I'm on it. Her name is Dana Baldwin, age 23, political science major at the University of Oklahoma. I'm running lookups on the other four. I have a few possible matches, but there's nothing confirmed.
Sean pulled back the catch, taking careful, almost affectionate aim on the nearest of his admirers. I directed the handheld camera toward the mob as a crossbow bolt appeared in the center of their leader's forehead. He fell, and two of the remaining four were suddenly distracted with cannibalizing his remains, leaving two to menace Sean. The virus that drives the infected is only in it for the meat. Zombies generally choose the living over the dead, but something that won't put up a fight is always better than nothing at all. Keep looking, I said. Sean reloaded his crossbow, moving with calm, unhurried precision. I have to give my brother this. He's damn good at what he does. Of course, said Buffy, sounding affronted. She hung up, presumably to focus on her cameras. We'd get a clearer picture of everything that had happened once Sean finished having his fun and we could get back to the van. If there's a square inch of convoy that Buffy can't get on film, I'll eat my sunglasses. Sean was taking aim on the third zombie when I realized there was something wrong with the quality of the moans. They were getting louder and moving against the prevailing wind. I dropped the camera, hearing its case crack as it hit the ground, and turned to look behind me. The leader of the zombies, another familiar face, opinionated Carl from the after meeting, was ten feet away and closing fast moving at that horrible, disconnected half-run that only the freshest zombies can sustain for long. He must have died even more recently than Dana, because he'd been up and moving around less than an hour before. That implied multiple bites and a group attack, possibly by the pack that Sean was in the process of dispatching. Six more zombies followed the ill-fated Carl, moving at speeds ranging from a half-run to a shamble. Pulling the pistol from my belt, I shot Carl twice in the head, turning to aim at the zombie behind him. I didn't have enough bullets. Even if I were as good of a shot as Sean, which I'm not, eight bullets and seven zombies didn't leave me in a position with much of a margin for error. I was already down below the one-for-one -one divide, and that made survival a lot less likely. I pulled the trigger, and the second zombie fell. The sound of gunshots attracted Sean's attention. I heard his sharp intake of breath as he turned, surveying my attackers. Holy, we're past saying it and all the way to doing it, I snarled and fired again. The shot went wild. Four bullets and only two zombies down. The odds were not in my favor. Buffy! Buffy never sends out a camera without a two-way sound pickup. She says she doesn't trust us to manage our own levels, but really, I think she just likes being able to eavesdrop without leaving the van. Her voice emerged from the speaker a moment after I called her name, coming through crackly and distorted. Sorry for the delay, distracted. We've had a perimeter breach on the south fence. One of the gates went down in the reporting casualties. How are you two faring? Let's just say that if you have a broadcast point near some unoccupied men with heavy weaponry, now would be a swell time to use it. I fired twice more. The second bullet hit its target. Six bullets and three zombies down while the remaining four continued to approach. I fired at the new leader of the pack and missed. A crossbow bolt whizzed by my shoulder and the zombie toppled, the end of the bolt protruding from its forehead. Three zombies. I didn't come out here expecting to actually fight anything. I'm only carrying a pistol and I'm about to be out of bullets. Sean? Three bolts left, he called. Think you can make it up this fence? No. I'm a decent sprinter, and I can gun a motorcycle from zero to suicidal in less than ten seconds, but I'm not a climber. I nearly washed out of the physical section of my licensing exams twice, thanks to my lack of upper body strength. If I was lucky, I'd be able to cling to the fence until the zombie grabbing my ankles hauled me down and ate me. If I wasn't, I'd just fall. The speaker crackled. There's a group of guards on the way. Buffy said. They're having some problems, but they said they'd be there as fast as they could. Hope it's fast enough, I said. I started backing up toward Sean and the fence. My father has always had just one piece of advice about zombies and ammunition, one he's drilled into my head enough times that it's managed to stick. When you have one bullet left and there's no visible way out of the shit you're standing in, save it for yourself. It's better than the alternative. Two more crossbow bolts whizzed by, 
and two more zombies fell, leaving just one to shamble toward us, still moaning. There were no answering moans, either from the sides or from behind. Sean's pack was down, and there didn't seem to be any further reinforcements coming. Fire any time now, Sean, I said tightly. Not until I know that there aren't more coming, he said. I kept backing up until I hit the fence and stopped, keeping my gun in front of me, muzzle aimed toward the shambler. Between the two of us, we had the ammo to take it down, as long as that was all there was. It figures, I said. What figures? We finally cracked the global top five, so of course we're going to get eaten by zombies that same night. Sean's laughter managed to be bitter and amused at the same time. Are you ever not a pessimist? Sometimes. But then I wake up. The zombie was continuing to advance, moaning as it came. There were no answering moans. I think it's alone. So shoot, genius, and we'll see. I may as well. I steadied my hands, lining up on the zombie's forehead. If it eats me, I hope you're next. Always gotta go first, don't you? You know it. I fired. My shot whizzed past the zombie, punching a barely visible hole in the nearest RV. Still moaning, the zombie raised its arms in the classic embracing gesture of the undead, moving slightly faster now. No one's ever figured out how the zombies can tell when their victims are unarmed, but they manage somehow. Sean? We have time. Yeah, sure, I said. The zombie was still 12 feet away, well out of attack range, but it was closing on us. I hate you. It's mutual, Sean said. I risked a glance up at him and saw that he was aiming for the zombie's forehead, waiting for the perfect shot. One bolt, one chance. Maybe that sounds like the odds he'd been playing before, but it wasn't. It's easier to get a bullseye when there's nothing actually at risk. Just so we're clear, I said, and closed my eyes. The gunfire came from two directions at the same time. I opened my eyes to see the last zombie mowed down by a hail of chain-fed bullets being fired by no fewer than four of the guards, two closing on either side. Above me, Sean gave a loud war whoop. The cavalry has arrived! God bless the cavalry, I muttered. Our tense standoff was over in a matter of seconds. I ignored the fallen camera as I pushed away from the fence and strode toward the nearest pair of guards. The camera was a write-off. Buffy had the footage downloaded by now, and they were going to insist on destroying the damn thing anyway, since it had almost certainly been spattered with blood when the guards started firing. The electronics were too delicate to survive a full decontamination. That sort of thing was why we keep our insurance paid up. Steve was there, scowling at the fallen infected like he was challenging them to get up and let him kill them again. Sorry, Steve. The virus only reanimates a host once. His partner was a few feet away, scanning the fence. It wasn't Tyrone. I paused, starting to get the vaguest idea of how the zombies had broken through the fence. Ideas never drew ratings without confirmation. What happened? Not now, Georgia, said Steve with a tight shake of his head. Just not now. I considered pressing the matter. If this were a normal zombie attack, one of the hit-and-run outbreaks that can happen anywhere, I probably would have. It's always best to question the survivors before they can start deluding themselves about the reality of what they just went through. After the adrenaline fades, half the people who survive a zombie attack turn into heroes, having gunned down a thousand zombies with nothing but a twenty-two and a bucket of guts, while the other half deny that they were ever close enough to the undead to be in any actual danger. If you want the real story, you have to get it fast. But Steve was a professional bodyguard, and that made him less likely than most men to lie to himself. Factor in the fact that unless he left the convoy after the paperwork was completed, I'd have to continue interacting with him on a regular basis, and getting the scoop wasn't worth alienating the large, potentially violent man who managed a lot of my blood tests. Shaking my head, I took a step back. Sure, Steve, I said. Just let us know if there's anything we can do. 
There was a clatter as Sean jumped down from the fence. I didn't turn, and he trotted to a stop beside me, eyes narrowing as he took note of the attending guards. Christ, Steve, where's Tyrone? He said. Sean has done more to get close to the guards than I have. A little friendliness is unavoidable, but he'd actually gotten out there and made friends. Maybe that's why Steve answered his question with a quiet. Conversion was confirmed at 2200 hours, 27 minutes. Tracy put him down, but not before he was able to pass on the infection. Sean whistled, long and low. How many down? Four casualties from the convoy and an as yet undetermined number of locals. The senator and his aides are being moved to a secure location. If you'll gather your things and collect Miss Maisonnier, we'll take the three of you to decontamination before relocating you as well. Are all the zombies down? I asked. Steve frowned at me. Miss Nason? The zombies. Sean and I just eliminated the better part of two packs, ignoring the part where one of us nearly got eaten in the process. And you seem to have handled the mess at the gates. Are all the zombies down? Channels are showing a negative on infected activity within the area. Channels are not a 100% guarantee, I said, keeping my tone reasonable. You're down hands, and we've already been in primary contact, which means we'll need the same decon you will. Why not let Sean and me stay and help? We're licensed, and if you have ammo, we're armed. Remove Buffy, but let us stay. The guards exchanged uneasy glances before looking to Steve. Whatever he said would go. Steve frowned down at the bodies littering the tarmac and finally said, I hope you both understand that I won't hesitate to shoot either one of you. We wouldn't go out with you if we thought you'd hesitate, said Sean. He held up his crossbow. Anybody got bolts for this thing? Cleanup is the worst thing about a small-scale outbreak. For many people, this part of a rising is pretty much invisible. Anyone without a hazard license is confined outside the contaminated zones until the burials, burnings, and sterilizations are done. When the cordons come up, life goes back to normal, and this sort of thing is routine enough that, unless you know the signs, you could even fail to realize that there was an incident. We've had a lot of practice at cover-ups. That changes if you have to be involved. Part of getting your hazard license is going along on a cleanup run just to make sure you understand what you're getting into. George and I both threw up when we made our first cleanup run, and I almost passed out twice. It's horrible, messy work. Once a zombie's been shot through the head, it doesn't look like a zombie anymore. It just looks like somebody who was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I hate the whole process. Sterilization is horrific. You burn any vegetation the zombies came into contact with, and if they walked on any open ground, you drench it with a solution of chlorinated saline. If it's a rural or suburban area, you kill any animals you find. Squirrels, cats, whatever. If it's mammalian and can carry the virus in its live state, it dies, even if it's too small to undergo amplification. And when you're done, you shuffle back to the hazmat center that's been established for Agent Decon, and you go inside, and you spend two hours having your skin steamed off, which is a nice way to prepare for the two weeks of nightmares that you're going to have to live through. If you ever start to feel like I have a glamorous job, that maybe it would be fun to go out and poke a zombie with a stick while one of your friends makes a home movie for your buddies, please do me a favor. Go out for your hazard license first. If you still want to do this crap after the first time you burn the body of a six-year-old with blood on her lips and a Barbie in her hands, I'll welcome you with open arms. But not before. From Hail to the King, the blog of Sean Mason, February 11th, 2040. Chapter 9 I collapsed onto our bed at the local four-star hotel a little after dawn, my aching eyes already squeezed shut. Sean was a bit steadier on his feet, and he stayed upright long enough to make sure the room's blackout curtains were drawn. I made a small noise of approval and felt him pulling my sunglasses off my face a moment later. I swatted ineffectually at the air. 
stop that. Give those back. You're on the bedside table, he said. The bed springs creaked as he sat down, taking the side of the bed that was closer to the window. Rustling followed as he removed his shoes and slumped sideways. I didn't have to open my eyes to know what he was doing. We shared the same room until puberty hit, and since then we've never been more than a closed door away from one another. Christ, George, that was a clusterfuck. Mmm, I replied, and pulled the covers over my head. I was still wearing my shoes. The staff was paid to wash the sheets after every visit, and by the point we'd left the field, I'd dressed and undressed so many times in the course of decontamination that I never wanted to remove my clothes again. I'd just wear them until they dissolved, and then spend the rest of my life naked. How the hell did we get an outbreak that close to the convention hall? Primaries are coming up. We didn't need this, even if it's going to be great for ratings. Think Buffy has the initial edits up? I know you hate it when she releases footage without your say-so, but cleanup ran long. She probably won't wait. Waiting could mean we get scooped. Mm hmm? Bet this spikes us another half point. More when I can get my POV stuff edited together. Think there were faults in the fencing? Maybe they broke through. Steve wasn't clear on where the attack started, and we lost both guards stationed on the gate. Mm hmm? Poor Tyrone. Jesus. Do you know he's putting his teenage son through college with this gig? Kid wants to be a molecular virologist. Somewhere in the middle of explaining the hopes, dreams, and character failings of the fallen guards, Sean's voice trailed off, replaced by the soft, rhythmic sound of his breathing. I sighed, rolling over and followed him into sleep. The curtains were pulled away from the window some unknown length of time later, allowing sunlight to stream into the room and jerk me unceremoniously back into awareness. I swore, fumbling for the nightstand I vaguely remembered Sean mentioning in conjunction with my sunglasses. My hand hit the side of the bed, and I squinted my eyes more tightly closed, trying to ward off the light. Sean was less restrained in his profanity. Fuck a duck, Buffy, what are you trying to do, blind her? My sunglasses were thrust into my hand. I unfolded them and slid them into place, opening my eyes to see Sean, clad only in his boxer shorts, glaring at an unrepentant Buffy. Knock next time. I did knock three times, she said. And I tried the room phone twice. See? Both Sean and I glanced toward the phone. The red message light was blinking. When you kept not answering, I rerouted the locks to make them think your room was my room and let myself in. You didn't just shake us because, I mumbled. A splitting headache was rushing in to fill the void left by my disrupted REM cycle. Are you kidding? You two sleep armed. I like having four limbs and a head. Seeming oblivious to the hostility in the room, Buffy activated the terminal on the wall, pulling down the foldable keyboard. I'm guessing you guys haven't seen the daily returns, huh? We haven't seen anything but the insides of our eyelids, Sean said. He wasn't making any effort to hide his irritation, which was only increasing as Buffy ignored it. What time is it? Almost noon, Buffy said. The hotel startup screen came up and she began typing, shunting the connection to one of our own server relays. The logo of After the End Times filled the screen, replaced a moment later by the black and white grid of our secure staff pages. I let you guys sleep for like six hours. I groaned and reached for the phone. I am so calling room service for a gallon of Coke before she can do any more talking. Get some coffee, too, said Sean. A whole pot of coffee. Tea for me, said Buffy. The screen shifted again as she pulled up the numerical display that represents our feed from the Internet Ratings Board. It measures server traffic, unique hits, number of connected users, and a whole bunch of other numbers and factors all of them combining to make one final holy figure, our market share. It's color-coded, appearing in green if it's more than 50, white for 49 to 10, yellow for 9 to 5, and red for 4 and above. The number at the top of the screen, gleaming a bright, triumphant red, was 2.3.
I dropped the phone. Sean recovered his composure first, maybe because he was more awake than I was. Have we been hacked? Nope. Buffy shook her head, grinning so broadly that it seemed like the top of her head might fall off. What you're seeing is the honest-to-God, unaltered, uncensored ratings board designation for our site traffic over the past 12 hours. We're running top two, as long as you discount porn, music download, and movie tie-in sites. Those three site types make up the majority of the traffic on the internet. The rest of us are just sort of skimming off the top. Rising unsteadily, I crossed the room and touched the screen. The number didn't change. Sean? Yeah? You owe me 20 bucks. Yeah. Turning to Buffy, I asked, How? If I attribute it to the graphic design, do I get a raise? No, said Sean and I in unison. Didn't think so, but a girl has to try. Buffy sat down on the edge of my bed, still beaming. I got clean footage from half a dozen cameras all the way through both attacks. No voice reports, since someone went and volunteered to help with cleanup. Not that going through decom without helping would have left me able to record, I said dryly, retreating back toward the phone. Incredible ratings or not, I needed to kill this headache before it got fully established. And that meant I needed something caffeinated to wash down the painkillers. You know that wipes me out. Details, said Buffy. I spliced together three basic narrative tracks. One following the outbreak at the gate as closely as possible, one following the perimeter, and one that followed the two of you. I glanced in her direction as I waited for room service to pick up. How much of our dialogue did you get? Buffy beamed. All of it. That explains some of the jump, Sean said dryly. You always get a point spike when you say you hate me in a published report. Only because it's true, I said quashing the urge to groan. It was my own fault for leaving Buffy alone with the unedited footage. She had to put something up. A news blackout doesn't heighten suspense, it just loses readers. Sean snorted. Right, so you had three tracks, and... I tossed them up in their raw form, tapped some beta newsies to throw down narrative tracks, got straight bio files on the confirmed casualties, and wrote a new poem about how fast everything can fall apart. Buffy cast an anxious glance my way, smile slipping. Did I do it right? Room service confirmed that the assorted drinks were en route, along with an order of dry wheat toast. I hung up the phone. Which betas? Um, Mahir for the gate, Alric for the perimeter, and Bex for the attack on the two of you. Ah, I adjusted my sunglasses. I'm going to want to review their reports. It was a formality, and from the look on her face, Buffy knew it. She'd selected the same bait as I would have chosen. Mahir is located in London, England, and he's great for dry, factual reporting that neither pretties things up nor dumbs them down. If I have a second in command, it's Mahir. Alric can build suspense almost as well as an Irwin, fitting his narration and description into the natural blank spots in a recording. And Bex would have been a horror movie director if we weren't all practically living in a horror movie these days. Her sense of timing is impeccable, and her cut shots are even better. Of the betas we've acquired, I count my newsies as the best of the bunch. They're good. They're hoping to ride our success to alpha positions of their own, and that makes them ambitious. Ambition is worth more than practically anything else in this business, even talent. Of course you will, Buffy said clearly waiting for me to break down and say the words. I smiled faintly and said them. You did good. Buffy punched the air. She shoots, she scores! Just don't get cocky, I said. There was a knock at the door. This hotel must have the fastest room service in the Midwest. Remember, one successful set of executive decisions does not prepare you to take my... I opened the door to reveal Steve and Carlos. They were impeccably dressed, matching black suits so crisply pressed that you'd never have guessed they'd been in the field incinerating the bodies of their fallen comrades less than eight hours previous. I stood there in my slept-in clothes, with my uncombed hair sticking up in all directions and stared at them. 
Miss Mason, said Steve. His tone was flat, even more formal than it was in our first encounter. Dipping a hand into his pocket, he produced the familiar shape of a handheld blood testing unit. If you and your associates would care to come with us, a debriefing has been scheduled in the boardroom. Couldn't you have called first? I asked. He raised his eyebrows. We did. Sean and I really had been sleeping like the unrisen dead. I pressed my lips into a thin line and said, My brother and I have only been awake for a few minutes. Can we have time to make ourselves presentable? Steve looked past me into the room where Sean, still clad only in his boxers, offered a sardonic wave. Steve looked back to me. I smiled. Unless you'd prefer we came as we are? You have ten minutes, Steve said, and shut the door. Good morning, Georgia, I muttered. Right. Buffy, get out. We'll see you in the boardroom. Sean, put clothes on. I raked a hand through my hair. I'm going to wash up. One good thing about going to bed straight from a cleanup operation, even after six hours of sleeping and sweating into my clothes, they were still cleaner than they'd been when I bought them. After you've been sterilized seven times for live virus particles, dirt doesn't stand much of a chance. Georgia, Buffy began. I pointed to the door. Out! Not waiting to see whether she obeyed me, largely because I was pretty certain she wasn't going to, I grabbed my overnight bag off the floor by the foot of the bed and went into the bathroom, closing the door behind me. There's only one way to prevent a migraine from the combination of too little sleep and too much light from fully establishing itself, and that's to wear my contacts. They come with their own little complications, like making my eyeballs itch all damn day, but they block a lot more light than my sunglasses. I pulled the case out of my bag, popped off the top, and withdrew the first of the lenses from the saline solution where they customarily floated. Normal contact lenses are designed to correct problems with the wearer's eyesight. My eyesight is fine, except for my light issues, which the lenses can compensate for. Unfortunately, while normal contacts enhance peripheral vision, these ones kill the greater part of mine by covering the iris and most of the pupil with solid color films that essentially create artificial surfaces for my eyes. I'm not legally allowed to go into field situations while wearing contacts. Tilting my head back, I slipped the first lens into place, blinking to settle it against my eye. I repeated the process with the other eye before lowering my head and looking at myself in the mirror. My reflection gazed impassively back at me, eyes perfectly normal and cornflower blue. The blue was my choice. When I was a kid, they got me brown lenses that matched the natural color of my eyes. I switched to blue as soon as I was old enough to have a say. They don't look as natural, but they also don't make me feel like I'm trying to lie about my medical condition. My eyes aren't normal. I never will be. If that makes some people uncomfortable, well, I've learned to use that to my own advantage. I straightened my clothes, tucked my sunglasses into the breast pocket of my shirt, and ran a brush through my hair. There. That was as presentable as I was going to get. If the senator didn't like it, he could damn well refrain from allowing any more late-night attacks on the convoy. Buffy was gone when I emerged from the bathroom. Sean handed me a can of Coke and my MP3 recorder, wrinkling his nose. You know your contacts creep me out, right? That's the goal. The soda was cold enough to make my back teeth ache. I didn't stop gulping until the can was empty. Tossing it into the bathroom trash, I asked, Ready? For hours. You girls always take forever in the bathroom. Pite me. Not without a blood test. I kicked his ankle, grabbed three more Cokes from the room service tray, and left the room. Steve was waiting in the hall, blood test unit still in his hand. I eyed it. Isn't this going a bit far? We went from cleanup to bed. I doubt there was a viral reservoir in the closet. Hand, Steve replied. I sighed and switched my pilfered sodas to my left hand, allowing me to offer him the right. The process of testing me and then Sean took less than a minute. Both of us came up unsurprisingly clean. Steve dropped the used units into a plastic bag, sealed it, and turned to walk down the hall, obviously expecting us to follow. 
Sean and I exchanged a glance, shrugged, and did exactly that. The boardroom was three floors up, on a level you needed an executive key card to access. The carpet was so thick that our feet made no sound as we followed Steve down the hall to the open boardroom door. Buffy was seated on a countertop inside, keying information into her handheld and trying to stay out of the way of the senator's advisors. They were moving back and forth, grabbing papers from one another, making notes on whiteboards, and generally creating the sort of hurricane of productive activity that signals absolutely nothing happening. The senator was at the head of the table with his head in his hands, creating an island of stillness in the heart of the chaos. Carlos flanked him to the left, and as we crossed the threshold, Steve abandoned us to cut across the room and flank Senator Ryman to the right. Something must have alerted the senator to Steve's presence because he raised his head, looking first toward the bodyguard and then toward us. One by one, the bustling aides stopped what they were doing and followed the direction of the senator's gaze. I raised a can of soda and popped the tab. The sound seemed to snap the senator out of his fugue. He sat up, clearing his throat. Sean, Georgia, if the two of you wouldn't mind taking your seats, we can get things started. Thanks for holding the briefing until we got here, I said, moving toward one of the open chairs and setting my MP3 recorder on the table. Sorry we took so long. Don't worry, he said, waving a hand. I know how late you were out with the cleanup crews. A little sleep is hardly repayment for going above and beyond the call of duty like that. In that case, I'd like some groupies, said Sean, settling in the chair next to mine. I kicked him in the shin. He yelped, but grinned, unrepentant. I'll see what we can do, the senator rose, wrapping his knuckles against the table. The last small eddies of conversation in the room died, all attention sliding back to him. Even Buffy stopped typing as the senator leaned forward, hands on the table, and said, Now that we're all here, how the hell did that happen? His voice never rose above a conversational level. We lost four guards last night, three of them at our own front gate. What happened to the concept of security? Did I miss the meeting where we decided that zombies weren't something we needed to be concerned about anymore? One of the aides cleared his throat and said, Well, sir, it looks like there was a power short on the interior detection unit, which resulted in the doors failing to shut fast enough to prevent the incursion from... Speak English at this table or I will fire you so fast, you'll wind up standing at the airport wondering how the hell you got from here to there without any goddamn pants on, the senator snapped. The aide responded by paling and dropping the papers he'd been holding. Can anyone here... Tell me what happened and how in simple English words of two syllables or less. Your screamer wasn't working, said Buffy. Every head in the room turned to her. She shrugged. Every perimeter rig has a screamer built in. Yours didn't switch on. A screamer being, asked one of the aides. A heat-sensitive motion sensor, said Chuck Wong. He looked anxious, and with good reason. Most of his job involves the design and maintenance of the convoy's automated perimeter defenses. If there had been a mechanical failure, it was technically his fault. They scan moving objects for heat as well as motion. Anything below a certain range sets off an alert of possible zombies in the area. A really fresh one can fool a screamer, but the packs we saw last night were too mixed for that. They should have set off the alerts, and they didn't. Buffy shrugged again. That means we had a screamer failure. Chuck, care to tell us why that happened? I can't, not until we can arrange for a physical inspection of the equipment. It's arranged. Carlos, get three of your men and take Chuck for an inspection run. Report back as soon as you have anything. Carlos nodded, heading for the door. Three of the other bodyguards moved away from the walls and followed, not waiting to be asked. I'll need my equipment, Chuck protested. Your equipment should be with the convoy, and since that's where you're going, I'm sure you'll have errors arguing the finer aspects of spin, while his security heads protested any attempts to categorize their handling of the campaign to date as lax or insufficient. Sean and I sat and listened. We were there as observers, not participants, and after the argument had a little time to develop, it seemed as if most of the room forgot we were there at all. 
One camp held that they needed to minimize media coverage of the attack, make the requisite statements of increased vigilance, and move on. The other camp held that full openness was the only way to get through an incident of this magnitude without taking damage from other political quarters. Both camps had to admit that the reports released on our site the night before were impacting their opinions, although neither seemed aware of exactly how much traffic those reports had drawn. I opted not to inform them. Observing the political process without interfering with it is sometimes more entertaining than it sounds. One of the senator's advisors was beginning a rant on the evils of the modern media when my ear cuff beeped. I rose, moving to the back of the room before I answered. Georgia here? Georgia, it's Buffy. Can you patch me to the speakerphone? I paused. She sounded harried. More than that, she sounded openly nervous. Not frightened, which meant she probably wasn't being harassed by zombies or rival bloggers, but nervous. Sure, Buff, give me a second. I strode back to the table and leaned across two of the arguing aides to grab the speakerphone. They squawked protests, but I ignored them, yanking off my ear cuff and snapping it into the transmission jack at the base of the phone. Miss Mason? inquired the senator, eyebrows rising. Sorry, this is important. I hit the receive button. Testing, testing, said Buffy's voice crackling slightly through the speaker. Am I live? We can hear you, Miss Maisonnier, said the senator. May I ask what was so important that it required breaking in on our conference? Chuck Wong spoke next. Apparently ours wasn't the only end on the speakerphone. We're at the perimeter fence, sir, and it seemed important that we call you as quickly as possible. What's going on out there, Chuck? No more zombies, I hope? Uh, no, sir, not so far. It's the screamer. The one that failed? Yes, sir. It didn't fail because of anything my team did. Chuck didn't keep the relief out of his tone, and I couldn't blame him. Carelessness can be a federal offense when it applies to anti-zombie devices. No one has managed to successfully charge a security technician with manslaughter. Yet. But the cases come up almost every year. The wires were cut. The senator froze. Cut? The screamer shows detection of the zombies we saw last night, sir. The connection that should have set off the perimeter alarms wasn't made because those wires had been cut before the alarm was sounded. Whoever did it did a pretty good job, Buffy said. All the damage is inside the boxes. Nothing visible until you crack the case, and even then you have to dig around before you find the brakes. The senator sagged backward, paling. Are you telling me this was sabotage? Well, sir, said Chuck. None of my men would have cut the wires on a screamer protecting the convoy that they were inside. There's just no reason for it. I see. Finish your sweep and report back, Chuck. Miss Maisonnier, thank you for calling. Please call again if you need anything further. Roger. Georgia, we're on server four. Noted. Signing off now. I leaned over and cut the connection before pulling my ear cuff out of the jack and sliding it back into my ear. Only when this was done did I glance back up at Senator Ryman. The senator looked like a man who'd been hit, hard and unexpectedly from behind. He met my gaze, despite the alien appearance of my contacts, and gave a small, tightly controlled shake of his head. Please, that gesture said, not right now. I nodded, taking Sean's arm. Senator, if you don't mind, my brother and I should be getting to work. We're a bit behind after last night. Sean blinked at me. What? Of course. The senator smiled, not bothering to conceal his relief. Miss Mason, Mr. Mason, thank you for your time. I'll have someone notify you before we're ready to check out and move on. Thank you, I said and left the room, hauling the still-bewildered Sean along in my wake. The boardroom door swung closed behind us. Sean yanked his arm out of my hand, subjecting me to a sharp, sidelong gaze. Want to tell me what that was all about? The man just found out his camp was sabotaged, I said. They're not going to come up with anything useful until they finish panicking. That's going to take days.
Meanwhile, we have reports to splice together and update, and Buffy's dumping her footage to server four. We should take a look. Sean nodded. Got it. Come on. Back in our hotel room, I turned the main terminal over to Sean while I plugged my handheld into the wall jack and settled down to work. We couldn't both record voice feeds at the same time, but we could edit film clips for our individual sections of the site, and we could write as much text as we needed. I skimmed the reports Buffy authorized while Sean and I were on cleanup. All three of the betas had done excellent jobs. Mahir, especially, had done an amazing amount with his relatively straightforward video feed, and I saw from the server flags that both the footage and his voice tracking had already been optioned by three of the larger news sites. I tapped in a release, authorizing use of the footage under a standard payment contract that would give Mahir 40% of the profits, with clear credit for the narrative. His first breakout report. He'd be so proud. After a pause, I added a note of congratulations directed to his private mailbox. He and I have been friends outside of work for years, and it never hurts to encourage your friends to succeed. How are things in your department? I asked, pulling up the raw footage of the attacks and setting it to run sequentially on my screen. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but I had a hunch, and I've learned to follow my hunches. Buffy knows visual presentation, and Sean knows shock value. But me? I know where to find the news. There had been sabotage. Why? When? And how had our saboteur been able to cut those wires without coming into the range of Buffy's cameras? I'm taking Bex away from you, he said. I glanced over. Sean's screen was dominated by the footage of the two of us against the fence, holding off the last of the zombies. The audio was being fed directly to him via the earpiece plugged into his left ear. His expression was serious. She wants to go Irwin. She's been begging for weeks. And this report? This isn't a newsy report, George. You know that. I scowled, but it wasn't like the request was a surprise. Good Irwins are hard to come by because the death rates during training are so damn high. You don't have time for a learning curve when you're playing with the infected. What are her credentials? You're stalling. Humor me. The footage on my screen was set to play in real time, which meant some of the feeds would pause to let the others catch up again. The gate cameras had chunks missing from their narrative while the attack at the fence was almost complete. I couldn't help wincing when I saw one of the women from the political rally come staggering up, clearly among the infected. I didn't need the dialogue tracks to tell me what Tyrone was saying. He was telling her to halt in her approach, back off and present her credentials. But she just kept coming. Rebecca Atherton, age 22, BA in film from New York University, class A20 vlogging license, upgraded from a B26 months ago when she passed her final marksmanship tests. She's testing for an A18 next month. An A18 license would mean she was cleared to enter level four hazard zones unaccompanied. If you take her, my side of the site retains a 6% interest in her reports for the next year. The infected girl was sinking her teeth into Tyrone's left forearm. He screamed soundlessly and fired into the side of the zombie's head. Too late. The damage was done. 3%, Sean countered. Done, I said, not taking my eyes off the screen. Draft an offer letter. If she agrees... She's yours. Tyrone was staggering in circles, clutching his arm against his body. I could see Tracy barking orders. Carlos turned and ran for the convoy, presumably to get reinforcements. That's why he survived, because he ran away. How must that kind of thing sit with a man like him? I can't imagine that it sits very well. George? What's up? I expected you to fight me more than that. Instead of answering, I pulled the headphone jack out of my machine and let the sound start broadcasting into the room. Oh God, Tracy, oh God, oh God, Tyrone was babbling. The moaning in the background was low and constant. The infected were coming, and the gate in the convoy fence was standing open. Shut up and help me close this thing, Tracy snarled, grabbing the gate with both hands. 
After a moment's hesitation, Tyrone ran over and joined her, placing his hands well away from hers. It was a good way of dealing with things. As long as she didn't encounter any of the live virus, she wouldn't begin amplification. And in someone Tyrone's size, full conversion would take longer than was needed to close a simple gate, even one that heavy. Once it was shut, she could wave him off to a safe distance and put a bullet through his brain. It wouldn't be pretty, but elimination of contagion rarely is. The tape jumped. Tyrone was on the ground in a spreading pool of his own blood, while Tracy screamed and struggled against the zombie gnawing at the side of her neck. The gate was closed, and yet there were six zombies on the screen, one chewing on Tracy, three closing, and the other two lurching onward toward the convoy. Sean frowned. Pause the feed. I tapped my keyboard. The image froze. Rewind to the jump. I tapped my keyboard again and the image ran backward to the blank spot. I left it there, frozen, and looked to Sean for further instructions. He wasn't looking at me at all. Start it up again. Half speed. What are you? Just start the feed, George. I tapped my keyboard. The image began to move again, much more slowly now. Sean scowled and snapped, freeze. The frozen image showed Tracy screaming, the zombies shambling, and Tyrone dead on the ground. Sean's finger stabbed out like an accusation, indicating the leg of Tracy's suit. She didn't run because she couldn't, he said. Someone shot out her kneecap. What? I squinted at the screen. I don't see it. Take out your damn contacts and try again. I leaned back, blinking my right contact free and removing it with the tip of my index finger. After a moment to let my eye adjust, I closed my left eye and considered the screen again. With my low-light vision restored, it was much harder to miss the wetness of Tracy's leg or the way the blood on the snow around her fanned out from her body rather than falling straight down as I would have expected. I sat up straight. Someone shot her. During the missing footage, Sean agreed, voice tight. I glanced to him, and he turned his face away, rubbing a hand across his eyes. Christ, George. She was just doing this because it looked good on her resume. I know, Sean. I know. I put a hand on his shoulder, staring at my frozen video display, where Tracy battled for a life that was already lost. We'll find out what's going on here. I promise. They come to us, these restless dead, shrouds woven from the words of men, with trumpets sounding overhead. The walls of hope have grown so thin, and all our vaunted innocence has withered in this endless frost that promise little recompense for all we risk, for all we've lost. From Eakley, Oklahoma, originally published in By the Sounding Sea, the blog of Buffy Maisonnier, February 11th, 2040. Chapter 10 We were approaching the polls on Super Tuesday, and the mood in the senator's camp was grim. People should have been nervous, elated, and on edge. We were hours away from finding out whether the gravy train was about to take off like a rocket or come grinding to a halt. Instead, a funereal atmosphere ruled the camp. The guards continued to triple-check every protocol and step, and no one was willing to go out without an assigned partner. Even the interchangeable interns were beginning to get antsy, and they didn't notice much beyond their duties. It was bad. The convoy was holding a position three blocks from the convention center, parked in what used to be a high school football field before the rising rendered outdoor sports too dangerous. It was a good location for our purposes, providing power, running water, and sufficient clear ground for the perimeter fence to be established without anything, either physical or visual, obstructing the cameras. The number of people packed into Oklahoma City for the festivities necessitated running secure buses to the convention center every 30 minutes. Each of them was equipped with state-of-the-art testing units and armed guards. We had received the final confirmation that Tracy McNally was shot through the right kneecap during the attack two days after Sean and I first reviewed the tape and brought it to the attention of the senator's security team. This, 
on top of the cut wires in the perimeter screamers, had provided absolute confirmation that the attack had been a poorly managed assassination attempt. The convoy had been preparing to leave Eakley at the time, and it felt like we'd left the last of our high spirits behind. It was Sean who first identified the assassination attempt as poorly managed. When the senator asked him to defend his position, he shrugged and said, You're alive, aren't you? It wasn't a comforting point, but it was a good one. A few more zombies in the original wave, or a few more guards taken out like Tracy, and the convoy could have been overrun rather than suffering a few casualties. Either it hadn't been a full-fledged assassination attempt, or it was an incredibly badly planned one. The former seemed unlikely. They used infected humans. The attraction of attempting to weaponize the infected has decreased exponentially since the Raskin-Watts trial of 2026, when it was officially declared that any individual who used live state Kellis Amberley as a weapon would be tried as a terrorist. What's the point of using a sloppy, difficult-to-manage weapon if even failure means you're likely to be one of the few lucky souls to still qualify for the death penalty? The screamers were the only piece of the convoy's equipment that seemed to have been sabotaged. Reviewing the cameras at the gate confirmed that the blank spots were caused by a localized EMP burst, something focused enough that it took out only the cameras within a certain range and didn't attract the attention of most of Buffy's sensors. You can get that sort of tech at Radio Shack. It's portable, disposable, and entirely untraceable unless you happen to have the make and model of the unit which we don't. The senator's men had been going over every scrap of available evidence since the incident, and they were still no closer to finding answers. If anything, they were further away, because the trail had time to get cold. Who would want to kill Senator Ryman? Try practically everyone, and you'd be off to a good start. Senator Peter Ryman started out as a long shot, and somehow became a frontrunner in the presidential race. Everything could change before the official party conventions, but there was no denying that he'd been doing well in the polls, that he'd been performing solidly across a wide spectrum of potential voters, and that his views on the issues tended to appeal to the majority. Being the first candidate to open his campaign to the blogging world certainly didn't hurt. He'd enjoyed a substantial boost in awareness among voters aged 35 and below. The other candidates took too long to realize that they might have missed a trick, and they'd all been scrambling to catch up. Two of our betas received invitations to follow competing politicians in the week immediately after Eakley. Both refused the offers, citing conflict of interest. When you've got a good thing going, you don't shoot it before you have to. Beyond Senator Ryman's standing lead, he was photogenic, well-liked, and well-placed in the Republican Party, with no major scandals in his background. No one makes it that far in politics and stays completely clean, but he is about as close as they come. Literally, the biggest scandal I've been able to find on the man is that his oldest daughter, Rebecca, was either three months premature or was conceived out of wedlock. That's it. He's like a big, friendly Boy Scout who just woke up one day and decided to become the President of the United States of America. He doesn't even seem to belong to any of the major special interest groups. Despite his wife's horse ranch, he supports the enforcement of Mason's Law, which means he's not in the pocket of the animal rights organizations, but he also opposes wide-scale hunting and deforestation, which means he doesn't belong to the militant anti-nature groups. He neither preaches damnation nor asserts that secular humanism was the only answer for a post-rising world. I haven't even been able to find proof that his campaign received funding from the tobacco companies, and everyone's campaign receives funding from the tobacco companies. Once lung cancer stopped killing their customers, they rapidly became the number one contributors to most political campaigns. There is big money to be had in cigarettes that don't give anybody cancer. A lot of people would benefit if Peter Ryman turned up dead. So maybe it's no surprise that things were fairly bleak around the convoy as the primaries approached. The playful atmosphere that had dominated the campaign for the first six weeks was gone, replaced by blank-faced, by-the-book bodyguards 
who sometimes seem to think that they should demand blood tests after you used a public toilet. Buffy was handling things pretty well, largely by spending her time either inside the van or with Chuck and his team over in the senator's equipment rig, but it was driving Sean and me out of our minds. We both have our own ways of dealing with crazy. That's why Super Tuesday found Sean off with every other Irwin who'd shown up to cover the convention, looking for dead things to irritate, while I was packed onto a bus with six dozen other deeply uncomfortable-looking reporters heading for the convention center. I didn't know why they looked so uneasy. I had to get my press pass scanned three times and my blood tested twice before they'd even let me board. The only way anyone was going into conversion before we hit the convention center was if they suffered from cardiac arrest from the strain of being surrounded by other human beings. A tense-looking man whose shirt was deformed in a way that telegraphed, I am wearing poorly fitted Kevlar, got onto the bus, and the driver announced, We are at capacity. This bus is now departing for the convention center. This garnered a smattering of applause from the riders, most of whom looked like they were rethinking their choice of careers. No one ever told them that being a reporter would mean talking to people. If it seems as if I have little respect for the other members of my profession, that's because it's true. I frequently don't. For every Dennis Stahl who's willing to go out and chase down the story, you have three or four reporters who'd rather edit together remotely taped feeds, interview their subjects by phone, and never leave their homes. There's a fairly popular news site, Under the Lens that makes that one of their selling points. They claim they must be truly objective because none of their newsies ever go into the field. None of them have Class A licenses, and they act like this is something to brag about, like being distanced from the news is a good thing. If the paparazzi clouds serve one purpose, it's keeping that attitude from spreading. Fear makes people stupid, and Callis Amberley has had people scared for the last 20 years. There comes a point when you need to get over the fear and get on with your life, and a lot of people don't seem to be capable of that anymore. From blood tests to gated communities, we have embraced the cult of fear, and now we don't seem to know how to put it back where it belongs. The ride to the convention center was almost silent, punctuated only by the various beeps and whirs of people's equipment recalibrating as we passed in and out of the various service zones and secure bands. Wireless tech has reached the point where you'd practically have to be in the middle of the rainforest or standing on an iceberg in uncharted waters to be truly out of service. But privacy fields and encryption have progressed at roughly the same rate, which frequently results in service being present but unavailable unless you have the security keys. No one's supposed to interfere with the standard phone service channels. This doesn't stop over-enthusiastic security crews from occasionally blanking everything but the emergency bands. It was amusingly easy to spot the freelance journalists in the crowd. They were the ones hitting their PDAs against their palms, like this would somehow make the proper security keys for the convention center access points appear. Fortunately for the security techs of the world, this approach has yet to work for anyone, and the freelancers were still quietly abusing their equipment when we reached the convention center. The bus stop was located in the underground parking garage, in a clear, well-lighted area equidistant from both the entrance and exit. The bus approached. The entry gate rose. The bus entered the garage. The gate descended. Assuming it was a standard security setup, there were circuit breakers in place to prevent the entry and exit gates from opening at the same time, and sounding the internal alarm would cause them both to descend and lock. In modern security design, death trap isn't always a bad phrase. The idea is minimizing casualties, not preventing them entirely. Blank-faced security men approached the bus as the doors opened, each holding a blood testing kit. I bit back a groan as I exited and approached the first free guard, adjusting the strap of my shoulder bag before extending my hand toward him. He slipped the unit over my hand and clamped it down. Press pass, he said. Georgia Mason, after the end times? I unclipped the pass from my shirt and offered it to him. I'm with Senator Ryman's group. He fed the pass into the scanner at his waist. It beeped and popped the pass out again. 
He handed it back and glanced at the testing unit, which was showing a flashing green light. He frowned. Please remove the glasses, Miss Mason. Lovely. Some of the extremely sensitive units can get confused by the elevated levels of inactive virus particles caused by retinal KA. I didn't exactly want to expose my eyes to the harsh lights of the parking garage, but I didn't feel like getting shot as a security precaution either. I removed my sunglasses, fighting the urge to squint. The guard leaned forward, studying my eyes. Retinal Kellis Amberley, he said. Do you carry a med card? Yes. No one with naturally elevated virus levels goes out without a med card if they enjoy breathing. I withdrew my wallet and produced the card, handing it over. He slotted it into the back of the testing unit. The green light stopped flashing, turned yellow, and finally turned a solid green, apparently having satisfied itself that my virus levels were within normal parameters and nothing to be concerned with. Thank you for your cooperation. He returned my card. I replaced it in my wallet before sliding my glasses back on. Will your associates be joining us? Not today. The scan of my press pass would have told him everything there was to know about our organization. Our work history, what our ratings share was like, any citations we'd received for sloppy reporting or libel, and, of course, how many of us were traveling with the senator and his group. Where can I find... Information kiosks are inside, up the stairs, and to your left, he said, already turning toward the next of the waiting journalists. Assembly line hospitality. Maybe it's not that welcoming, but it gets the job done. I turned to head through the glass doors into the convention center proper, where I could hopefully locate a bathroom in short order. The light had left dazzling spots dancing in front of my eyes, and the only way I was going to make them go away was by swallowing some painkillers before the migraine had time to finish developing. It was a small hope, but as I didn't exactly relish the idea of spending the day mingling with politicians and reporters while suffering from a headache, it was the best one I had. The air conditioning inside was pumping full volume, ignoring the fact that it was February in Oklahoma. The reason for the Arctic chill was evident. The place was packed. Despite the xenophobia that's gripped the world since the rising, some things still have to happen face to face, and that includes political rallies. If anything, the rallies have gotten larger, growing as the smaller events dwindled. There's always the chance of an outbreak when you gather more than 10 or 20 people in one place, but man is by his very nature a social animal, and once in a while you just need an excuse. Before the rising, Super Tuesday was a big deal. These days, it's a three-ring circus. Beyond the expected political factions and special interest groups, the convention center has exhibit halls and even a temporary mini-mall of service and sales kiosks. Place your vote for the next presidential candidate and buy a new pair of running shoes. You know everyone in here has been screened for signs of viral amplification, so have a ball. The combination of sudden cold and the press of that many bodies was enough to make my impending headache throb. Hunching my shoulders, I began cutting my way diagonally across the crowd, aiming for the escalators. Presumably, the information kiosk would identify the locations of both the bathrooms and whatever was serving as a press staging area in this zoo. Getting there was easier said than done, but after swimming my way upstream against the delegates, merchants, voters, and tourists who felt that the inconvenience of going through security was worth the chance to have a little fun, I managed to reach the escalator and stepped on, clinging to the rail for all that I was worth. I think the average American's tendency to hide inside while life goes whizzing by is an overreaction to a currently unavoidable situation, but I'm still a child of my generation. For me, a large crowd is 15 people. The wistful looks older people sometimes get when they talk about gatherings of six and seven hundred are completely alien to me. That's not the way I grew up. And shoving this many bodies into one space, even a space as large as the Oklahoma City Convention Center, just feels wrong. Judging from the makeup of the crowd, I wasn't alone in that attitude. Except for the people dressed in the corporate colors of one exhibitor or another, I was the youngest person in sight. 
I'm better crowd socialized than most people born after the rising because I've forced myself to be. In addition to the paparazzi swarms, I've attended technology conventions and academic conferences, getting myself used to the idea that people gather in groups. If I hadn't spent the past several years working up to this, just stepping into the hall would have made me run screaming, probably causing security to decide there was an outbreak in progress and lock us all inside. That's me, the eternal optimist. I saw the information kiosk as soon as I stepped off the escalator. A brightly colored octagon surrounded by scantily clad young women handing out packs of cigarettes. I pushed past them, refusing three packs on the way, and squinted at the posted map of the convention center. You are here, I muttered. That's great. I already found me. The drinking fountain, on the other hand, would be exactly where? Non-smoker? inquired a voice at my elbow. I turned to find myself facing Dennis Stahl of the Eakley Times. He was smiling and had a press pass clipped to the lapel of his slightly wrinkled jacket. I thought you looked familiar. Mr. Stahl, I said, eyebrows rising. I didn't expect to see you here. Because I'm a newspaper man? No, because this hall holds roughly the population of North America, and I wouldn't expect to see my brother without a tracking device. Mr. Stahl laughed. Fair enough. One of the scantily clad young women took advantage of his distraction and pushed a pack of cigarettes into his hand. He eyed it dubiously before holding it toward me. Cigarette? Sorry, don't smoke. He tilted his head to the side. Why not? I'd expect a cigarette to be the perfect capper on your look at me, I'm hard as nails air of journalistic integrity. I raised my eyebrows farther. He laughed. Come on, Miss Mason, you wear all black, carry an actual handheld MP3 recorder. I haven't seen anyone use one of those in years. And you never remove your sunglasses. You really think I don't know how to spot an image when I see one? First off, I have retinal KA. The sunglasses are a medical necessity. Second, I paused, smiling. You got me. It's an image, but I still don't smoke. Do you know where the bathrooms are in this place? I need some water. I've been here three hours and I haven't seen a bathroom yet, he said. But there is a cunningly concealed Starbucks at the end of one of the exhibitors' rows, if you wouldn't mind my walking you. If it gets me water, I'm all for it, I said, waving off another pack of cigarettes. Mr. Stahl nodded, opening a path through the crowd with a sweep of his arm as he led me through. Water or a suitable substitute thereof, he agreed. In exchange, I have a question for you. Why don't you smoke? Again, it seems like the perfect capper to your image. Personal reasons? I like having sufficient lung capacity to run away from the living dead, I replied, deadpan. Mr. Stahl raised an eyebrow, and I shrugged. I'm serious. Cigarettes won't give you cancer, but they still cause emphysema, and I have no desire to get eaten by a zombie just because I was trying to look cool. Besides, the smoke can interfere with some delicate electronics, and it's hard enough to keep most kits working in the field. I don't need to add a second level of pollution to the crap they're already trying to function through. Huh. And here I thought that once you took cancer out of the equation, we'd be back to a world where every hard-hitting journalist was up to eight packs a day. The exhibitor's row was packed with people selling things of every shape and size, from freeze-dried food guaranteed to stay good for the duration of a siege to medieval weaponry with built-in splatter guards. If you were looking for fluffier entertainments, there were the usual assortment of new cars, hair care accessories, and toys for the kids. Although I had to admit a certain affection for the Mattel booth advertising urban survival Barbie, now with her own machete and blood testing unit. That assumes every hard-hitting journalist comes equipped with parents who don't mind them living at home and stinking up the curtains, I said. What about you? I don't see you lighting up. Asthma. I could smoke if I wanted to. I could also collapse in the middle of the sidewalk clutching my chest, and somehow that makes it substantially less fun. He pointed to the end of the row. There's the Starbucks. What brings you out this way? The usual. 
following the senator around like a kitten on a string. Yourself? A little bit of the same, on a somewhat more general scale. There was no line at the Starbucks, just three bored-looking baristas leaning on the counter and trying to seem busy. Mr. Stahl stepped up to them and said, Large black coffee, please, to go. The baristas exchanged a glance, but they'd clearly had their fill of arguing with men wearing press passes. One of them moved to start filling his order. Glancing to me, Dennis asked, Want anything? Just a bottled water, thanks. Got it. He collected his coffee and handed me my water, passing a debit card to the barista at the register. I dug a hand into my pocket. What do I owe you? Forget it. He reclaimed his card and turned to head for an open table near the edge of the exhibit line. I followed, sitting down across from him. He smiled. Consider it payback for the circulation figures I got off that little incident out at your encampment after the rally the other week. Remember? How could I forget? I pulled a bottle of prescription strength painkillers out of my shoulder bag, uncapping them with my thumb. That little incident has been defining my life for weeks. Got any juicy details for an old friend? It had been impossible to keep from releasing the fact that the screamers had been sabotaged. Even if we'd wanted to damage our ratings that way, the families of the victims could have sued us for interfering with the federal case if we'd attempted to suppress details. I shook my head. Not that the press hasn't already released. The dangers of pumping industry sources, Mr. Stahl said and sipped his coffee. Seriously, though, how have things been round the camp? Everything going smoothly? Relatively so, I said, shaking four pills into my palm and slamming them down with a long gulp of icy water. Once I finished swallowing, I added, tense, but smooth. There haven't been any real leads on who sabotaged our perimeter. Causes a bit of internal strife, if you understand what I'm saying. Unfortunately, I do, Mr. Stahl shook his head. Whoever it was must have been careful to cover their tracks. With good reason. People died in that attack. That makes it murder, and that means they could be tried under Raskin Watts. Most folks don't commit acts of terrorism expecting to get caught. I took another slower sip of water, waiting for the painkillers to kick in. Mr. Stahl nodded, lips pressed into a thin line. I know. Carl Boucher was a blowhard and an opinionated bastard, but he didn't deserve to die like that. None of those folks did. Good or bad, people deserve better deaths than that. He pushed away from the table, taking his coffee with him. Well, I need to go meet up with my camera crew. We're interviewing Wagman in half an hour, and she likes it when her news crews are prompt. You take care of yourself, Miss Mason, all right? Do my best, I replied with a nod. You've got my email address. I'll keep in touch, he assured me, and turned, striding off into the crowd. It swallowed him up, and he was gone. I stayed where I was, sipping my water and considering the atmosphere of the room. In some ways, it was like a cross between a carnival and a frat party, with people of all ages, stripes, and creeds bent on having as much fun as they could before it was time to leave for less well-secured climbs. Signs hanging from the ceiling directed voters of the various districts where they should go if they wanted to place their votes in the old, physical way, rather than doing them from home via real-time electronic ballot. From the way most folks were ignoring the signs, I guessed the majority had placed their votes online before hitting the convention center. The paper voting booths are more of a curiosity than anything else, maintained because the law insists that anyone who wishes to do so be able to place their ballot via physical, non-electronic means. What this really means is that we can't get exact results on any election until the paper ballots have been tabulated, even when 95% of the votes have been already placed electronically. The tobacco companies weren't the only ones working the time-honored selling power of half-clothed female flesh to push their wares. Girls wearing little more than a bikini and a smile were weaving their way in and out of the crowd, offering buttons and banners with political slogans to the passers-by. More than half the swag was finding its way into nearby trash cans or onto the floor. 
Most of the buttons that stayed on, I noted, were either promoting Senator Ryman or Governor Tate, who was definitely shaping up to be Ryman's closest in-party competitor. Congresswoman Wagman had been able to ride her one-trick pony pretty far, but the buzz was pretty uniform in agreeing that it wouldn't get her much further. You can take the porn star platform a long way, but it's never going to get you to the White House. Signs indicated it would either be Ryman or Tate for the Republican nomination. The results of the day would probably solidify one of them in the lead and make the upcoming convention nothing but a formality. I'd been hoping for a third candidate to mix things up at least a little, but there hadn't been any real breakouts on the campaign trail. Among the Republican voters, and even some of the Democrats and independents, it was either Ryman's brand of laid back, we should all get along while we're here, or Tate's hellfire and damnation that was attracting the attention, and hence the potential support of just about everyone. Tapping my watch to activate the memo function, I raised my wrist and murmured, Note to self, see what you can do about getting an interview out of Tate's camp sometime after the primary closes, whatever the results. Technically, Sean, Buffy, and I count as rival journalists, given that we're mostly devoted to following Ryman's campaign. At the same time, we've all taken public oaths of journalistic integrity, and that means we can, at least supposedly, be trusted to provide a fair and unbiased report on any subject we address, unless it's in a clearly flagged editorial. Getting close enough to Tate to see how the man ticks might help with my growing objections to his political standpoints. Or it might not, and that could give me a renewed reason to rally for Ryman. Either way, it would make for good news. My water was nearly gone, and I hadn't come to the convention center to people watch and catch free beverages from the local newspapermen, no matter how much of an improvement that was over life at the convoy. I tapped my ear cuff. Call Buffy. There was a pause as the connection was made, and then Buffy's voice was in my ear, asking, What glorious service may this unworthy one perform for Her Majesty on this hallowed afternoon? I smirked. Interrupt your poker game? Actually, we were watching a movie. You and Chuckles are getting a little cozy there, don't you think? Buffy's reply was a prim. You don't ask about my business, and I won't ask about yours. Besides, I'm off duty. There's nothing to edit, and all my material for the week has already been uploaded to the time release server. Fine with me, I said. Contrary to my earlier fears, the painkillers were preventing the headache from becoming more than an annoying throb at the back of my temples. Can you get me a current location on the senator? I'm over at the convention center, and the place is a madhouse. If I try to find him on my own, I may never be heard from again. I'd be able to track a government official because I know you have at least one transmitter planted on the man, and you never let a piece of equipment out of your sight without a tracking device. Buffy paused. Then she asked, Are you near a data port? I looked around. There's a public jack about ten yards from me. Great. They don't have wireless maps of the convention center up for public access. Something about preserving the security of the hall or whatever. Go over and plug yourself in, and I can give you Senator Ryman's current location, assuming he's not standing within ten yards of a scrambler. Have I mentioned recently that I adore you? I rose, chucked my bottle into a recycler, and walked toward the jack-in point. So, Chuck, huh? I guess he's cute if you like the weedy, techy type. Personally, I'd go for something a little taller, but whatever floats your boat. Just make sure you know where he's been. Yes, mother, Buffy replied. Are you there yet? Plugging in now. Hooking my handheld to the wall unit was a matter of seconds. The standardization of data ports has been a true blessing to the technically inept computer users of the world. My system took a few seconds to negotiate a connection with the convention center servers, and most of that was verifying compatibility of antiviral and anti-spam software. It beeped, signaling its readiness to proceed. I'm in. Great. Buffy quieted. I could hear typing in the background. Got it. You're in the exhibition zone on the second level, right? Right, near the Starbucks. Drop the singular. There are eight Starbucks kiosks on that level alone. Bring me a sugar-free vanilla raspberry mocha when you come back. The senator is on the conference floor three levels down. I'm dropping you a map. My handheld beeped. 
acknowledging receipt. That should have everything you need, assuming he doesn't move. Thanks, Buffy. I unplug myself from the wall. Have fun. Don't call back for at least an hour. The connection cut itself off. Shaking my head, I focused on the map dominating my screen. It was fairly simplistic, representing the convention center in clear enough lines that my route was difficult to misinterpret. The senator's last known location was marked in red, and a thin yellow line connected him to the blinking white dot representing the data port where I'd downloaded the information. Nicely done. Pushing my sunglasses back up, I began making my way down the exhibition hall. The crowd had grown thicker during my water break. That wasn't a problem. Buffy's mapping software was equipped with a full overview of the pedestrian routes through the convention center and had been programmed to come up with the fastest route between points, rather than the shortest. After estimating congestion levels, it displayed a route that made use of little-used hallways, half-hidden shortcuts, and a lot of stairwells. Since most people will use escalators whenever possible, taking the stairs is often the best way to avoid getting yourself lost in a crowd. The human tropism toward illusionary time-saving devices has been the topic of a lot of studies since the rising. There were an estimated 600 casualties in one large Midwestern mall due entirely to people's unwillingness to take the stairs during a crisis. Escalators jam if you overload them. People got stuck on elevators or ambushed by zombies that had been able to worm their way into the crush of people trying to force their way up the frozen escalators. And that was all she wrote. You'd think that after something like that, folks would start getting better about expending a little extra effort, but you'd be wrong. Sometimes the hardest habit to break is the habit of doing nothing beyond the necessary. It took about 15 minutes to descend three levels and make it past the cursory security checkpoint between the exhibition levels and the conference floor, which was closed to everyone save the candidates, members of their immediate family, official staff, and the press. The security check consisted of scanning my press pass to confirm that it wasn't a fake, patting me down for unlicensed weapons, and performing a basic blood check with a cheap handheld unit from a brand that I know for a fact returns false negatives three times out of ten. I guess once you're past the door in these places, they don't worry as much about your health. The quiet of the conference floor was a welcome change from the hustle and bustle of the levels above. Down here, the business of waiting for results was exactly that. Business. There are always a few hopefuls who stick it out even after the numbers indicate they don't have much of a shot at the big seat. But the fact of the matter is that the party nominations almost always go to the folks who take Super Tuesday. And without party backing, your odds of taking the presidency are slim to none. You're welcome to try, but you're probably not going to win. Nine out of ten of the folks who've been out pounding the pavement for the last few months will be heading home after the polls close. It'll be four more years before they have another shot at the big time, and for some of them, that's too long to wait. A lot of this year's candidates will never try for it again. Dreams are made and broken on days like this. The senator and his team were in a plushly appointed boardroom about halfway down the hall. A placard on the wall identified the room's inhabitants as Senator Ryman, Republican, Wisconsin. But I still knocked before trying the door, just in case something was going on that I wasn't meant to interfere with. Come in, called a brisk, irritated voice. I nodded, satisfied that I wasn't interrupting, and stepped inside. When I first met Robert Channing, the senator's chief aide, my initial impression was of a fussy, egotistical man who resented anything that might get in his way. After a few months of acquaintanceship, I haven't been forced to revise that impression, although I've come to understand that he's very good at what he does. He doesn't travel with the convoy. He's usually at the senator's office in Wisconsin, arranging bookings, setting up the halls where Senator Ryman speaks, and coordinating outside news coverage, since three amateur journalists with a vanity site doesn't exactly constitute wide-scale exposure. Oddly, much of my respect for him comes from the fact that he's willing to say things like that to my face. He's been very upfront about everything that affects the senator's chances at the White House from day one, and if that means stepping on a few toes, he's okay with that. Not a nice guy, 
but a good one to have on your side. At the moment, he was looking at me with narrowed eyes, and it was clear that whoever side he was currently on, it wasn't mine. His tie was askew, and his jacket had been tossed over a nearby chair. That, more than the senator's unbuttoned jacket and missing tie, told me they'd been having a rough day. Senator Ryman is quick to shed the trappings of propriety, but Channing only takes his jacket off when the stress is too much to tolerate in Tweed. Thought I'd come see how things were going at the fort, I said, closing the door behind myself. Maybe get some decent reaction quotes as the numbers come down? Miss Mason, acknowledged Channing stiffly. Several of the interchangeable interns were occupied at the back of the room, taking notation from the various monitors into their handhelds and PDAs. Please try not to get underfoot. I'll do my best. I sat in the first unoccupied chair, folding my hands behind my head as I stared in his direction. Channing is one of those people who can't stand the fact that my sunglasses make it hard for him to tell whether I'm actually looking at him. He met my stare with a disgruntled glower before grabbing his jacket and striding for the door. I'm getting coffee, he said, and stepped out into the hallway, slamming the door as he went. Senator Ryman didn't bother to conceal his amusement. Instead, he roared with it, as though my driving his chief aide out of the room was the funniest thing he'd seen in years. Georgia, that wasn't nice, he said, finally between gusts of laughter. I shrugged. All I did was sit down, I said. Wicked, wicked woman. I assume you're here to find out whether you still have a job? I have a job whether you have a campaign or not, Senator, and I can monitor the public polls from the convoy just as well as I can monitor them from here. I wanted to get an idea of the mood around the camp. I looked around the room. Most of the people present had shed their jackets and in some cases their shoes. Empty coffee cups and half-eaten sandwiches littered random surfaces, and the whiteboard was largely dedicated to a series of tic-tac-toe grids. I'm going with guardedly optimistic. We're ahead by 23% of the vote, the senator said with a short nod. Guardedly optimistic is an accurate assessment. How are you feeling? He frowned at me. How do you mean? Well, sir... At some point in the next, I made a show of checking my watch, six hours, you find out whether you have a shot at the party nomination, and hence the presidency, or whether you're looking at the second banana consolation prize, or worse, nothing at all. Today begins the process of winning or losing the election, so bearing all of that in mind, how are you feeling? Terrified, the senator said. This is a long way from turning to my wife and saying, well, honey, I think this is the term when I make a run for the office. This is the real deal. I'm a bit anticipatory, but not that much. Whatever the polls say, the people will have spoken, and I'll just have to abide with what they have to say. But you're expecting them to speak in your favor. He fixed me with a stern eye. Georgia, has this just turned into an interview? Maybe. Thanks for the warning. Warnings aren't in my job description. Did you need me to repeat the question? I hadn't realized it was a question, he said, tone suddenly wry. Yes, I'm expecting them to speak in my favor, because you don't make it as far as I have without developing an ego. And I'm of the opinion that the average American is an intelligent person who knows what's best for this country. I wouldn't be running for office if I didn't think I was the best man for the job. Will I be disappointed if they don't pick me? A bit. It's natural to be disappointed when you don't get chosen for this sort of thing. But I'm willing to believe that if the American public is smart enough to choose their own president, then the American public is smart enough to know what they want. And if they don't choose me, I need to do some serious self-examination to see where I got it all wrong. Have you given any thought to your next steps, assuming you show strongly enough in today's polls to continue with the campaign? We'll keep taking the message to the people. Keep getting out there and meeting people, letting them know that I won't be the sort of president who sits in a hermetically sealed room and ignores the problems plaguing this country. His dig at President Wirtz was subtle but well-deserved. 
No one's seen our current president set foot outside a well-secured urban area since before he was elected. And most critiques of his administration have centered around the fact that he doesn't seem to realize not everyone can afford to have their air filtered before it gets to them. To listen to him talk, you'd think zombie attacks only happen to the careless and the stupid, rather than being something 90% of the people on the planet have to worry about on a daily basis. How does Mrs. Ryman feel about this? Senator Ryman's expression softened. Emily is as pleased as can be that things are going so well. I'm on this campaign with the full support and understanding of my family, and without them, I'd never have been able to make it half as far as I have. Senator, in recent weeks, Governor Tate, who many view as your primary in-party opponent, has been speaking out for stricter screening protocols among children and the elderly, and increased funding for the private school system on the basis that overcrowding in the public schools only increases the risk of wide-scale viral incubation and outbreak. How do you stand on this issue? Well, Miss Mason, as you know, all three of my daughters have attended the excellent public schools in our hometown. My eldest, that would be Rebecca Ryman, age 18? That's correct. My eldest will be graduating high school this June and expects to start at Brown University in the fall, where she'll be studying political science like her old man. Supporting a free and equal public school system is one of the duties of the government, which does mean increased blood screening for children under the age of 14 and additional funding for school security. But it seems to me that taking money from our public schools because they might be threatened at some point in the future is a bit of burning down the barn to keep the hay from going bad. How do you speak to the criticisms that your campaign depends too heavily on the secular issues facing our nation while ignoring the spiritual? Senator Ryman's lips quirked in a smile. I say when God comes down here and helps me clean my house, I'll be more than happy to help him with cleaning his. Until then, I'll trouble myself with keeping people fed and breathing and let him tend to the parts I can't do anything to help. The door opened as Channing returned, balancing a tray of Starbucks cups on his outstretched arms. The interchangeable interns promptly mugged him. An open can of Coke was somehow deposited in front of me in the chaos that followed. I acknowledged it with a grateful nod, picked it up and sipped before saying, If the campaign ends today, Senator, if this is the culmination of your work to date, was it worth it? No, he said. The room went quiet. I could almost hear heads turning toward him. As your readers are no doubt aware, an act of sabotage committed at my headquarters earlier this month led to the deaths of four good men and women who were dedicated to supporting this campaign. They signed on to draw a paycheck and maybe along the way help an ideal find a place in this modern world. Instead, they passed on to whatever reward may be waiting for us, for heroes, in the next world. If those men and women had lived, then yes, I could have walked away from this a little sadder, a little wiser, but convinced that I'd done the right thing. I'd done my best, and next time I'd be able to make that run all the way to the end of the road. At this point, nothing I do is bringing them back. And if there were something I could do to change what happened in Eakley, I would have done it ten times over. From where I sit, there's only one thing left that I can do, and that's win. For the ideal they died supporting, and for the sake of their memories. So if I lose, if I have to go home empty-handed, if the next time I contact their families it's to say, sorry, but I couldn't make it after all, then no, it wasn't worth it. But it was the only thing I knew to do. There was a long, stunned pause before the room erupted in applause. Most of it came from the interchangeable interns, but the technicians were applauding as well. And so, his hands devoid of coffee cups, was Channing. I noted this with thoughtful interest before turning back to the senator and nodding. Thank you for your time, I said, and best of luck in today's primaries. Senator Ryman flashed a practiced grin. I don't need luck. I just need the waiting to be over. And I just need the use of one of your data ports so that I can clean this up and transmit it over for upload, I said, pulling out my MP3 recorder and holding it up to the room. It'll take me about 15 minutes to do the surface edits. Will we be permitted to review your report before release? Asked Channing. Down, boy, said the senator. I don't see where we need to. Georgia's been square with us so far, and I don't see where that's going to change. Georgia? You can review it if you'd like, but all that's going to do is delay release, I said. Leave me to work, and this hits my front page before the polls have closed. 
Go to it, said the senator, and indicated a free space on the wall. You have all the data ports you need. Thanks, I said, and took my coke moving over to the wall to settle down and set to work. Editing a report is both easier and harder for me than it is for Sean or Buffy. My material rarely depends on graphics. I don't need to concern myself with camera angles, lighting, or whether the footage I use gets my point across. At the same time, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and in today's era of instant gratification and high-speed answers, sometimes people aren't willing to deal with all those hard words when a few pictures supposedly do the job just as well. It's harder to sell people on a report that's just news without pictures or movies to soften the blow. I have to find the heart of every subject as fast as I can, pin it down on the page, and then cut it wide open for the audience to see. Super Tuesday, index case for a presidency, wouldn't win me any awards. But once I cleaned up my impromptu interview with Senator Ryman and intercut the text with a few still shots of the man, I was reasonably sure that it was going to catch and hold an audience and tell the truth as I understood it. Anything beyond that was more than I had a right to ask. With my report uploaded and turned in, I settled to do what a lifetime of reporting the truth has equipped me for best of all. I settled to wait. I watched the interchangeable interns come and go, watched Channing pace, and watched the senator, aware that his fate was already determined, holding calm and implacable sway over them all. He just didn't know what that determination was. The polls closed at midnight. Every screen in the room was turned to the major media outlets, a dozen talking heads conflicting with one another's words as they tried to string the suspense out and drive their ratings just a few degrees higher. I couldn't blame them for it, but that didn't mean that I had to be impressed with it. My ear cuff beeped. I tapped it. Go. Georgia, it's Buffy. Results? Senator Ryman took the primary with a 70% clean majority. His position jumped 11 points as soon as your report went live. I closed my eyes and smiled. One of the talking heads had just revealed the same information, or something similar. Whoops and cheers were filling the room. Say the words, Buffy. We're going to the Republican National Convention. Sometimes, the truth can set you free. The importance of the Raskin-Watts trial and the failure of all subsequent attempts to overturn the ruling have been often overlooked in the wake of more recent, more sensational incidents. After all, what bearing can two long-dead religious nutcases from upstate Indiana have on the state of modern politics? Quite a lot. For one thing, the current tendency to dismiss Jeff Raskin and Reed Watts as religious nutcases is an oversimplification so extreme as to border on the criminal. Jeff Raskin held a degree in psychology from UC Santa Cruz with a specialization in crowd control. Reed Watts was an ordained priest who worked with troubled youth and was instrumental in bringing several communities back to God. They were, in short, intelligent men who recognized the potential for turning the waves of social change engendered by the side effects of Kellis Amberley to their own benefit and to the benefit of their faith. Did Jeff Raskin and Reed Watts work for the common good? Read the reports on what they did to Warsaw, Indiana, and see if you think so. 793 people died in the primary infection wave alone, and the cleanup from the secondary infections took six years to complete, during which time Raskin and Watts were held in maximum security, awaiting trial. According to their own testimony, they were intending to use the living dead as a threat to bring the people of Warsaw, and eventually of the United States, around to their point of view. That Kellis Amberley was the judgment of the Lord, and that all ungodly ways would soon be wiped from the earth. It was the finding of the courts that the use of weaponized live state Kellis Amberley, as represented by the captive zombies, was considered an act of terrorism and that all individuals responsible for such acts would be tried under the International Terrorism Acts of 2012. Jeff Raskin and Reed Watts were killed by lethal injection, and their bodies were remanded to the government to assist in the study of the virus they had helped to spread. The moral of our story, beyond the obvious, don't play with dead things, some lines 
were never meant to be crossed, however good your cause may seem. From Images May Disturb You, the blog of Georgia Mason, March 11th, 2040. Chapter 11 Georgia, Sean, it's so lovely to see you. Emily Ryman was all smiles as she approached, arms spread wide in an invitation to an embrace. I glanced at Sean and he stepped forward, letting her hug him while he blocked her from reaching me. I don't like physical contact from semi-strangers, and Sean knows it. If Emily noticed the deliberate way we positioned ourselves, she didn't comment. I never quite believe you're alive after those reports you do, you foolish, foolish boy. It's good to see you too, Emily, Sean said, and hugged her back. He's much easier with that sort of thing than I am. I blame this on the fact that he's the kind of person who believes in shoving his hand into the dark, creepy hole rather than sensibly avoiding it. How have you been? Busy as usual. Foaling season kept us hopping, but that's mostly over, thank God. I lost two good mares this year, and neither managed to reanimate on the grounds thanks to the help being on the ball. Emily detangled herself from Sean, still smiling, and turned to offer her hand. Not a hug, just her hand. I gave her a nod of approval as I took it. Her smile widened. Georgia, I can't thank you enough for your coverage of my husband's campaign. It hasn't just been me. I reclaimed my hand. There are a lot of reporters keeping a close eye on the senator. Word on the street is he's receiving the party nomination tonight. The other political journalists were starting to smell White House in the water and were gathering like sharks, hoping for something worth seizing on. Buffy spent half her time disabling cameras and microphones set up by rival blog sites. She spent the other half writing steamy porn about the senator's aides and hanging out with Chuck Wong who'd been spending a disconcerting amount of time in our van recently, but that was her business. Yes, but you're the only one I've met who's reporting on him, rather than the interesting things his campaign drives out from beneath the rocks or the fictional affairs of his office aides, Emily said wryly. I know I can trust what you say. That's meant a lot to me and the girls while Peter was on the road, and it's going to mean a lot more from here on out. It's been an honor. What do you mean it's going to mean a lot more? Asked Sean. Hey, George, are you finally going to learn to write? Because that would be awesome. I can't carry you forever, you know. Sadly, Sean, this doesn't have anything to do with how well your sister can write. Emily shook her head. It's all about the campaign. I understand, I said. Glancing to Sean, I continued. Once he accepts the nomination, assuming he gets nominated, this gets real. Up until now, it's been a weird sort of summer vacation. After the nominations, it would be campaigning in earnest. It would be debates and deals and long nights, and she'd be lucky to see him before the inauguration. Assuming all that work didn't turn out to be for nothing. Assuming he could win. Exactly, said Emily, expression going weary. That man is lucky I love him. Statements like that make me wish I didn't have quite so much journalistic integrity, Emily. I said. The statement was mild, but the warning wasn't. You, expressing unhappiness with your husband? That's about to become soundbite gold for both sides of the political fence. She paused. You're telling me to be careful. I'm telling you something you already know. I smiled, changing the subject to one that would hopefully make her look less uncomfortable. Will the girls be joining you? I still need to meet them. Not for this silly convention she said. Rebecca is getting ready for college, and I didn't have the heart to drag Jean and Amber away from the foals to get their pictures taken by a thousand strangers. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't absolutely necessary. Understandable, I said. The job of a candidate's spouse at the party convention is simple. Stand around looking elegant and attractive and say something witty if you get a microphone shoved in your face. It doesn't leave much time for family togetherness or for protecting kids from reporters itching to find something scandalous to start chewing on. Everything that happens at a party convention is on the record if the press finds out about it. Emily was doing the right thing. Mind if I drop by later for an interview? I promise not to bring up the horses if you promise not to throw heavy objects at my head. Emily's lips quirked up in a smile. 
My. Peter wasn't kidding when he said that the convention had you feeling charitable. She's saving up her caddy for her interview with Governor Tate, Sean said. He's agreed to an interview? asked Emily. Peter said he's been putting you off since the primaries. That would be why he's finally agreed to an interview, I replied, not bothering to keep the irritation from my voice. Doing it before now was dismissible. I mean, what was I going to say about the man? Governor Tate is so busy trying to get elected that he doesn't have time to sit down with a woman who speaks publicly in support of his in-party opposition? Not exactly a scathing indictment. Now we're at the convention, and if he doesn't talk to me when he's talking to everyone else, it looks like censorship. Emily considered me for a moment. Then, slowly, she smiled. Why, Georgia Mason, I do believe you've entrapped this poor man. No, ma'am. I've merely engaged in standard journalistic practice, I said. He entrapped himself. An exclusive six weeks before the convention would have been something he could bury or buy off. No matter how good it was, unless I somehow got him to confess to a sex scandal or drug abuse, it wasn't going to be enough to taint the shining purity of his champion of the religious and conservative right reputation. Senator Ryman is moderate, leaning toward liberal, despite his strong affiliation to and affection for the Republican Party. Governor Tate, on the other hand, is so far to the right that he's in danger of falling off the edge of the world. Few people are willing to stand for both the death penalty and an overturning of Roe v. Wade these days, but he does it, all while encouraging loosening the Mason's Law restrictions, preventing family farms from operating within a 100 miles of major metro areas, and encouraging tighter interpretation of Raskin Watts. Under his proposed legislation, it wouldn't be a crime to own a cow in Albany, but it would be considered an act of terrorism to attempt to save the life of a heart attack victim before performing extensive blood tests. Did I want a little time alone with him on the record to see how much of a hole he could dig for himself when faced with the right questions? Did I ever? When's your interview? Three. I glanced at my watch. Actually, if you don't mind Sean escorting you from here, that would be a big help. I need to get moving if I don't want to make the governor wait. I thought you did want to make the governor wait, said John. Yes, but it has to be on purpose. Making him wait intentionally was showing strategy. Making him wait because I didn't allow enough time to get to his office was sloppy. I have a reputation for being a lot of things. After the article where I called Wagman a publicity-seeking prostitute who decided to pole dance on the Constitution for spare change, Bitch has been at the top of the list, but sloppy isn't among them. Of course, said Emily. Thank you for coming out to meet me. It was my pleasure, Mrs. Ryman. Sean, don't make the nice potential first lady poke any dead things before you deliver her to security. You never let me have any fun, Sean Mock grumbled, offering Emily his arm. If you'd like to come with me, I believe I can promise an utterly dull, boring, and uneventful trip between points A and B. That sounds lovely, Sean, said Emily. Her security detail, three large gentlemen who looked just like every other private security guard at the convention, fell in behind her as Sean led her away down the hall. When she'd emailed asking us to meet her, she said she'd be arriving at one of the delivery doors rather than the VIP entrance. I want to avoid the press was her quixotic but sadly understandable justification. Despite the snide implications that have been made by some of my colleagues, my team and I aren't the lapdogs of what will hopefully become the Ryman administration. We're twice as critical as anyone else when the candidate screws up, because, quite frankly, we expect better of him. He's ours. Win or lose, he belongs to us. And just like any proud parent or greedy shareholder, we want to see our investment make it to the finish line. If Peter screws the pooch, Sean, Buffy, and I are right there in the thick of things, pointing to the wet spot and shouting for people to come quick and bring the cameras. But we're also the ones who won. We have no interest in embarrassing the senator by harassing his family or dragging them inappropriately into the spotlight. An example. Rebecca Ryman fell off her horse during a show jumping event at the Wisconsin State Fair three years ago. She was 15. I don't understand the appeal of show jumping. I don't care for large mammals under any circumstances, 
and I like them even less when you're stacking adolescents on their backs and teaching them to clear obstacles. So I can't say what happened, just that the horse stepped wrong somehow, and Rebecca fell. She was fine. The horse broke a leg and had to be put down. The euthanasia was performed without a hitch. As is standard with large mammals, they used a captive bolt gun to the forehead, followed by a stiletto to the spinal column. Nothing was heard except the horse, Rebecca's pride, and the reputation of the Wisconsin State Fair. The horse never had a prayer of reanimating. That hasn't prevented six of our rivals from airing the footage from that fair for weeks on end, as if the embarrassment of a teenage girl somehow cancels out the fact that they didn't make the cut. Ha ha, you got the candidate, but we can mock his teenage daughter for an honest mistake. Sometimes I wonder if my crew is the only group of professional journalists who manage to avoid the asshole pills during training. Then I look at some of my editorials, especially the ones involving Wagman and her slow political suicide, and I realize that we took the pills. We just got a small portion of journalistic ethics to make them go down more easily. Emily knew she was safe with us because, unlike our peers, Sean and I don't abuse innocent people for the sake of a few marketable quotes. We have politicians to abuse when we need that sort of thing. I checked my watch as I strode down the hall toward the main entrance. A shortcut through the press pen would take me to the governor's offices, where his chief of staff would be happy to stall me for as long as possible. My interview wasn't for a guaranteed 60 minutes. I'd need a lot more pull if I wanted to achieve something like that. No, I just got whatever questions I could ask and have answered in the span of an hour, no matter what else came up during that time. I wanted to make him wait no more than 10 minutes. That would make a point, but still leave me the time to get the answers I both wanted and needed to have. His chief of staff would not only want to make me wait, he'd want to make me wait for at least half an hour, thus gutting the interview and proving once more exactly who was in control of the situation. There are moments when I look at the world I'm living in, all the cutthroat politics and the incredibly petty partisan deal-mongering, and I wonder how anyone could be happy doing anything else. After this, local politics would seem like a bake sale, which means I need to stay exactly where I am, and that means making sure everyone sees how good I am at my job. People called greetings my way as I cut through the press pen. I waved, distractedly, attention focused on the route ahead. I have a reputation for aloofness in certain parts of the press corps. I guess I deserve it. Georgia! called a man I vaguely recognized from Wagman's press pool. He shouldered his way through the crowd, drawing up alongside me as I continued toward the door to Governor Tate's offices. Got a second? Not so much, I said, reaching for the doorknob. He put a hand on my shoulder, ignoring the way I tensed, and said, The congresswoman just dropped out of the race. I froze swinging my head around to face him before tugging my sunglasses down enough to allow me an unobstructed view of his face. The overhead lights burned my eyes. That didn't matter. I could see his expression well enough to know that he wasn't lying. What do you want? I asked, pushing my glasses back up. He looked over his shoulder toward the rest of the gathered journalists. None of them seemed to have realized that there was blood in the water. Not yet, anyway. They'd catch on fast, and once they did, we were cornered. I bring you what I have, and there's footage, too. Lots of stuff, all the votes, details on where she's throwing, what's left of her weight, and you let me on the team. You want to follow Ryman? I do. I considered this, keeping my face impassive. Finally, incrementally, I nodded. Be at our rooms in an hour with copies of all your recent publications and everything you've got on Wagman. We'll talk there. Great, he said, and stepped back, letting me continue on my way. Governor Tate's security agents nodded as I stepped through the doorway into the governor's offices, holding up my press pass for their review. It passed muster. They didn't stop me. Governor Tate's quarters looked just like Senator Ryman's and were, I'm sure, close to identical to Wagman's. Since presidential hopefuls are packed into contiguous convention centers these days, the folks organizing the conventions go out of their way to prevent the appearance that they're showing favor to any particular candidate. One of our guys was going to come away the crown prince of the party while the other went begging for scraps, but until the votes were counted, they'd be standing on equal footing. The office was full of volunteers and staffers, 
and the walls were plastered with the requisite Tate for President posters, but the atmosphere still managed to be quiet and almost funereal. People didn't look frightened, just focused on what they were doing. I tapped the button on my lapel, triggering its internal camera to start taking still shots every 15 seconds. There was enough memory to keep it doing that for two hours before I needed to dump the pictures to disk. Most of the shots would be crap, but there would probably be one or two that I could use. I killed a few minutes pouring myself an unwanted cup of coffee and doctoring it to my supposed satisfaction before walking over to show my press pass to the guards waiting at the governor's office door. Georgia Mason, after the end times, here to see Governor Tate? One of them looked over his sunglasses at me. You late? Got held up, I replied, smiling. My own sunglasses were firmly in place, making it difficult, if not impossible, to tell whether the smile was reaching my eyes. The guards exchanged a look. I've found that men in sunglasses really hate it when they can't see your eyes. It's like the air of mystique they're trying to create isn't meant to be shared with anyone else, especially not a silly little journalist who happens to suffer from an ocular medical condition. I held my ground and my smile. Late or not, they didn't have a valid reason to keep me out. Don't do it again, said the taller of the two, and opened the door to the governor's private office. Right, I said, and let my smile drop as I walked past them. They closed the door behind me with a sharp click. I didn't bother to turn. I'd only get one first look at the private office of the man who stood the best shot at putting me out of a job. I wanted to savor it. Governor Tate's office was decorated austerely. He'd chosen to cover the room's two windows, shelves blocked them almost completely, and the ambient light was provided by soft overhead fluorescence. Two massive flags covered most of the rear wall, representing, respectively, the United States and Texas. There were no other personal touches in evidence. This office was a stopping place, not a destination. The governor himself was behind his desk, carefully placed so he was framed by the flags. I could imagine his handlers spending hours arguing about how best to create the image that he was a man who would be strong, both for his country and for the world. They'd done it. He looked perfectly presidential. If Peter Ryman was all boyish good looks and all-American charm, Governor David Tate was the embodiment of the American military man from his solemn demeanor down to his respectable gray crew cut. I didn't need to call up his service record. The fact that he had one while Senator Ryman didn't has been the source of a lot of ads paid for by concerned citizens since the campaign cycle began. Three-star general, saw combat in the Canadian border cleansing of 17, when we took back Niagara Falls from the infected, and then again in New Guinea in 19, when a terrorist action involving aerosolized live state Kellis Amberley nearly cost us the country. He'd been wounded in battle, he'd fought for his nation and for the rights of the uninfected, and he understood the war we fight every day against the creatures that used to be our loved ones. There are a lot of good reasons the man scares the crap out of me. Those are just the beginning. Miss Mason, he said, indicating the chair on the far side of his desk with a sweep of one hand as he rose. I trust you didn't get lost. I was beginning to think you weren't intending to come. Governor, I replied. I walked over and sat down, pulling my MP3 recorder from my pocket and placing it on the table. The action triggered at least two video cameras concealed in my clothing. Those were the ones I knew about. I was sure Buffy had hidden half a dozen more in case someone got cute with an EMP pulse. I was unavoidably detained. Ah, yes, he said sitting back down. Those security checks can be murder, can't they? They certainly can. I leaned over to turn on the MP3 recorder with a theatrical flick of my index finger. Smoke and mirrors. If he thought that was my only recording device, he'd worry less about what was really going on the record. I wanted to thank you for taking the time to sit down with me today, and of course with our audience at After the End Times. Our readers have been following this campaign with a great deal of interest, and your platform is something that they're eager to understand in more depth. Clever folks, your readers, the governor drawled, settling back in his seat. I glanced up without moving my head. 
The ability to see your interviewees when they don't know you're looking is one of the great advantages to living your life behind tinted glass. It was easier to look than it was to avoid flinching at what I saw. The governor was watching me with undisguised blankness, like a little boy watching a bug he intended to smash. I'm used to people disliking reporters, but that was a bit much. Sitting up again, I straightened my glasses and said, they are among the most discriminating in the blogging community. Is that so? Well, I suppose that explains their unflagging interest in this year's race. Been glorious for your ratings, hasn't it? Yes, Governor, it has. Now, your run for president was a bit of a surprise. Political circles held that you wouldn't be reaching for the office for another cycle. What prompted this early entrance into the race? The governor smiled, erasing the blankness from his eyes. Too late. I'd already seen it. In a way, the sudden life in his expression was even more frightening. He was on script now. He thought he knew how to handle me. Well, Miss Mason, the long and the short of it is that I've been getting a mite worried watching the way things have been going around here. I looked out at the field and realized that unless I was on it, there just wasn't anyone out there that I'd trust to watch after my wife and two boys when the dead decided it was time for another mass uprising. America needs a strong leader in this time of turmoil. Someone who knows what it means for a man to fight to hold what's his. No offense against my esteemed opponent, but the good senator hasn't ever fought for what he loves. He doesn't understand it the way he would if he ever bled to keep it. His tone was jovial and almost jocular, a father figure imparting wisdom on a privileged student. I wasn't buying it. Keeping my expression professional, I said, so you see this as a two-man race between yourself and Senator Ryman? Let's be honest here. It is a two-man race. Kirsten Wagman is a good woman with strong Republican values and a firm grasp of the morals of this nation, but she's not going to be our next president. She isn't prepared to do what's needed for the people and the economy of this great land. Resisting the urge to point out that Kirsten Wagman believed in using her breasts in place of an informed debate, I asked, Governor, what do you feel is needed for the people of America? This country was based on the three F's, Miss Mason. Freedom, faith, and family. I could hear the capital letters in his voice. He said the words with that much force. We've gone to great lengths to preserve the first of those things, but we've allowed the other two to slip by the wayside as we focused on the here and now. We're drifting away from God. The blankness was back in his eyes. We're being judged. We're being tested. I'm afraid we're coming direly close to failing, and this isn't a test you get to take more than once. Can you give me an example of this failure? Why, the loss of Alaska, Miss Mason. A great American territory ceded to the dead because we didn't have the guts to stand up for what was rightly ours. Our boys weren't willing to put their faith in God and stand that line and now a treasured part of our nation is lost, maybe forever. How long before that happens again? In Hawaii, or Puerto Rico, or God forbid, even the American heartland? We've gotten soft behind our walls. It's time to put our trust in God. Governor, you saw action in the Canadian border cleansing. I'd expect you to understand why Alaska had to be abandoned. And I expect you to understand why a true American never lets go of what's his. We should have fought. Under my leadership, we will fight, and we will, by God, win. I suppressed the unprofessional urge to shudder. His voice held all the hallmarks of a fanatic. You're requesting relaxation of Mason's law, Governor. Is there a particular reason for that? There's nothing in the Constitution that says a man can't feed his family however he sees fit, even if that way isn't exactly popular. Laws that limit our freedoms are needless as often as not. Why, look what happened when the Democrats stopped fighting for their unconstitutional gun control laws. Should gunshot deaths climb? No. They declined by 40% the first year, and they've been dropping steadily ever since. Stands to reason that relaxation of other anti-freedom legislation would... How many of the infected are killed with guns every year? He paused, eyes narrowing. I don't see what bearing that has in our discussion. According to the most recent CDC figures, 90% of Kellis Amberley victims that are killed in clashes with the uninfected are killed by gunshot. Guns fired by licensed, 
law-abiding citizens. Yes, Governor. The CDC has also said that it's virtually impossible to tell a murder victim killed by a shot to the head or spinal column from an infected individual put down legally in the same fashion. What is your answer to critics of the relaxed gun control laws who hold that gun-related violence has actually increased, but has been masked by the post-mortem amplification of the Kellis Amberley virus? Well, Miss Mason, I suppose I'd have to ask them for proof. He leaned forward. You carry a gun? I'm a licensed journalist. Does that mean yes? It means I'm required to by law. Would you feel safe entering a hazard zone without it? Letting your kids enter a hazard zone? This isn't the civilized world anymore, Miss Mason. The natives are always restless now. As soon as you get sick, you start to hate the folks who aren't. America needs a man who isn't afraid to say that your rights end where the grave begins. No mercy, no clemency, and no limits on what a man can do to protect what's his. Governor, there have been no indications that infected individuals are capable of emotions as complex as hate. Further, they're not dead. If rights end where the grave begins, shouldn't they be protected by law like any other citizen? Miss, that's the sort of thinking you can afford when you're safe, protected by men who understand what it means to stand strong. When the dead, sorry, the infected, are at your door, well... You'll be wishing for a man who speaks like me. Do you feel that Senator Ryman is soft on the infected? I don't think he's ever been put into a position to find out. Nicely said. Cast doubt on Senator Ryman's ability to fight the zombies and imply that he might be overly sympathetic to the idea of live and let live, a concept that gets floated now and then by members of the far left wing, usually for about 15 minutes until another lobbyist gets eaten. Governor, you've spoken on wanting to do away with the so-called Good Samaritan laws that currently make it legal to extend assistance to citizens in trouble or distress. Can you explain your reasoning? Simple as pie. Someone in distress likely got that way for a reason. Now, I'm not saying that I don't feel terrible for anyone who winds up in that sort of a position, but if you rush to my aid when I've been bit and you violate a quarantine line to do it, well... Odds are good that you're not saving me anyway, but you've also just thrown your own life aside. The governor smiled. It might have seemed warm if it had come close to reaching his eyes. It's always the young and the idealistic who die that way. The ones America needs most of all. We have to protect our future. By sacrificing our present? If that's what it takes, Miss Mason, he said, smile widening and turning beatific. If that's what America requires. Now that I've had my long delayed meeting with the man, there's one question on everybody's mind. What did I think of Governor David Dave Tate of Texas, elected three times in a landslide of votes, each time from voters from both sides of the partisan fence, possessed of an incredible record for dispensing justice and settling disputes in a state famed for its belligerence, hostility, and political instability? I think he's the scariest of the many frightening things I've encountered since this campaign began. And that includes the zombies. Governor Tate is a man who cares so much about freedom that he's willing to give it to you at gunpoint. He's a man who cares so deeply about our schools that he supports shutting down public education in favor of vouchers distributed only to schools with government safety certifications. A man who cares so deeply about our farmers that he would reduce the scope of Mason's law to allow not only large herding dogs, but livestock up to 130 pounds back into residential neighborhoods. Governor Tate wants us all to experience the glories of his carefree youth, including, it would seem, pursuit by infected collies and zombie goats. To make matters worse, he has a good speaking manner, a parochial appearance that polls well in a large percentage of the country, and a decorated history of military service. In short, ladies and gentlemen, he is a legitimate contender to hold the highest office in our nation, as well as being the man who seems most likely to escalate the unending conflict between us and the infected into a state of all-out war. I can't tell you to choose Senator Ryman as the Republican Party candidate just because I don't like Governor Tate, but I can tell you this. The governor's biases 
like mine, are a matter of public record. Do your research. Do your homework. Learn what this man would do to our country in the name of preserving a brand of freedom that is as destructive as it is impossible to secure. Know your enemy. That's what freedom really means. From Images May Disturb You, the blog of Georgia Mason, March 14th, 2040. Chapter 12 George? Yeah? I didn't look up. Editing Governor Tate's remarks into a coherent interview was easy, especially since I wasn't forcing myself to be even-handed. The man didn't like me. There was no reason to pretend it wasn't mutual. Compiling everything into a readable format took less than 15 minutes, and we were already getting a satisfactory number of hits. It was the follow-ups that were taking time. Not only did I have a lot of photographs and video footage to wade through, but the phenomenal amount of gossip and hearsay posted about the man bordered on appalling. The folks running the convention were about to start calling the votes. We'd have a formal party nominee inside the hour, and I wasn't anywhere near prepared to leave my computer. No, seriously, George. What? There's a man. Now I did look up, squinting in the glare from the open office door before I reached for my sunglasses. The room faded into a comforting monochrome. Anyone who values colors has never had to deal with a KA-induced migraine. You want to try that again? Because you almost told me something, and I'm thinking you might want to obfuscate your verbiage just a little more. Just for, you know, giggles. He says you invited him here. Sean leaned forward and smirked, his tone dripping with affected smarm. Got a little election night itch you want scratched? I mean, he's not completely hideous, although I didn't think the corn-fed farm boys were your type. Wait, sandy brown hair about your height, blue eyes, older than us, looks like butter wouldn't melt in his mouth? Or anywhere else you wanted to shove it, Sean confirmed, eyes narrowing. You mean you really did tell him to come here? He's a defector from Wagman's press corps. She's pulling out and he's bringing everything he's got, providing it nets him a spot with us for the duration of Ryman's campaign. Sean's eyebrows rose. Public domain materials? Or he wouldn't be trying to bribe us with them. Buffy? I hit save and stood, looking toward the closet our resident fictional had drafted as her private office. The door cracked open and her head poked out. Drop me all the personnel files you can pull on Wagman's press corps and get out here. We have an interview to conduct. Okay, she said, and withdrew back into the closet. My terminal beeped a moment later, signaling receipt of the files I'd requested. We're nothing if not efficient. Good. I looked to Sean. Let's find out whether the man's wasting our time. Go get him. Your wish, my command, Sean said, and turned, closing the door behind him. Buffy emerged from her closet, moving to take the seat next to me. She had her hair skimmed back in a loose ponytail and was wearing a blue button-up shirt I was reasonably sure belonged to Chuck. She looked about as professional as your average 15-year-old, which was close to perfect. If this guy couldn't handle us in our natural working environment, he didn't really want to work with us. You really thinking of hiring this guy? She asked. Depends on what he's got and what his credentials say, I said. She nodded. Fair enough. Further conversation was forestalled as the door swung open. Sean stepped into the room, followed by the man from the press room. He was carrying a sealed folder under one arm, which he tossed to me as soon as he was clear of the door. I caught it and raised one eyebrow, waiting. Buffy sat up a little straighter, attention fixed on the newcomer. That's everything, he said. Video, hard copy, data files. Six months of following Wagman, plus the details on the deals she cut as she made for the door. Your boy's getting confirmed tonight, and it's going to be partially because of the amount of pull she tossed his way. I doubt she shifted the balance, I said. Handing the folder to Buffy, I said, run this, see if there's anything we can use. Got it. She stood and paused, tossing a studied impish grin toward the newcomer. Hey, Rick, you're looking all downtrodden and desperate. The newcomer, Rick, returned the smile with one that looked substantially more sincere and even, I thought, slightly relieved. Ah, uh, Buffy, 
he said. You, meanwhile, look like you're wearing your boyfriend's clothes again. I hope this one is at least a Catholic. That's between me and my prayers, she said, blowing him a kiss. I turned to eye him, pulling my sunglasses far enough down my nose to make my expression plain. I take it you two know each other? No, I just call every strange blonde I see Buffy. You'd be amazed how often I'm right. He offered his hand. Buffy snorted, amusement evident, and retreated to her closet. I could pursue that line of questioning later. Well, you've tagged our fictional, and I know you know who I am. Care to even the odds? I took his hand and shook it. His grip was firm, but not overly so. Richard Cousins, Rick to my friends. Newsy, currently unaffiliated, although I'm hoping we're about to change that. My biases are registered with talking points and unvarnished truth. Huh, I said, releasing his hand. Talking points and unvarnished truth are two of the larger blogger databases. Anyone can register a bias page with them and get it certified. Still, their signal-to-noise ratio is surprisingly good, largely because they self-police on a constant basis, looking for people who claim one set of biases while espousing another. License level? A-15. Wagman required it when she started aping your boy. He produced a data pad from inside his coat. My credentials are there and ready for link, along with my most recent medical records and blood test results. Fabulous. I slid the data pad into the docking slot on my terminal. Files promptly filled my screen. I skimmed them as I unhooked the pad and passed it back to him. No publications before two years ago, but you're already reporting at an A15 level? I don't know whether that's impressive or suicidal. I vote blackmailed the license committee, contributed Sean. Actually, said Rick. Open the file on his print media pubs, said Buffy, emerging from the closet. That'll explain everything, won't it, Ricky? Print media? Sean's eyebrows shot upward. Like magazines? Try newspapers, said Buffy, eyes on Rick. I had to give him this much. He was taking her poking with good grace, and he wasn't squirming. Yet. That's why he's such a golden oldie. Newspapers, I repeated, disbelieving and pulled up the next page in his file. The rest of his credentials filled the screen. I slid my glasses back up to cover my surprise. Here we go. Buffy's right. Staff writer, St. Paul Herald, five years. Field reporter, the Minnesota News, three years. How old are you? My recertification to virtual media was fully processed 18 months ago. I got on Wagman's team fair and square, said Rick before adding, and I'm 34. Fair and square means what? You got on by waiting for her to realize Ryman had the right idea and then chasing her ambulance? Asked Buffy sweetly. All right, that's enough. Removing my sunglasses, I looked from Rick to Buffy and back. What's the story, you two? Richard Rick Cousins. Newsy, stated biases are left-wing dem without crossing any lines into actual psychosis. Solid writer, good with deadlines, not too adept at the use of imagery, and the bastard beat me in an essay contest six years ago, Buffy said. You can't hold that against me, Rick protested. It wasn't a teen competition. You were 16. I can hold anything I want against you, said Buffy, glowering at him before her face split in a wide grin. You didn't say you wanted the files on Rick, Georgia. Finally looking for a real story, you perverted ambulance chaser? Don't flatter yourself, Buffy. Any story you've had your hands on can't possibly be real, Rick countered. Sean and I exchanged a look. Think they know each other? He asked. Getting the feeling. Buffy? She looked briefly like she didn't want to explain. Then she shrugged and said, After Rick beat me, we started writing. He's a pretty cool guy once you get past the part that he's older than the dawn of time. I choose to take that in the spirit in which it was offered, said Rick. Especially since it comes from someone who thinks Edgar Allan Poe is socially relevant. Buffy sniffed. Right, you know each other, I said. How's his bribe? Do we hire him? He's got good footage of Wagman from the last six months. 
a couple exclusive interviews, and a full recording of her chief of staff making the resignation calls, Buffy said. I shot Rick a startled look. He grinned. You didn't say I had to stop taping. If I was interested in boys, I'd kiss you right now, said Sean, deadpan. George, in newsy speak, what does that mean for ratings? 3% increase for starters. More if he can write well enough to sustain an audience. Rick, we can take you as a beta. You get your own byline, but you run everything through me or my second, Mahir Gouda. No direct access to the candidate. If Ryman doesn't get the nomination, you're on a six-month base contract. I can email you the legalese. And if he does get the nomination? What? If he gets the nomination, which he will, what do I get? I smiled. You get to stay with us until the bitter end, or until I fire your ass, whichever comes first. Acceptable. He held out his hand. I shook it. Welcome to After the End Times. Sean clapped him on the back before he had a chance to let go. More testosterone on the field team. My man! What do you think about poking dead things with sticks? It's a good way to get ratings and commit suicide at the same time, Rick said. I snorted. All right, you can stay. There was a knock at the door. It opened before any of us had a chance to react, and Steve entered, sunglasses obscuring the majority of his expression. I stood. Is it time? I asked. Steve nodded. Senator asked me to make sure you were ready. Right. Thanks, Steve. Grabbing my bag, I hooked a thumb toward our newest addition. Rick, you're with me. We're on the floor. Buffy, I need you here working the terminals. Hit my remotes and tell them we're streaming raw footage starting in 10 minutes, and they should be ready to start doing the forum facing clean and jerk. Editorial power? Fact only. No opinions until I log on and start setting the baselines. I was checking equipment as I spoke, hands moving on autopilot. My recorder was charged, and the readout on my watch indicated that all cameras were operating at 70% or above. See if you can rouse me here. And yes, I know what time it is in London, but I need someone sane stomping on the trolls. Sean, outside the convention hall with my skateboard and my stick, watching to see if the protesters and picketers do anything worth reporting on, Sean said, snapping an amiable salute. I know my strengths. Play to them and don't get dead, I said, turning to head for the door. Steve stepped out of the way, giving me a sidelong look as Rick followed in my wake. It's okay, Steve. He's on the squad. They liked my backflip, Rick said, looking up at Steve. There was a lot of up to look at. You're very tall. You must be a reporter, Steve said. He closed the door behind us, leaving Sean and Buffy inside. The convention center had seemed busy before. Compared to the madhouse that greeted us as we proceeded toward the main meeting hall, it was a mausoleum. People were everywhere. They ranged from staffers I recognized from the various campaigns to private security, members of politicians' families and reporters who'd somehow managed to get out of the press pit and into the wild. Soon, they'd go feral and start inventing scandals for the sake of their ratings. Rick greeted the scene with calm professionalism, sticking close as I followed in Steve's massive, crowd-clearing wake. Rick didn't seem to have any problems taking orders from a woman 10 years his junior either, which can be an issue with guys trying to jump from the traditional news media to the blogging world. They don't mean to bring their prejudices with them when they make the transition, but some things are harder to get rid of than an addiction to seeing your stories physically printed. If Rick continued to listen as well as he had been, things were going to be fine. Steve steered a course through the back halls and into the screaming furor of the auditorium, where politicos and onlookers of every age, race, and creed were gathered for the solemn practice of screaming at the top of their lungs whenever they thought they caught a glimpse of one of the prospective candidates. A satisfying percentage of the crowd was sporting Ryman for President buttons. A group of clean-cut sorority girls in tight white t-shirts hung over one of the rails, shrieking with delight over the entire political process. I elbowed Rick, indicating the girls. See their shirts? He squinted. Ryman's my man? Who comes up with this stuff? Sean, actually. He's got an amazing ear for dog girl. I tapped my ear cuff. Buffy, we're in. How's my signal? 
Loud and clear, oh glorious recorder of really jumbled footage. Try to get yourself a clean shot. I'm only getting 50% signal off the stationary cameras. You mean the stationary cameras that belong to the convention center and were installed for security purposes? The ones with the supposedly unbreakable signal feeds? Those would be the ones. I won't be able to use them for anything but pan shots. And the networks have the wall mount cameras under exclusive coding that I can't break through, so get something good. Yes, ma'am, I said. Buffy out. The connection clicked off, and I turned to Steve. Where are we? Mrs. Ryman has said you could sit backstage with her if you'd like, or you could stay out here and film the crowd, Steve said. Either way, I need to head back there. We're hitting the wire. Got it. I looked to Rick, unclasping the recording array from my left wrist. Take this. Three cameras direct feed back to Buffy in the closet. Just lift it up. Lenses are set to autofocus. He took the wristband and snapped the Velcro around his own wrist. You'll be backstage? Got it. Meet back in the office when the crowd disperses, and we'll see where we're going from there. The footage I got backstage wouldn't be as sensational, but it would be more intimate, and that sort of thing has a staying power that crowd shots lack. We'd hook readers with the screaming and keep them with the silence. Plus, this was a good opportunity to test Rick's reactions in a field situation. The term probationary period doesn't mean much in the news. He'd work out or he wouldn't, starting tonight. Right. He turned toward the stage, raising his arm to give the cameras the best view. Satisfied that he wasn't going to screw around, I followed Steve along the edge of the hall toward the curtained-off area behind the stage. You wouldn't think one little canvas curtain could make that much of a difference. Most little canvas curtains aren't equipped with enough private security to stop a full-scale invasion. The men at the entrance eyeballed our credentials, but didn't bother to stop us or ask for blood tests. Once we were this deep into the convention center, either we were clean or we were all dead already. So we just sailed on through, out of the chaos and into the calm harbor on the other side. Once upon a time, in a political process far, far away, the candidate selection results were known before they were announced to the general public. With necessary enhancements in security and increases in the number of delegates who chose to vote remotely, this has changed over the last 20 years. These days, no one knows who's taking the nomination until the announcement is made. Call it part of a misguided effort to reinsert drama into a process that has become substantially more cut and dried as the years went by. Reality television on the grandest of scales. Emily and Peter Ryman were sitting in a pair of folding chairs near the stage, his left hand clasped in both of hers as they watched the monitor that was scrolling current results. David Tate was pacing not far away. He shot me a poisonous look as I entered. Miss Mason, he said. Looking for more muck to rake? Actually, Governor, I was looking for more facts to pass along. I said, and continued for the Rymans. Senator, Mrs. Ryman, I hope you're ready for the results. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, Georgia, said the senator gravely. Then he laughed, releasing his wife's hand and standing to grasp and shake mine. Whatever the numbers say, I want to thank you and your crew. You may not have changed the race, but you made it a hell of a lot more fun for everyone involved. Thank you, Senator, I said. That's good to hear. After Peter's had a few weeks to rest, all three of you must come and visit the farm, Emily said. I know the girls would love to meet you. Rebecca's very fond of your reports, especially. It would be a real treat for them. I smiled. We'd be honored, but let's not assume a break just yet. Far from it, said the senator with a glance at Governor Tate. Governor Tate's return look wasn't a friendly one. I think we're going to go all the way. A bell rang as if to punctuate his words, and a hush fell over the convention. I stepped back, lifting my chin to bring the camera on my collar to a better angle. Let's see if you mean that, I said. Over the loudspeaker, the voice of a third-rate celebrity who'd gone from bad sitcoms to convention announcements blared. And now the Republican Party's man of the hour, and the next president of these fabulous United States of America, 
Senator Peter Ryman of Wisconsin. Senator Ryman, come on out here and greet the people. The cheers were almost deafening. Emily gave a little squeal that was only half surprise and wrapped her arms around the senator's shoulders, kissing him on both cheeks as he lifted her off the ground in a hug. Well, Em, he said, let's go make the people happy. Beaming, she nodded her agreement, and he led her onto the stage. The cheers doubled in volume. Some of those people wouldn't be able to talk at all the next day. Right then, I doubted any of them particularly cared. Tate stayed where he was, expression blank. Before I moved toward the stage exit, still filming, I paused long enough to get a reaction shot of a man whose dreams had just been dashed. Go, Pete, go, I murmured, unable to keep from smiling. He had the nomination. That was our man out there on that stage accepting the nomination. We were going on the road. My ear cuff beeped three times, signaling an emergency transmission. I tapped it, stepping away from the opening. Sean, what did you- Buffy's voice cut me off. It was all business, and so cold I almost didn't recognize it at first. Georgia, there's an outbreak at the farm. I froze. What farm? The Ryman farm. It's on all the feeds. It's everywhere. They think one of the horses went into spontaneous conversion. No one knows why, and they're still digging in the ashes and setting the perimeter. No one knows where the, where the, oh God, Georgia, the girls were in there when the alarms went off, and no one knows. Slowly, as if in a dream, I turned back toward the opening. Buffy was talking, but her words didn't matter anymore. Senator Ryman had formally accepted the nomination and was standing there grinning his beautiful wife holding his arm, waving to the crowd that chose him to bear their banner toward the highest office in the country. They looked like the happiest people in the world. People who had never known what a real tragedy was. God help them. They were about to learn. You there? Mahir's trying to control the forums, but he needs help, and we need you to find the valid news feeds into all this. We... Tell Mahir to contact Casey at Media Breakdown and arrange a fact-only feed-through of the situation at the farm. Tell him we'll trade an early release on my next candidate interview, I said tonelessly. Wake Alric. Get him backing Mahir until Rick finishes on the floor. Then throw him in there, too. He wanted to join the party? Well, here's his invitation. What are you going to do? Emily Ryman was laughing, hands clasped together. She had no idea. Grimly, I said, I'm going to stay here and report the news. Book Three Index Case Studies The difference between the truth and a lie is that both of them can hurt, but only one will take the time to heal you afterward. Georgia Mason We live in a world of our own creation. We've made our bed, ladies and gentlemen whether we intended to or not. Now we get the honor of lying down in it. Michael Mason I've done a lot of difficult things over the course of my journalistic career. Few, in the end, were pretty. Most of the supposed glamour of reporting the news is reserved for the people who sit behind desks and look good while they tell you about the latest tragedy to rock the world. It's different in the field. And even after doing this for years, I don't think I grasped how different it was. Not until I looked into the faces of presidential candidate Peter Ryman and his wife and informed them that the body of their eldest daughter had just been cremated by federal troops outside their family ranch in Parrish, Wisconsin. You've heard about Rebecca Ryman by now. Eighteen years old, scheduled to graduate high school in less than three months, ranked fifth in her class, and already accepted at Brown University, where she was planning to study law and follow in her father's footsteps. She'd been riding since she was old enough to walk. That's how she was able to bridle that post-amplification horse and get her baby sisters off the grounds. She was a real American hero. At least, that's what all the papers and news sites say. Even mine. If you'll allow a reporter her brief moment of sentiment, I'd like to tell you about the Rebecca that I met, if only for a moment, 
in the words and the faces of her parents. Rebecca Ryman was a teenage girl. She was petulant. She was sulky. She hated being asked to sit for her sisters on a Friday night, especially when there was a new Byron Bloom movie opening. She liked to read trashy romances and eat ice cream straight from the container, and nothing made her happier than working with the horses. She stayed home from the Republican National Convention, partially to get ready for college and partially to be with the horses. Because of that decision, she died, and her sisters lived. She couldn't save her grandparents or the men who worked the ranch. But she saved her sisters, and in the end, what more could anyone have asked of her? I told her parents she was dead. That, if nothing else, qualifies me to say this. Rebecca, you will be deeply missed. From Images May Disturb You the blog of Georgia Mason, March 17th, 2040. Chapter 13 The funeral services for Rebecca Ryman and her grandparents were held a week after the convention at the family ranch. The delay wasn't for mourning or to allow family members time to travel. That's how long it took for regional authorities to downgrade the ranch from a level 2 hazard zone to a level 5. It was still illegal to enter unarmed, but now at least non-military personnel could enter unescorted. The area would return to its original Level 7 designation if it could go three years without signs of further contamination. Until then, even the kids would need to carry weapons at all times. Most public opinion held that it wouldn't matter how long it took for the hazard rating to drop. No family would choose to stay in a home and a profession viewed by many as a dangerous, glorified hobby that claimed the life of one of their children. They said the ranch would be long deserted by the time that happened. I wish I could say that attitude was confined to the conservative fringe, but it wasn't. Within six hours of Rebecca's death, half the children's safety advocacy groups were clamoring for tighter guidelines and attempting to organize legislation that would make the life led by the Rymans illegal. No more early riding classes or family farms. They wanted it shut down, shut down now, and shut down hard. It wasn't a surprise to anyone but the Rymans, I think. Peter and Emily never attempted to map out the scenarios leading to the martyrdom of their eldest daughter, and so they'd never considered what a boon her death would be to certain organizations. Americans for the children was the worst. It's Remember, Rebecca campaign was entirely legal and entirely sleazy, although its attempts to use pictures of Jeannie and Amber had been quashed by the Ryman's legal team. It didn't matter. The images of Rebecca with her horses, and of post-amplification horses attempting to disembowel the federal authorities putting them down, had already done their damage. In the chaos and noise surrounding the outbreak at the ranch, it wasn't really a surprise that Senator Ryman's selection of a running mate barely made anyone's radar, save for the hardcore politicos who couldn't care less that people were dead. And me. I wasn't surprised, although I must admit that I was more than slightly disappointed when it was announced that Governor Tate would accompany Senator Ryman on the ballot. It was a good, balanced ticket. It would carry most of the country, and it stood a good chance of putting Senator Ryman in the White House. The tragedy at the ranch had already put him 20 points up on his opponent in the early polls. The Democratic candidate, Governor Francis Blackburn, was a solid politician with an excellent record of service, but she couldn't compete with a teenage heroine who sacrificed herself to save her sisters. This early in the race, people weren't voting for the candidate. They were voting for his daughter, and she was winning. My team and I offered to head back to California until after the services. While our contract with the senator said constant access, there's a difference between honest reporting and playing the ghoul. Let the local news film the funeral. We'd do our laundry, give Buffy a chance to upgrade the equipment, and introduce Rick to the parents. Nothing says crash course in working as a team, like starting with a major political convention, then moving on to meeting my mother on her home turf. Sean can seem like a minor natural disaster sometimes, but mom's always a 7.5 on the Richter scale. 
That plan was scotched on the drawing board by Senator Ryman, who took me aside the day after the convention and informed me that it would mean a great deal to everyone if we would attend and cover the funeral. Rebecca loved our coverage of the elections, and given his position as the Republican Party candidate, he knew there would be reporters trying to get in to report on the funeral. This way, he'd know the press was reputable. What was I supposed to say? Buffy can order most of what she needs online, and they have laundromats everywhere. The only thing that might have been a sticking point was Rick, since he was still moving his personal belongings out of the hotel that had been the base camp for the Wagman campaign, but I didn't anticipate it being much of a problem. He'd been forced to hit the ground running, and he'd done it without a murmur of complaint. His footage of Senator Ryman's acceptance speech was top-notch, especially after we had cut it with the video feed of the assault on the ranch. Our viewer numbers have jumped more than 18% since the convention, and they're still climbing. I attribute it partially to adding Rick to the team. No one else got an exclusive on the Wagman pullout. Add that to the acceptance and the tragedy, and well, sometimes in the news, luck is just a matter of capitalizing on someone else's pain. March in Wisconsin is very different from March in California. The day of the funeral was gray and cold with patches of snow dotting the struggling lawn of the O'Neill family cemetery. Emily's family had been in the area long enough to have their own graveyard. If the old zombie flicks had been right about the dead clawing their way out of the ground, the funeral would have been a bloodbath. Fortunately, that's one detail the movies got wrong. The earth was smooth beneath its uneven blanket of snow, save for the darker, recently dug patches in front of three headstones near the west wall. Folding chairs of the cemetery. It was completely indefensible. The low stone walls were more for a delineation of boundaries than anything else, and wouldn't have kept a determined horde of zombies out for more than a few minutes. The gates were spaced widely enough to make the whole place little more than a big corral for humans. I shuddered. Sean caught the gesture and put a hand at the small of my back, steadying me. I flashed him a smile. He knows I don't like being outside in poorly defended areas. He doesn't feel the same way. Open spaces just make him think something worth poking is bound to come along sooner than later. The service was winding down. I schooled my expression back to grim serenity and turned to face forward as the priest closed his Bible. The family rose, many of them in tears. Most turned to head for the gates, where cars were waiting to take them to the reception at the funeral home. Nothing says deeply in mourning like canopies and a free beer. A few remained, still looking toward the graves as if shell-shocked. I just feel so bad, murmured Buffy. How can things like this happen? Look at the draw? Sean shrugged. Play with big animals. A little amplification is almost guaranteed. You're lucky it waited this long. Yeah, I said, frowning. Lucky. Something wasn't right about this whole setup. The timing. The scope. You need safety precautions on a scale most millionaires wouldn't bother with to operate a horse ranch, even several miles from the nearest town, and you need to have them upgraded on a regular basis. If something went wrong, it would be contained in a matter of minutes. They might have to torch a barn, but they shouldn't have lost anyone. Certainly not three family members and half the working staff. Sean, get Buffy back to the van, okay? I'm going to give my regrets to the family. Shouldn't we come too? Asked Buffy. No, you go back to the van. Call Rick, make sure nothing's caught fire while we were away from our screens. But... Sean reached around me to take Buffy's arm. Come on, Buff. If she's sending us away, it's because she wants to poke something with a stick and see what happens. Something like that, I said. I'll be there in a few minutes. Okay said Buffy, letting Sean guide her toward the cemetery gates. I turned to study the remaining members of the family. Peter and Emily were there, along with several other adults who looked enough like one another to be close relations. Emily had one arm around each of her two remaining daughters. She didn't look like she'd slept for a week, and both Jeannie and Amber looked like they were finding their mother's embrace more than a little smothering. Peter seemed older, somehow his farm boy good looks strained by the speed and severity with which everything had gone wrong. 
He caught the motion of my head as I looked toward them. He nodded slightly, indicating that it was safe for me to approach. I answered with a thin smile, beginning to pick my way across the slushy ground. Georgia, said Emily as I reached them. Letting go of Jeannie and Amber, she put her arms around me in a too tight hug. The girls moved to stand behind an elderly woman who looked like she might be their paternal grandmother, blocking their mother from grabbing them again once she was done with me. I couldn't blame them. Emily's grief had given her a measure of hysterical strength that seemed likely to crack one of my ribs. We're so glad you came. I'm sorry for your loss, I said, patting her awkwardly on the back. Buffy and Sean send their regrets. Emily, let the nice girl go, said Peter, tugging his wife's arm until she released me. I stepped quickly backward and both Jeannie and Amber cast understanding glances my way. They'd been their mother's target since she ran out of the convention to get them. Georgia? Senator Ryman? He didn't try to hug me. I appreciated that. It was a beautiful ceremony. It was, wasn't it? He glanced toward the churned up earth. Becky hated these things, said they were morbid and silly. She would have stayed home if she weren't a required attendee. He laughed bitterly. She really wanted to meet you. I'm sorry she never got the chance, I said, pushing my sunglasses up to shield my eyes from the light glinting off the patchy snow. Would you mind if I took you aside for a moment? It won't take long. No, of course not. He kissed Emily on the forehead and said, you just get back to the girls, all right, sweetheart? I'll only be a moment. All right, said Emily. She managed to force a wavering smile and said, We'll see you at the reception, won't we, Georgia? Of course, Mrs. Ryman, I replied. The senator and I walked until we were about eight feet from the group, far enough that they couldn't hear us, but close enough to maintain visual contact. Now, Georgia, he said without preamble. What's this all about? I tilted my chin up until I was looking directly at him and said, Senator, if you don't mind, my team and I would like permission to go up to the ranch and take a look around. He was silent. I continued, if we walk the grounds and post our footage. You think it'll reduce trespassers looking for a little excitement? I nodded. Senator Ryman looked at me for a long moment. Then, shoulders sagging, he nodded his acquiescence. I hate this, Georgia, he said, in a voice that was a million miles away from the proud, self-confident man I'd followed most of the way across the country. This is supposed to be the start of the most exciting fight in my career, and instead I'm standing here consigning my eldest unto God when I just want to shake the bastard until he gives her back to me. It's not fair. I know, Senator, I said. Glancing back to where Emily had managed to recapture her surviving children, I added, but you're not the only one it isn't fair to. Are you telling me to mind my family, young lady? He asked with a mirthless chuckle. Sometimes family is all we have, sir. Very true, Georgia. Very true. He followed my gaze back to Emily and the girls. I'll tell Em I've given you folks permission to go to the ranch. She'll understand. The guards, now. We have the proper licenses. Good. Raking his hair back from his forehead with one hand, he sighed. Ain't this just one hell of a mess? Very much so, I agreed. We made our goodbyes without much conviction. He needed to get back to the business of mourning, and I needed to get back to my team before Sean decided to go hiking or Buffy took the wireless network offline for upgrading. Rick hadn't been with us long enough for me to know what I didn't want him doing, but I was sure he'd come up with something. He was a journalist, after all, and we're all incurably insane. I walked toward the cemetery gates, tapping my ear cuff. Sean, what's your 20? We're parked behind the security vans, Sean said. Someone asked a question in the background, and he added, Buffy wants to know if we need her, or if she can go with Chuck. He's pretty torn up and she wants to get in some couple time. Sean Mason, you may be the only boy above the age of nine who still says couple time like it was a dead rat. I nodded to the guards as I passed through the gates and scanned the parking lot for the security vans. 
Do not, said Sean, sounding affronted. I like dead rats. Sorry, my bad. Tell Buffy she's free to go, but I want her to have the field equipment ready, and she needs to be back for editing by nine. The field equipment? I have Senator Ryman's clearance. We're heading for the ranch. I grimaced at Sean's whooping and tapped my ear cuff again, cutting off the connection. The van was in sight. I could let him yell in my ear once I was inside, rather than putting up with it remotely. Buffy was seated on a counter doing something arcane to a shoulder mount camera when I stepped through the rear door. She'd changed out of her funeral clothes into something more comfortable, if still subdued, and when she looked up, it was obvious that she'd redone her makeup to match. Hey. Hey. I looked around, starting to unbutton my jacket. Where's Sean? Up front, checking his armor for holes. She peered into the camera, blew lightly on the exposed circuitry, and snapped the cover back into place. Chuck's gonna come pick me up, so you can leave me here when you head out. It'll only take a few more minutes to review the field equipment. Anybody call Rick? I tossed my jacket onto a chair and started unbuttoning my dress shirt. I had a tank top under that. Swap my skirt for jeans? Add a Kevlar vest, my motorcycle jacket, and combat boots, and I'd be ready for a low-hazard field op. Most girls learn how to accessorize for dinner parties and dates. I learned to do it for hazard zones. He said he'd meet you at the ranch. Buffy offered me the camera. Here. This whole generation is on its last legs. We're gonna need new ones sooner than later. I'll get it into the budget, I said. Peeling off my shirt, I dropped it to the floor and took the camera, eyeing Buffy over my glasses. Something on your mind, Buff? No. Yes, maybe. She sat back on the counter, her gaze dropping to her hands. You're going to the ranch. Yes. It's... The area's been downgraded. We have the licenses to enter as long as we're armed. Buffy's head snapped up. It's disrespectful. Ah, the crux of the problem. Disrespectful to whom, Buffy? To the dead? She gave a small, almost imperceptible nod. Buffy, the dead aren't there. They've been buried. After they were cremated to prevent their corpses from coming back to life and doing disrespectful things to the living. They died there, she said fiercely. They died there, and now you're going to turn it into more news. We aired the attack. That was different. That was something dangerous. This is just ghosts. Souls trying to sleep. Her expression turned, pleading. Can't we let them sleep? Please? We're not going to disturb them. If anything, we're going so that they can sleep. The Rymans trust us to be respectful, and we will be. And by showing that there's nothing of any interest in those buildings, we'll keep less respectful journalists from breaking in looking for an expose. I might be wrong. Journalists seeking a scoop will break into almost anything. But I needed to get in there, and I needed Buffy to stay calm. Without her to enhance any footage we got, we might well come up with less than nothing. She sniffled. You swear you're not intending to upset their ghosts? I'm not sure I believe in ghosts, but I swear we won't do anything to disturb any spirits that might be resting there. I put down the camera she'd handed me and shook my head as I opened the van closet and pulled out the rest of my field gear. I always keep a few pairs of thick denim jeans on hand, the kind with steel fibers woven into the fabric. Be prepared isn't just the Boy Scouts marching song anymore. Zombies are enough. I don't need to add poltergeists to the ranks of things that want to kill me. She studied me for a moment before she nodded, offering a small smile. All right. It just seems ghoulish to go there on the day of the funeral. I know, but time is sort of important right now, I said. A horn honked outside. I glanced over my shoulder toward the door. Sounds like your ride's here. That didn't take long. Buffy slid off the counter. Your kits are packed. I didn't review the auxiliary batteries, but you'd only need those if everything else failed. Technically, they're not even required. I know, I said. Get out of here. Have a nice evening with Chuck, and I'll see you at the hotel at nine for editing and data consolidation. Work, 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 she complained. But she was almost laughing as she stepped outside. 
I caught a glimpse of Chuck waving from his rental car before the van door banged shut, blocking them from view. Have a nice date, Buffy, I said to the closed door and pulled on my jacket before moving to assess the field kits. Normally, Buffy would have done all the checks before she went anywhere. Normally, where she was going was back to the van or home to her room, not out with her boyfriend. It's not like she's never dated. She's had at least six boyfriends since we met. The countryside around us was wide, flat, and relatively unbroken by anything as plebeian as signs of human habitation. Not the best hunting territory for the living dead. They don't make mistakes on the level of allowing a massive outbreak that kills nearly half the hired help. It just doesn't happen. So either somebody screwed up big time, or someone cut the screamers, Sean finished, hushed. Why wouldn't anyone have found anything? Was anyone going to look? Sean, if I say a big animal amplified and killed its owners, do you think something is rotten in the state of Denmark? Or do you think it was bound to happen sometime? Sean was quiet for several minutes as we drove toward the ranch. Finally, in a pensive tone, he said, How big is this, George? I tightened my hands on the wheel. Ask Rebecca Ryman. What are we going to do about it? We're going to tell the truth. I glanced toward him. Hopefully, that's going to be enough. He nodded, and we drove on in silence. A lot of time was spent looking into the science and application of forensics before the rising. How did this man die? What did he die for? Could he have been saved? It's been different since the rising, as the possibility of infection makes it too dangerous for investigators to pry into any crime scene that hasn't been disinfected, while the strength of modern disinfectants means that once they've been used, there's nothing to find. DNA testing and miraculous deductions brought about by a few clinging fibers or things of the past. As soon as the dead started walking, they stopped sharing their secrets with the living. For modern investigators, whether with the police or the media, this has meant a lot of going back to our roots. An active mind is worth a thousand tests you can't run, and knowing where to look is worth even more. It's all a matter of learning how to think, learning how to eliminate the impossible, and admitting that sometimes what's left, however improbable, is going to be the truth. The world is strange that way. From Images May Disturb You, the blog of Georgia Mason, March 24th, 2040. Chapter 14 Rick was a good match for our team in more ways than one. He had his own transport, and he didn't leave home without it. I'd heard about the armor-plated VW Beetles. They're in a lot of Mom's anti-zombie ordinance reports, which she tends to leave lying all over the house but I'd never actually seen one before Rick's. It looked like a weird cross between an armadillo and a pill bug. An electric blue armadillo with headlights. He was parked outside the ranch gates, leaning against the side of his car and typing something into his PDA's collapsible keyboard. He lifted his head as we drove up, folding the keyboard and stowing the entire unit in his pocket. Sean was out of the van before we'd stopped moving, pointing to Rick. You do not lower your eyes in the field, he snapped. You do not split your attention, you do not focus on your equipment, and you especially do not do these things when you're alone at an off-grid rendezvous point. Rick blinked, looking more confused than anything else. I stopped the van, leaning over to close Sean's door before opening my own. A lot of people don't think my brother has a temper. It's like they assume I somehow sucked up the entire quota of cranky, and now Sean's perpetually cheery and ready for a challenge, while I glower at people from behind my sunglasses and plot the downfall of the Western world. They're wrong. Sean has a bigger temper than I do. He just saves his fits of fury for the important things, like finding one of our team members acting like an idiot in the vicinity of a recent outbreak. Rick was realizing he had a problem. Putting up his hands in a placating gesture, he said, the area was cleared and they did a full disinfect. I looked it all up before I came out here. 
Did they get a 100% scratch and match between mammals meeting the KA amplification barrier, known victims, registered survivors, and potential vector points? Sean demanded. He knew they hadn't, because there's never been a 100% return on the Nguyen Morrison test array, not even under strict laboratory conditions. There's always the chance something capable of carrying the virus, either in its own bloodstream or by carrying tainted blood or tissue on its person, got away. No, Rick admitted. No, because it doesn't happen. Which means you have basically been standing naked in the middle of the road, waving your arms and shouting, Come get it, dead guys! I want to be your next snack! He flung Rick's field kit at his chest. Rick caught it and stood there blinking as Sean spun on his heel and stalked off toward the gates. I let him go. Someone needed to start the process of presenting our credentials to the guards on duty, and it would calm him down. Bureaucracy generally did. Rick stared after Sean, still looking shell-shocked. He's right, you know, I said, squinting at him through my sunglasses. The glare outside the van was bad enough to make me wish it were safe to take painkillers in the field. It's not. Nothing that dulls your awareness of your body and what it's doing is a good idea. What made you get out of your car? I thought it was safe, Rick stammered. I shook my head. It's never safe. Get your pack on, activate your cameras, and let's go. I started along Sean's path to the ranch gates. Getting out of the car alone was a rookie mistake, but Rick's record wasn't heavy on field work. His reporting was good, and he knew enough to stick with the senior reporters in an area. He'd learn the rest if he lived long enough to get the chance. If getting out of the car was a rookie mistake, going into the ranch on foot was blatant stupidity, but we didn't have any real choice. Not only would our vehicles have been impossible to fit into any of the standing structures, we wouldn't have been able to avoid getting hung up in potholes or in the ruts opened by the government cleaning equipment. Better on foot and paying attention than sucked into a false sense of security and taken out by hostile road conditions. Sean was outside the guard station, where two wary, clean-shaven men watched from behind thick sheets of safety glass. Both were wearing plain army jumpsuits. From the looks on their faces, this was their first outbreak and we didn't fit their expectations of the sort of folks who would walk into a sealed-off hazard zone, even one that was due to be unsealed within the next 72 hours, and had been the scene of a complete Nguyen Morrison testing, including bleach bombs and aerosol decontamination. If it had been the sort of ranch that grew crops instead of livestock, they'd have been forced to shut it down for at least five years while the chemicals worked their way out of the soil. As it was, They'd be importing feed and water for 18 months until the groundwater tested clear again. The things we're willing to do to avoid the possibility of exposure to the live virus are sometimes awe-inspiring. Any trouble? I asked, stopping next to Sean and casting a tight-lipped smile towards the army boys. My, don't they look happy to see us? They were happier before I showed them we had Senator Ryman's permission to be here and the proper clearances to enter the property although I think they were kind of relieved when they realized our clearance levels mean they don't have to come in with us. Sean grinned almost maliciously as he handed me and Rick the metal chits that served as our passes into the zone. Any hazard seals would react to the ID tags on the chits, opening to let us pass. Somehow, I don't think the boys want to meet a real live infected person of their very own. It's amazing that they passed basic training. Don't tease the straights, I said pressing the chit against the strap of my shoulder bag. It adhered to the fabric with a nearly unbreakable seal, turning on and beginning to flash a reassuring green. How long's our clearance? Standard 12-hour passage. If we're inside the zone when the chits run out, we'll have to call for help and hope help answers. Sean pressed his own chit to the collar of his chainmail shirt. It flashed before dimming to standard metallic gray. Any recent signs of movement in or around the zone? Rick asked. His chit was clinging to the earpiece of his wireless phone, where its green flashes contrasted with the blinking yellow LED. Not a one. Sean jerked his up, indicating the guards. Shall we move on before they book us for loitering outside a hazard zone? Can they do that? Asked Rick. We're within a hundred yards of a recent outbreak, I said. 
They can do just about whatever they want. I walked toward the gates. The chit on my bag flashed and they swung open, letting me enter the ranch grounds. There were no blood tests on this side of the hazard zone. If I wanted to enter a known infection site when I was already infected, I'd just finish my transition behind a pre-established barrier. Not exactly what most people would consider a loss. The gates shut behind me, only to open again as Sean approached, and a third time for Rick. Only one person was allowed to pass at a time. If they'd followed standard procedure, the gates would also be electrified, with the current set to increase exponentially if anything grabbed hold. It wouldn't do much to stop a horde of zombies that really wanted to get through, but it was better than nothing. Dropping the first fixed point camera, setting the feed to channel 8, and activating screamers, Sean said, planting a small tripod. It extended an antenna, flashing yellow as it caught the local wireless. It would record everything it saw and feed it to the databases in the van. We wouldn't get anything useful unless there was an outbreak while we were on the grounds, but it never hurts to cover your bases. More important, it would sound the alarm if it detected any motion not connected to one of the team's identifying beacons. George, we have a map? We have a map, I confirmed, pulling out my PDA and unfolding the screen to its full extension. Buffy pulled it down before she left. God bless Buffy. No team is complete without a good technician, and the word for an incomplete team is usually fatality. Cluster round, guys. They did. The Ryman family ranch was laid out in the pre-rising style, with a few adjustments to account for the increased security required by the senator's political career and the possibility of invasion by the rampaging undead. Most of the buildings were unconnected, with four separate horse barns, one for foaling, one for yearlings, one for older horses, and the last, constructed in isolation and using modern quarantine procedures for the sick. The main house had more windows than any sane person would be comfortable with, but that had apparently suited the Rymans just fine. Sean studied the map before asking, Do we have the outbreak grid? We do. I started tapping. Either of you boys care to place a bet as to where the outbreak started? Isolation ward, Rick said. Foaling, said Sean. Wrong. I hit enter. A grid appeared, crisscrossing the map with streaks of red. The largest red zone surrounded the yearling barn, covering the entire building and extending out in all directions. The first outbreak was in the yearling barn, where the strongest, healthiest, most resistant horses were housed. Sean frowned. I don't know much about horses, but that seems a little funny to me. We have a full matchup on the index case? 97% certainty on the Nguyen Morrison, I said, pulling up a picture of a pale gold horse with a white streak down its nose. Ryman's gold rush weather. Yearling male, not gelded, clean vet reports every three months since birth, and a clean blood test registered every week for the same time period. No history of elevated virus levels. If you were looking for the cleanest horse on the planet, epidemiologically speaking, you'd have trouble going wrong with this one. And he's our index, said Rick. That's bizarre. Maybe something bit him? They logged every movement these horses made all day, every day. I closed the files, snapping the screen of my PDA into its collapsed formation before slipping it into my shoulder bag. Goldie went out for a run the night before the outbreak, was rubbed down and checked out clean with no wounds or scratches. He didn't leave the barn again before things went south. None of the other horses top out in the Nguyen Morrison? Sean reached into his own bag, pulling out a collapsible metal rod that he began uncollapsing as the three of us moved by unspoken accord toward the side of the ranch where the barns were clustered. If there was evidence to be found, it would be in the barns. The closest is the horse in the stall next to his, Ryman's Red Sky at Morning, which tested out at a 91 and had visible bite marks. 6% pretty much says Goldie's our index. The only way that could happen is spontaneous amplification, Sean said with a deep frown. He snapped the last segment of the rod into place and hit a button on the handle, electrifying the metal. No chance of heart attack or other natural death? Not in a place like this, Rick said. We both looked toward him. Shaking his head, he said, I did a piece on modern ranching a few years back. 
They have those animals so monitored that if they just up and die, a heart stops or they suffocate on a piece of feet or whatever, someone will know immediately. So you're saying the people on duty would have received some sort of notification that the horse had died and they'd have been able to get there before he got up and started biting the other horses, I said slowly. Why didn't they? Because when you convert, instead of reanimating, there's no interruption in your vital signs, said John. He was starting to sound almost excited. One minute you're fine, the next minute, bang, you're a shambling mass of virus-spreading flesh. The monitors wouldn't catch a spontaneous conversion because a machine wouldn't be able to tell that anything was wrong. And people say modern technology doesn't do enough to protect us. I deadpanned. All right. So if the horse checked out clean at seven o'clock rubbed down and went into spontaneous amplification in the night, the monitors wouldn't have caught it. That still doesn't tell us why it happened. Spontaneous amplification is a reality. Sometimes the virus sleeping inside a person decides it's time to wake up and there's nothing anyone can do to stop it. Roughly 2% of the recorded outbreaks during the rising were traced back to spontaneous amplifications. It usually hits only the very young or the very old, as the virus reacts to their rapidly changing body weight by making some rapid changes of its own. I'd never heard of spontaneous amplification occurring in livestock, but it's never been proven that it couldn't happen. And it seemed way too pat. The index case for equine spontaneous amplification happened to be in Senator Ryman's barn on the day he was confirmed as the next Republican candidate for president? Coincidences like that don't exist outside of a Dickensian tragedy. They certainly don't wander around happening in the real world. I don't buy it, said Rick, voicing my thoughts. It's too cut and dried. Here's a horse. The horse is healthy. Now the horse is a zombie. Lots of people die. Isn't that tragic? It's what I would write if you asked me to pen a front-page human interest story that would never happen. So why isn't anyone digging deeper? Sean stopped in the courtyard between the four barns, looking first at Rick, then at me. Not to be rude or anything, but Rick, you're new on this beat, and George, you're sort of professionally paranoid. Why isn't anyone else punching holes in this crap? Because no one looks twice at an outbreak, I said. Remember how pissed you got when we had to do all that reading about the rising back in sixth grade? I thought you were going to get us both expelled. You said the only way things could have gotten as bad as they did was if people were willing to take the first easy answer they could find and cling to it, rather than doing anything as complicated as actually thinking. And you said that was human nature, and I should be thankful we're smarter than they are, Sean said. And then you hit me. That's still your answer. Human nature give people something they can believe, especially something like a personal tragedy and a teenage girl being heroic to save her family. And not only will everyone believe it, everyone will want to believe it. Rick shook his head. It's good news. People like to believe good news. Sometimes it's great living in a world where good and news don't always combine to mean positive information. I looked to Sean. Where do we start? I'm in charge in the editing studio and the office. It's different in the field. Sean calls the shots unless I'm demanding an immediate evac. Both of us are smart enough to know where our strengths lie. His involve poking dead things with sticks and living to blog about it. Everyone armed? He asked. More for Rick's benefit than mine. He knows I'd stick my hand in a zombie's mouth for fun before I'd enter a field situation unarmed. Clear, I said, pulling out my 40. Yes, said Rick. His own gun was larger than mine, but he handled it easily enough for me to think it was a matter of preference, not machismo. He slid it back into the holster in his vest, adding, I'd offer to take some marksmanship tests, but this doesn't seem like the place. Later, said Sean. Rick looked amused. I smothered a snort of laughter. Poor guy probably thought my brother was kidding. Right now, we're splitting up. George, you take the foaling barn. Rick, you hit the adult quarters. I'll take the hospital barn, and we'll meet up back here to go through the yearling barn together. Radio contact at all times. If you see anything, scream as loudly as you can. 
So we can all come together to help? Asked Rick. So the rest of us have time to get away, I said. Cameras on, people, and look alive. This is not a drill. This is the news. Splitting up made the most sense. All four barns were involved in the outbreak, but it started in a single place. We'd search the other areas individually, get some good atmospheric shots for background, and then get back together where we might actually find something. That didn't stop my heart from racing as I opened the door to the folding barn feed room and stepped inside. The barn was dark. I removed my glasses and the burning in my eyes stopped almost immediately, pupils abandoning their futile efforts to contract and relaxing into full expansion as I walked into the main barn. This unvaried twilight was the sort of light they are best suited to. I saw in the way the infected did, and like the infected, I saw everything. The ranch was clearly a state-of-the-art establishment, on top of all the latest developments in animal husbandry. The stalls were spacious, designed to maximize the comfort of all parties involved. It was actually possible to ignore the federally mandated hazmat suits hanging from one wall and the yellow and red biohazard bins that marked the barn's four corners. The smell of bleach was harder to ignore, and once I admitted it was there, the rest came clear. The stains on the walls that weren't paint or spilled feed. The way the straw in the stalls was matted down with the remains of some thick, tacky liquid. They hadn't finished the biohazard cleanup in here yet. That's standard operating procedure. First, you remove all infected bodies and any chunks that were left behind. Then you seal the building as well as you can and fill the air with bleach. Finally, you set off the aerosol disinfectants and formalin bombs. Formalin is a formaldehyde-based compound that can kill almost anything, including the mobile infected. And standard decontamination procedures call for five waves of the stuff, releasing a new batch as the previous one is depleted by the organic materials around you. It's only after the area has been bleached so thoroughly that anything living is pretty much toast and has been allowed to sit long enough for all fluids to dry to a splatter-free state that it's considered safe to start removing and incinerating potentially infected materials, like the straw in the stalls. My shoulder cam was already recording. I activated three more cameras, one attached to my bag, one at my hip, and one concealed in my barrette, and began to make my first slow turn looking around the barn. A pile of dead cats was under the hayloft, their multicolored bodies twisted from the brutal abdominal hemorrhaging that killed them. They'd survived the outbreak and the chaos that followed, but they couldn't outrun the formalin. I spent several seconds standing there, looking at them. They looked so small and harmless, and they were. Cats don't reach the mason barrier. They weigh less than 40 pounds. Kellis Amberley isn't interested in them, and they don't reanimate. For cats, dead is still dead. I made it almost to the wall before I threw up. It was easier once the initial wash of disgust was out of my system. My first pass brought up nothing. There were no signs that anything unusual had happened. It was just the sight of an outbreak, tragic and horrible, but not special. Here was the place where one of the infected horses kicked its way inside, knocking the barn's sliding door off its rails. It would have hit the nursing mares in the first three stalls without slowing down, and the humans on duty were probably totally undefended. They had no idea anything was wrong until it was too late. If they were lucky, they died fast, either bleeding out or ripped to pieces before the virus had a chance to take hold and start rewriting them into another iteration of it. That was sadly unlikely. A fresh mob wants to infect, not devour. It was easy to picture infected horses rampaging through the place, biting everything in sight and rushing on to bite still more. It was a nightmare image. It's how we almost lost the world at the beginning of the century, and it was probably accurate. We know how this sort of outbreak goes, even though we wish we didn't. The virus is dependable, not creative. It took me 20 minutes to sweep the barn. By the time I was done, I was in such a hurry to get out of there that I forgot to put my sunglasses on before rushing out into the sunlight. The sudden glare was more than I could take. 
I staggered and caught myself against the barn door, eyes squinting shut. This is how we can tell she hasn't converted, Sean commented to my left. Real zombies don't get flash blinded by sunlight when they forget their sunglasses. Fuck you too, I muttered as Sean got his arm around me and hoisted me away from the barn. You kiss our mother with that mouth? Our mother and you both, dickhead. Give me my sunglasses. Which are where? Left hand vest pocket. I've got it. That was Rick's voice, and it was Rick who pressed my glasses into my hand. Thanks. I snapped the glasses open, continuing to lean against Sean as I pushed them on. Both their cameras were catching this. I didn't really care. Either of you find anything? Not me, said Sean. For some reason, he sounded like he was laughing. His barn couldn't have been any better than mine. If anything, it should have been worse, since more of the medical staff would have been on duty overnight. Looks like Rick's the only one who got lucky. I've always had a way with the ladies, said Rick. Unlike Sean and his evident amusement, Rick sounded almost embarrassed. I clearly needed to see whatever was going on to understand it. Wary of the light, I opened first one eye and then the other. There was Sean, his arm still around me, holding me upright as best he could. My eyes are a lot of why I'm so leery to go into live field situations, and no one understands that better than him. And there was Rick, standing just a few feet away, his expression a mixture of anxiety and confusion. Rick's shoulder bag was moving. I jerked upright, demanding, What is that? That would be Rick's new lady friend, Sean said, snickering. He's irresistible, George. You should have seen it. He came out of that barn and she was all over him. I've seen clingy girlfriends before, but this one doesn't just take the cake. She takes the entire bakery. I eyed the junior member of my reporting staff warily. Rick? He's right. She latched on when she realized I was in the barn, not aiming a bleach gun at her face and not planning to hurt her. Rick opened the flap of his shoulder bag. A narrow orange and white head poked out, yellow eyes regarding me warily. I blinked. The head withdrew. It's a cat. All the others were dead, Rick said, closing his bag. She must have managed to burrow farther under the hay than they did. Or maybe she was outside when the cleaners came through and somehow got trapped inside when they left. A cat. She tests clean, George, Sean said. Mammals under 40 pounds can't convert. They lack some crucial balance between body and brain mass. But they can sometimes carry the live virus, at least until it kills them. It's rare. Most of the time, they just shrug it off and carry on uninfected. In the field, rare isn't something you can gamble on. How many blood tests? I asked, looking towards Sean. Four. One for each paw. He held up his arms, anticipating my next question. No, I didn't get scratched, and yes, I'm sure the kitty's clean. And he already yelled at me for picking her up before I was certain, Rick said. Don't think that means I'm not planning to yell at you, too. I pushed away from Sean. I'll just do it when we're back inside. We have three clean barns and one live cat, gentlemen. Are we ready to proceed? I've got nothing better planned for the afternoon, Sean said, his tone still cheerful. This was Irwin territory. Very little makes him happier. Camera's on? Rolling. I glanced at my watch. We have clean feeds and more than enough memory. You going to grandstand? Do I ever not? Sean backed away until he was standing at the proper angle in front of the remaining barn, backlit by the afternoon sun. I had to admire his flair for the theatrics. We'd do two reports on the day's events. One for his side of the site, playing up the dangers of entering an area that had suffered such a recent outbreak. And one for my side talking about the human aspects of the tragedy. My opening spiel could be recorded later when I had a better idea of what happened. Irwin's sell suspense. Newsies sell the news. What's he doing? Rick asked, raising his eyebrows. You've seen those video clips of Irwin's talking about fabulous dangers and horrible lurking monsters? Yeah. That. On your account, Sean. 
That was his cue. Suddenly grinning, suddenly relaxed, Sean directed a smile that sold a thousand t-shirts toward the camera, flicked sweat-soaked hair out of his eyes with one gloved hand and said, Hey, audience. It's been pretty boring around here lately, what with all the politics and the sealed room stuff that only the heavy-duty news geeks care about. But today, today we get a treat. Because today, we're the only news team being allowed into the Ryman Ranch before decon is finished. You're gonna see blood, guys. You're gonna see stains. You're gonna do everything but taste the formalin in the air. He was off and running. I admit it. I tuned him out as he started getting into a spiel, preferring to watch rather than actively listening. Sean has working his audience into a frenzy down to a science. By the time he's done with them, they get excited by the mysterious discovery of pocket lint. It's impressive, but I'd rather watch him move. There's something wonderful about the way he lets go, becoming all energy and excitement as he outlines what's coming next. Maybe it's geeky for a girl my age to admit she still loves her brother. I don't care. I love him, and one day I'll bury him. And until then, I'm going to be grateful that I'm allowed to watch him talk. So come with me, and let's see what really happened here on that cold March afternoon. Sean grinned again, winking at the camera, and turned to head for the barn doors. As he reached them, he called, Cut segment! And turned back. Joviality gone. We ready? Ready, I said. With all chances to gracefully decide, you know what? This is a job for the authorities, the people we pay to risk their lives for information. Behind us, Rick and I followed Sean through the feed room and into the last of the Ryman's four barns. The smell hit first. There is a stench to an outbreak site that you never find anywhere else. Scientists have been trying for years to determine why it is that we can smell the infection even when it's been declared safely dead. And they've been forced to conclude that it's the same viral sense that lets zombies recognize each other, just acting on a somewhat smaller scale. Zombies don't try to kill other zombies on site unless they haven't had anything to eat in weeks. The living can tell where an outbreak started. It's probably another handy function of the virus slumbering in our own bodies. Not that anyone can say for sure. No one has ever been able to put the smell into words. Not really. It smells like death. Everything in your body says, run. And, like idiots, we didn't. Once the feed room door was shut, the barn was washed with the same dimness I experienced before. George, Rick, Lights, Sean called. I had time to raise my arm to shield my eyes before the overhead lights clicked on. Rick made a faint gagging noise, and I heard him throwing up somewhere behind me. Not a real surprise. Everyone tosses their cookies at least once on this sort of trip. I had, after all. When enough time had passed to let my eyes adjust to the limits of their capacity, I lowered my arm. What I saw was sheer chaos. The falling barn seemed bad at first, but it was really nothing, just a few odd stains and some dead cats. The dead cats were here, too, strewn around the floor like discarded rags. As for the rest, my first thought was that the entire barn had been drenched with blood. Not just sprayed, literally drenched, like someone took a bucket and started painting the walls. That impression passed as it became clear that the majority of the blood was in one of two locations, either smeared along the walls in a band roughly three feet off the floor, or soaking the floor itself, which had turned a dozen different shades of brown and black as the mixture of bleach, blood, and fecal matter dried into an uneven crust. I stared at it, unblinking, until I was over the urge to vomit. Once was fine. Twice was not especially when round two happened in front of the others. These are labeled with the names of the horses, Sean called. He was on the far side of the barn studying one of the stalls. This one was called Tuesday Blues. What kind of name was that for a horse? They liked weather names. Look for gold rush weather and red sky at morning. If anything odd happened here, we might find signs of it around their stalls. 
under the 600 gallons of gore, Rick muttered. Hope you brought a shovel, Sean called, sounding ungodly cheerful. Rick stared at him. Your brother is an alien. Yeah, but he's a cute one, I said. Start check shoulder with the heel of my right hand as soon as he came into range. Asshole, I accused. Probably, he agreed, calming. If I was calling him names, it couldn't be too bad. You think we found something? It seems likely, but it's not your concern right now. Get the pliers, get that goddamn thing out of your shoe, and get it bagged. If you touch it, I'll kill you. Gotcha. Rick came trotting back, rake in hand. I took it from him and leaned over, starting to poke through the straw. Rick, keep an eye on my stupid brother. Yes, ma'am. Using the rake to turn over the straw where Sean had stepped, uncovered several more chunks of plastic, and a long, bent piece of snapped-off plastic in a familiar shape. Behind me, Sean breathed in sharply. George? I see it. I continued stirring the straw. That's a needle. I know. If there's no reason for the plastic to be in there, why is there a needle in there? For no good reason, said Rick. Georgia, try a little bit to the right. I glanced toward him. Why? Because that's where the hay is less crushed. If there's anything else to find, it's more likely to be intact if it's off to the right. Good call. I turned my attention to the right-hand side of the stall. The first three passes found nothing. I had already decided the fourth pass would be the last in that area when the tines pulled an intact syringe into view. Not just intact, loaded. The plunger hadn't been pushed all the way home, and a small amount of milky liquid was visible through the mud-smeared glass. The three of us stared at it. Finally, Sean spoke. George? Yeah? I don't think you're a paranoid freak anymore. Good. I gingerly used the rake to pull the syringe closer. Check the sharp spin and see if there are any isolation bags left. We need to vacuum seal this before we take it out of here, and I don't trust our biohazard baggies. Why? Rick asked. They did the Nguyen Morrison. Because there's only one thing I can think of that someone would inject into a perfectly healthy animal that then turns around and becomes the index case for an outbreak, I said. Just looking at the syringe was making me feel nauseous. Sean could have stepped on that. He could have put his foot down wrong and... New thought, Georgia. New thought. Syringes are watertight, Sean said, as he turned to head for the sharp spin. Bleach wouldn't have been able to get inside. You mean... Unless I'm wrong, we're looking at enough Kellis Amberley to convert the entire population of Wisconsin. I smiled without a trace of humor. How's that for a front page headline? Rebecca Ryman was murdered. The Callus Amberley virus can survive indefinitely inside a suitable host, which is to say, inside a warm-blooded mammalian creature. No cure has been found, and while small units of blood can be purged of viral bodies, the virus cannot be removed from the body's soft tissues, bone marrow, spinal fluid, or brain. Thanks to the human ingenuity that created it, it is with us every day, from the moment of our conception until the day that we die. We'll have multiple infections of the original Kellis strain during our lifetimes. It manifests to fight invading rhinoviruses seeking to attack the body, and it acts to support the immune system. Some will also have minor flares of Marburg Amberley, which wakes when there are cancerous growths to be destroyed. The synthesis of these wildly different viruses has not changed their original purposes, which is a good thing for us. If we're going to have to live with the fact that formerly dead people now rise up and attempt to devour the living, we may as well get a few perks out of the deal. We only have problems when the conjoined form of these viruses enters its active state. Ten microns of live Kellis Amberley are enough to begin an unstoppable viral cascade that inevitably results in the effective death of the original host. Once the virus is awake, you cease to be you in any meaningful sense. Instead, you're a living viral reservoir, a means of spreading the virus, which is always hungry and always waiting. The zombie is a creature with two goals, 
to feed the virus in itself, and to spread that virus to others. An elephant can be infected with the same amount of Kellis Amberley as a human. 10 microns. Speaking literally, you could pack more viral microns than that onto the period of this sentence. The horse that started the infection that killed Rebecca Ryman was injected with an estimated 900 million microns of live Kellis Amberley. Now look me in the eye and tell me that wasn't terrorism. From Images May Disturb You, the blog of Georgia Mason, March 25th, 2040. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.